Brace yourself. By clicking on this video, you just hit the jackpot when it comes to IT training courses. And guess what? It's going to cost you absolutely nothing. That's right. This full-length course is 100% free. No hidden fees, no additional content charges, just pure, concentrated knowledge tailored to teach you everything you need to know in order to pass the CompTIA ITF Plus Certification Exam. With that said, if this is the first time you have heard of us, welcome to our Certification Synergy Community and to our CompTIA ITF Plus Complete Training Course. We are excited that you have chosen us as your guide while you begin your journey into information technology and we appreciate the opportunity to share our expertise with you. And just once more, in case you didn't believe me the first time, this complete training course is a free, self-paced learning resource, here for everyone's benefit. That includes you, your friends, and your family. Just don't tell your archenemy. If they find out about this amazing training course, they will pass too. And you don't want that. Now, let's explore what makes Certification Synergy the golden ticket to your IT success. Our curriculum is a masterpiece of meticulous design, not just a random assemblage of study materials. You can think of us as your very own treasure map to IT mastery, systematically covering every topic you need to know. So why get lost in a labyrinth of random tutorials, scattered across the internet, when a proven pathway lies right in front of you? At Certification Synergy, we value your precious time, and that's precisely why we've bottled a vast ocean of learning into a potent elixir of knowledge. With that in mind, you could potentially binge-watch this entire course in as little as one day. Thus, arming yourself with the skills and self-assurance you need to sail smoothly through the CompTIA ITF Plus Certification Exam and onward. Now, what else makes us the best IT training in town, besides our strategic and orderly presentation of exam topics? Easy. We make learning tech concepts feel like a walk in the park. You can expect to learn from vivid, comprehensible video segments, all seasoned with a dash of humor, to keep the experience lively. This course isn't just a learning pathway, it's a guided experience. If you are still listening, it is now time to take the bold step forward and benefit from all our invaluable insights. And off we go. For your very first step, you will need to understand the path that lies in front of you. By choosing to start your journey with the CompTIA ITF Plus certification, and by allowing me to be your instructor, you will be building a strong foundational knowledge that will set you up for success as you advance into more complex IT topics and attempt future certifications, like the CompTIA A Plus certification the CompTIA Network Plus Certification, and the CompTIA Security Plus Certification. Next, you need to know what IT concepts will be taught in this course. The CompTIA ITF Plus Certification exam focuses on the essential IT skills and knowledge needed to complete tasks commonly performed by entry-level IT professionals. To pass, you will need to have the knowledge and skills required to understand the basics of computing. IT infrastructure, applications and software, network connectivity, software development, database use, and identifying slash preventing security risks. Additionally, this exam will assess knowledge in the areas of troubleshooting theory and preventive maintenance. The current version of the CompTIA ITF Plus Certification Exam, designated as FC0-U61, was launched on September 4, 2018. The exam consists of 75 multiple-choice questions that must be completed in 60 minutes. And the passing score is 650 on a scale of 900. Now the scoring system can be a bit confusing, so I will give you a breakdown that works well for us here at Certification Synergy. If you score below 500, you have some more studying to do. If you score between 500 and 649, you knew more than half the content and just need a bit more understanding to get you across the finish line. Score between 650 and 749, and you knew about two-thirds to three-quarters of the content and you will now be ITF Plus certified. With a score of 750 to 799, you knew most of the exam content. Go above 800 and you can tell everyone you crushed it. Anyone scoring 800 plus on a CompTIA exam should be very proud of their accomplishment. If you get a perfect 900 score, contact us immediately, we want to hire you. 
Okay, not really. But know this. Even seasoned veterans tend to score in the low to mid-800 range. I hope you find this scoring breakdown helpful when evaluating your exam results. Now we need to discuss the heart of this exam. The exam objectives. The exam objectives is a document that will outline the parameters for taking the exam. It will include exam items like How many questions? The question format or what type of questions you will be asked. And the requirements to pass the exam. The exam objectives will also outline the topics you will be tested on. At the highest level, the exam is broken into domains. The domains for the CompTIA ITF Plus exam, FC0-U61, are shown here with a percentage value next to them. The percentage refers to how many questions can be expected from each domain when you take your exam. Each domain is then broken into exam objectives. Here we can see the first domain for the CompTIA ITF Plus certification exam is IT concepts and terminology, and the first exam objective in this domain is compare and contrast notational systems. Within this exam objective are the exam topics. Exam objective 1.1 includes the topics binary, hexadecimal, decimal, ASCII, and Unicode. Don't worry if you do not understand these topics yet as this is the reason for this course. So why have I spent your time breaking down the exam objectives? Because they are super important and often overlooked. The exam objectives are a roadmap to success. They provide a clear path of what to study and keep you on track. Additionally, once you have completed this training course, the exam objectives should act as a final checklist. Taking one last look at the official exam objectives before attempting the certification exam will help focus your thoughts and point you in the direction of any additional study you may need. To download the exam objectives, you can visit the CompTIA ITF Plus product page on our certificationsynergy.com website. I will also provide a link in the description section of this video and in the comments. Now, as you continue with this training course, I encourage you to watch each video segment as many times as you need to master the topics. Go as fast or as slow as you want. It would also be a great idea to subscribe now, making it easier to find us later. We are always pumping out new free content, and you don't want to miss out, do you? CompTIA ITF Plus Complete Training Course Exam Objective 1.1 Compare and Contrast Notational Systems Binary Notational System The binary notational system is a notational system that has only two possible numbers for each place value. These numbers are 0 and 1. The prefix or first two letters by in the word binary means 2 and refers to the fact that each place value in a binary number is two times greater than the place value directly to its right. At the most fundamental level, computers receive, transmit, process, and store information in binary form. Computers work in this manner because they utilize billions of tiny electronic switches called transistors. These transistors can be in either an off or on state. The digits 0 and 1 used in binary reflect the off and on states of a transistor, where 0 is off and 1 is on. Additionally, binary is great for computer programs to store values that can be of either two states. This would include yes or no questions, true or false values, and whether a box is checked or unchecked. Exam Objective 1.1 Compare and Contrast Notational Systems Hexadecimal Notational System The hexadecimal notational system is a notational system that has 16 possible values for each place value. These values range from 0 to F. The hexadecimal values are a combination of the Arabic numbers, 0 through 9 and the Latin alphabet letters, A E through F. This can be a bit confusing so here is a side-by-side -side comparison with the more commonly understood decimal system. The decimal numbers remain consistent with the hexadecimal system up to the value of 9. Once a value of 10 is reached. The decimal system requires an additional place value to express the value 10 while the hexadecimal system continues on to A. Some common use cases for hexadecimal notation in information technology are MAC addresses IPv6 addresses Hex color codes and Unicode references 
Media access control or MAC addresses are unique IDs assigned to a network interface for use in a localized network. These addresses may be represented in a few different formats, but always contain a total of 12 hexadecimal characters. IPv6 addresses also use hexadecimal notation. IPv6 addresses identify a device in an Internet Protocol version 6 or IPv6 network. Hex color codes use six hexadecimal characters to specify a color. These color codes start with a hashtag. The first two hex characters represent the red value. And the middle two hex characters represent the green value. While the last two hex characters represent the blue value. Each color value varies in intensity on a scale of 0 to 255, or in hexadecimal from 00 to FF. When combined, these three values can create over 16.7 million possible colors. Unicode is just one more place you might find hexadecimal notation being used. Unicode is an international encoding standard that converts each letter, digit, or symbol into a unique numeric value in order to be understood by a computing system. These unique numeric values can be represented in binary or for our current learning purposes, as a hexadecimal value. Exam Objective 1.1 Compare and Contrast Notational Systems Decimal Notational System The Decimal Notational System is a notational system that has 10 possible numbers for each place value. These numbers are 0 through 9. The prefix or first three letters D E C in the word decimal means 10 and refers to the fact that each place value in a decimal number is 10 times greater than the place value directly to its right. Decimal notation is used in information technology mostly for the benefit of the human user. While binary is used by the computing device, an endless string of ones and zeros would be very difficult for a human to understand. That is why many computer programs will convert and display binary values as a decimal value. It is worth noting that IPv4 addresses use a specific type of decimal notation called dot decimal notation. IPv4 addresses identify a device in an Internet Protocol version 4 or IPv4 network. Dot decimal notation is a way of displaying a big number in manageable chunks. In the case of an IPv4 address, each address is 32 binary digits long. This is still a bit difficult to understand, so let's group this 32 binary digit address into different containers that are separated by dots. This will create four sets of eight binary digits, also known as octets. Next we will convert each octet from binary to their decimal value equivalents resulting in a dot decimal notation. That is much easier to read. Exam Objective 1.1 Compare and Contrast Notational Systems Data Representation ASCII ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange, is the most common character encoding standard for text data in computers and on the internet. Character encoding is the process of assigning numerical values, also known as code points, to graphical characters, especially the written characters of human language. This allows characters, such as the capital letter M of the Latin alphabet to be received, transmitted, processed, and stored as information in binary form. The ASCII character encoding standard uses seven binary digits to represent a total of 128 character value combinations. 128 is very limited when considering all world languages and symbols. Therefore ASCII is best suited to encode the American English language only. Even still, as technology advanced, ASCII was updated to include eight binary digits allowing for additional character code combinations. This updated version is known as Extended ASCII. Exam Objective 1.1 Compare and Contrast Notational Systems Data Representation Unicode Unicode is an international character encoding standard that encompasses many different languages. Character encoding is the process of assigning numerical values, also known as code points, to graphical characters, especially the written characters of human language. Unicode, while maintaining ASCII as a subset of character values, expands to include languages far beyond the American English language. The Unicode character encoding standard uses 16 binary digits by default, providing more than enough character value combinations to include encoding for Latin, Greek, Cyrillic, Armenian, Hebrew, Arabic, Syriac, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean languages to name a few.
Unicode may convert any one of these languages' characters into a 16 binary digit value, but for human readability, it will often reference the binary value as its hexadecimal equivalent. Unicode's adopted naming convention consists of a U followed by a plus sign and ending with four hexadecimal digits. In the case of the capital letter M of the Latin alphabet, the Unicode reference would be U plus 004D. Exam Objective 1.2 Compare and Contrast Fundamental Data Types and Their Characteristics In the context of computer programming and databases, a data type is a classification or category of data that determines the type of operations that can be performed on the data, and the storage format to be used for that data. Though many different data types exist, there are five fundamental data types that are a part of the CompTIA ITF Plus Certification Exam. These data types include char, strings, integers, floats, and boolean. Each one of these data types will be covered in their own separate videos. Next we will cover some of the more common operations that can be performed on the different data types. First up are the mathematical or arithmetic operations. From left to right, we have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponentiation, floor division, and modulus. In case you have not seen the last two operations before, here are two examples. Floor division returns only the integer value of a division equation without any fractional values should they exist. And modulus only returns the remainder value of a division equation. Next we have relational or comparative operations. From left to right, there is equal, not equal, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, and less than or equal to. These operations are used to compare two values. We will close out this video with logical operations. Logical operations use keywords like and, or, and not, to combine multiple conditional statements. These conditional statements will result in a true or false output. For our example, if x was set equal to 6, 6 would be less than 10 and 6 would be greater than 4. So this statement would evaluate to true. Exam Objective 1.2 Compare and Contrast Fundamental Data Types and Their Characteristics Char Char, which is short for character, is a single textual character that can be a letter of the alphabet, a symbol, or a numerical digit. For the char data type, if a numerical digit is used, it will be treated as text only and you will be unable to perform mathematical operations with it. Surprisingly, the char data type will support relational operations. For a comparison to take place, all char values will first be converted to their binary character code values before comparisons take place. Here we will compare capital A and the lowercase a of the Latin alphabet. Once the letters are converted to their binary values, you can then see that the binary value for capital A is less than the binary value for lowercase a. For this example, we used the ASCII encoding standard. A use case for the char data type would be to store a middle initial of a name within a database or as variable in a computer program. Please note, this information is based on the knowledge needed for the CompTIA ITF plus certification exam. There are alternative definitions for the char data type, especially when applied to certain databases. Exam Objective 1.2 Compare and Contrast Fundamental Data Types and Their Characteristics Strings A string is a collection of textual characters that can be composed of letters of the alphabet, symbols, numerical digits, and spaces. In most programming languages, strings will be easy to spot as they are often wrapped in quotation marks. For the string data type, if a numerical digit is used, it will be treated as text only and you will be unable to perform mathematical operations with it. However, many programming languages do use the addition symbol with multiple string values to perform an operation called concatenation. Concatenation is the operation of joining character strings end to end. By doing so, this operation converts multiple strings into a single string. To demonstrate, we will take the string cyber and concatenate it with the string security. This will result in a single string value of a cyber security. The string data type also supports relational operations. Strings are compared one character at a time. 
When different characters are found, then their binary code point values are compared. The character with the lower code point value is considered to be smaller. Here we will compare the string hello and the string hi. We start at the beginning of the strings. Both have a capital H, so we move on to the next letter in each string. We see lowercase e and lowercase i are different, so we will compare their binary code point values. The binary value for e is less than binary value for i, so the string hello will be evaluated as less than the string hi. For this example, we used the ASCII encoding standard. There are many use cases for the string data type. Pretty much any information that uses a series of textual characters. In this example, first and last name fields would certainly be great candidates for the string data type. Exam Objective 1.2 Compare and contrast fundamental data types and their characteristics. Integers Integer is a data type used to represent real numbers that do not have fractional values. This includes whole numbers and their negative equivalents. It probably goes without saying, but you can absolutely use mathematical operations with the integer data type. The integer data type also supports relational operations. There are many use cases for the integer data type. A great example would be an age field. With something like phone numbers, data type selection can be tricky. Technically you could use the integer data type, but using a string data type will help preserve phone number formatting. Postal codes are also tricky. In the United States postal codes are five numerical digits, but internationally, codes can be alphanumeric. So in certain situations an integer data type could be used, but like phone numbers, the string data type might be the better choice. Exam Objective 1.2 Compare and contrast fundamental data types and their characteristics. Floats Float is a data type composed of a number that is not an integer because it includes a fractional value represented in decimal format. If you see a decimal point in the value and no quotation marks, there is a good chance it is a float. Now, one thing to be on the lookout for is a whole number represented with a zero to the right of the decimal point. Do you see the last float example, 22.0? The zero in 22.0 adds no additional value to the number and could easily have been represented as just 22. But as long as there is a decimal point this will belong to the float data type and not the integer data type. With the float data type, you can absolutely use mathematical operations. You can even mix float data types with integer data types. Just be careful of integer data types turning into float data types as a result of a mathematical operation. Let's use 5 halves as an example. The 5 is an integer and the 2 is an integer. Once the division operation takes place the quotient becomes 2.5. Now you have a float. Depending on the programming language, this could cause an error. So be mindful of this in the future. The float data type also supports relational operations. A very common use for the float data type is currency or monetary values. The example here is using the float data type to keep track of an account balance. Can you think of any other uses for the float data type? Exam Objective 1.2 Compare and contrast fundamental data types and their characteristics. Boolean Boolean is a special numeric data type that indicates if a condition is true or false. The Boolean value is stored using a single binary digit of either a 0 or 1. So keep on the lookout for the words true and false or any scenario where only two options exist. These are great signifiers that you are working with the Boolean data type. With the Boolean data type, we will be focused primarily on logical operations. Using the AND, OR, and NOT operations, we are able to combine and manipulate conditional statements to derive a true or false output. Let's take a look at each of these logic operations now. First up we have the logical AND operator. The AND operator returns true if both inputs are true and returns false otherwise. Let's try an example and compare the inputs to the AND operator table to find the appropriate output. The first conditional statement will be, my shirt is pink. Well, that is a true statement, so we will use true for input A. The second conditional statement will be, my eyes are brown. Well, that is also a true statement, 
so we will use true for input b. Using the in operator table, we can now see our resulting Boolean value for this example would be true. Now for the logical OR operator. The OR operator returns true if any input is true. And returns false. Only when both inputs are false. Let's try an example and compare the inputs to the OR operator table to find the appropriate output. The first conditional statement will be, my shirt is pink. Well, that is a true statement, so we will use true for input A. The second conditional statement will be, my hair is blue. Well, that is a false statement, so we will use false for input B. Using the OR operator table, we can now see our resulting Boolean value for this example would be true. As at least one of our inputs evaluated to true. Finally, the logical NOT operator. The NOT operator returns true if the input is false. And false if the input is true. There are other logical operators, but these will serve as a great foundation for now. Now that we have discussed some of the more common logical operators, where might we find these in use? I got the perfect example. Every day we find ourselves using a search engine to locate a resource on the internet. Well why not use these logical operators to improve our searches and link search conditions together. For my example, I will use the Google search engine. By using logical operators in your search, you will effectively be performing an advanced Google search. I am going to start with the AND operator. My example search will have a searching for a resource that contains the word CompTIA and the word ITF+. By using the AND operator between these two words, Google will return results containing both words. My next search will utilize the OR operator. This example will search for the word CompTIA or the word ITF+. By using the OR operator between these two words, Google will return results containing at least one search word or the other but will not require both words to be present in the resource. Additionally, to exclude a specific word from a search result, just place a subtraction symbol or minus sign in front of the word. Then any resource containing that word will be omitted from your results. Exam Objective 1.3 Illustrate the basics of computing and processing. This exam objective starts with a definition most of us are familiar with. The definition of a computer. A computer is an electronic device that manipulates information or data. It has the ability to input, process, output, and store data. Within a computer there is a traffic flow of binary zeros and ones. At any given time, data is coming into a computing device as an input, being processed or manipulated by the computer's processor, being stored for later use, or distributed as an output. In the middle of all this, we have the system memory that serves as a staging or holding area for data. Data physically moves about a computing device using the device's hardware. Hardware refers to the physical elements of a computer. Another common word used in IT to refer to hardware is the word infrastructure. So if you hear the word infrastructure, think hardware. From our previous traffic example, hardware would be the roadways. So how does a computer decide what to do with the data? That is what software is for. Software is the instructions that tell a computer what to do. Another common word used in IT that is closely tied to software is the word logical. So if you hear the word logical, think software. From our previous traffic example, software would be the street signs and traffic signals. One last term you need to learn before moving on is peripheral device. A peripheral device is an auxiliary device that connects to and works with a computer and is used to put information into and get information out of the computer. Exam Objective 1.3 Illustrate the basics of computing and processing input and output. An input is when the computer receives data from a user through a peripheral device that connects to and works with a computer. An output is when the computer displays, plays, or distributes data to a user through a peripheral device that connects to and works with a computer. Now that we know what an input and an output are, let's classify peripheral devices based on whether they function as an input device or output device. I am going to start with input devices. For inputs we have a keyboard which allows a user to input text data, a mouse which allows a user to input hand movement data, 
a camera which allows a user to input visual data, and a scanner which allows a user to input image data. There are many more, but hopefully you are getting the idea. Now for output devices. For outputs we have a speaker which outputs sound data, a monitor which outputs visual data, a projector which is also used to output visual data, and a printer which outputs image data. Again this is not a complete list of output devices, but I hope you are getting comfortable classifying peripheral devices based on their ability to input or output data. Before I close out this video, we have one more group, some devices can perform as both an input and as an output device. These devices include a headset which inputs sound data through a microphone and outputs data through a speaker, a touchscreen display which inputs a user's hand movements or gestures and outputs visual data, and a multifunction printer which can input image data through its scanner functions and output image data through its printer functions. Exam Objective 1.3 Illustrate the Basics of Computing and Processing Processing is the manipulation of data by a computer's processor. The computer's processor is the brain of the computer. It receives inputs or previously stored data and manipulates that data based on the instructions it receives from software programs. The data is then provided as an output for the user or is stored for later use. Exam Objective 1.3 Illustrate the Basics of Computing and Processing Storage Storage is a process through which data is retained for future use. Data retention can be either temporary or permanent. For temporary storage, specifically while the computing device is powered on, any necessary data for the device's operation will be held in the system memory. Unfortunately, once the device is powered off, the system memory will no longer retain any data. For a more permanent data storage solution, a storage drive can be used. Any data preserved on a storage drive can be brought back into the system memory as needed and will retain data, even when a computing device is powered off. Exam Objective 1.4 Explain the value of data and information. An asset is property owned by a person or company, regarded as having value. When you think of assets, things like properties, cars, and other material possessions probably come to mind. But when you think about digital data, it is important to understand that digital data is more than a collection of zeros and ones. Digital data can certainly be of significant value to an organization or even an individual, and is therefore also considered an asset. Just like you would consider a security system for your home or car, or at least lock the doors while away from home, or parking your car in a bad neighborhood, you should also invest in securing your digital data. The more valuable the digital data the more essential it will be to put various security control measures in place. Exam Objective 1.4 Explain the value of data and information. Relationship of data to creating information. For this exam topic, we will need to distinguish between the definitions data, information, and insights. Data is raw values collected by a computer system. It is meaningless until placed in the correct context. For an example of this topic, I will start with the data value of 100. Without context this 100 could be anything. Information is data that has been processed into a form that has meaning and is useful. Information provides us with context. Continuing with our example, the data value of 100 has been given the context of miles. Our last definition will be insight. An insight is a meaningful and deep understanding of something. When enough quality information is combined and analyzed, insights can be formed. Now back to our example one more time. 100 miles could be considered a very long distance if walking. Or 100 miles could be a very short trip for a plane. What pieces of information we associate together. In this case 100 miles and a transportation method of walking or flying by plane will lead to different insights. Exam Objective 1.4 Explain the value of data and information. Intellectual property. Intellectual property is a category of property that includes creations of the human intellect. There are many types of intellectual property, but for the CompTIA ITF Plus certification exam, we will be focusing on trademarks, copyrights, and patents. We will discuss their definitions and how each might be applied. 
A trademark is a type of intellectual property consisting of a recognizable sign, design, or expression that uniquely identifies one product or service from others. A few items that could be trademarked would include company names, product names, slogans, and logos. Copyright is another type of intellectual property that protects original works of authorship from publication, distribution, and sale without the author's permission. One stipulation is that the work must be expressed in a tangible form. In other words, a book would need to have been written on a physical medium like paper or published in order to be eligible for copyright protections. When thinking of copyright, most people only think of the written word, but copyright can extend to items like graphical images and logos, or even computer software programs. The last intellectual property we will cover is a patent. A patent is a type of intellectual property that grants exclusive rights to an invention, which is a product or a process that provides a new way of doing something, or offers a new solution to a problem. Unlike copyrights, patents can be applied to an idea, even if the idea has not yet been made tangible. Exam Objective 1.4 Explain the value of data and information. Digital Products A digital product is a product that is sold or distributed as binary computer data. Digital products include items like software applications, video downloads, computer games, and ebooks. When creating digital products, there are some upsides and downsides. The overhead costs to manufacture and distribute digital products is very low, but the effort, time, and infrastructure costs to design and maintain a digital product are usually substantial. Something we certainly know well. This combination of factors is what makes digital products so easy to copy and steal. To combat digital product theft, various copy protections, referred to as digital rights management systems or DRMs for short, have been created. DRM implementations may require items like product keys and license codes or account setups with authorization requirements. Exam Objective 1.4 Explain the value of data and information. Data-driven business decisions. This whole exam topic will be about the process of using data to make business decisions. The first step to making any informed decision is to collect data. A computer can collect data from input devices, other computing devices, or software programs. In reality, this list is endless. This data is then stored in storage drives as raw data, in databases, or large-scale data warehouses and data centers. Once enough data is collected, correlations can be made. In the world of IT, correlations are simply relationships between data points. The advantage of using computing devices to scan for correlations is that a computer can perform the analysis of data points exponentially faster than a human can. As of late, data analysis has been taken even further with the increased use of artificial intelligence or AI. To give a real-world example of correlation, we have found that asking viewers to subscribe at the end of each video has a positive correlation resulting in an increase of viewers, taking the time to actually smash that subscribe button. This is a rather obvious correlation, but hopefully the example helps in your understanding of the topic. Once data correlations have been found and data analysis is completed, the data must be presented in a meaningful manner that is human-readable and helpful in making insightful decisions. A meaningful reporting system will usually include search and query functions, charts and graphs, or other methods of conveying information pictorially. Creating information such as a report is one of the most common uses for business data. Exam Objective 1.5 Compare and Contrast Common Units of Measure Up until now, we have been referring to a single zero or one as a binary digit, but a more common name for this quantity of data is a bit. A bit is a single binary digit and is the smallest increment of data for a computer. The next unit of measure we will discuss is a byte. A byte is a unit of measure that contains 8 bits, or a series of 8 zeros and ones. It is also important to note that a bit is represented with a lowercase b while a byte is represented with an uppercase b. Get these two measures confused. And you will be off by a factor of 8. Now you are a master of measures. Okay, not quite. But at least you now understand the foundational measures bit and byte. From here, every other measure we will need to know will just add a prefix to the front of these two measures. 
Let's start with a single bit and add our first prefix, kilo. Kilo means thousand. So a kilobit equals 1000 bits. Our next prefix is mega. Mega means million. So a megabit equals 1 million bits. This is followed by giga. Giga means billion. So a gigabit equals 1 billion bits. Then, tera. Tera means trillion. So a terabit equals 1 trillion bits. The last prefix we need to know for the CompTIA ITF plus exam is PETA. PETA means quadrillion. So a petabit equals 1 quadrillion bits. These same exact prefixes also apply to the base measure of byte. Let's start with a single byte and add our first prefix, kilo. Kilo means thousand. So a kilobyte equals 1000 bytes. Our next prefix is mega. Mega means million. So a megabyte equals 1 million bytes. This is followed by giga. Giga means billion. So a gigabyte equals 1 billion bytes. Then, tera. Tera means trillion. So a terabyte equals 1 trillion bytes. And then there is, peta. Peta means quadrillion. So a petabyte equals 1 quadrillion bytes. Exam Objective 1.5 Compare and contrast common units of measure. Storage units. We will get to the units of measure used for storage data shortly. First I want to address the concept of data at rest. Data at rest in information technology means data that is housed physically on a storage drive in a digital format. Now, with that concept out of the way, we can now take a look at the specific measurements used for storage. Or for that matter data that is at rest. Storage units are measured in bytes. That is uppercase B for bytes, not lowercase b for bits. The storage unit, bytes, can measure anything from a file, a group of files, or the contents of an entire storage drive. The storage drive itself will also have a capacity measured in bytes. Anytime you have data that is not being accessed and is stored on a physical medium like a storage drive, the preferred unit of measure will be bytes. As a few bytes can only store a minimal amount of information, we will have to deal in much larger quantities of bytes to meet today's demands. Some relevant quantities are Kilobytes. Kilobytes are quantities measured in thousands of bytes. This is an expected size for a text file or smaller images. We also have megabytes. Megabytes are quantities measured in millions of bytes. This is an expected size for larger images or smaller videos. Then there are gigabytes, which are quantities measured in billions of bytes. This is a common size for full-length cinematic movies and many modern hard drives have storage capacities in this range. Now we are getting into some big storage units. Up next is terabytes. Terabytes are quantities measured in trillions of bytes. Newer hard drives are now exceeding the terabyte threshold. The last storage unit we need to know for the CompTIA ITF Plus exam is petabytes. Petabytes are quantities measured in quadrillions of bytes. You might find these units of measure in large company servers, data centers, or other places where significant quantities of data are stored. At some point, you will undoubtedly have to convert between different storage unit sizes. This chart will help a bit visually. But I will also talk you through it and hit some key points for you. First, as you study, I want you to commit the order of sizes to memory from smallest to largest. Which would be, byte, kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, and petabyte. And now from largest to smallest, petabyte, terabyte, gigabyte, megabyte, kilobyte and back to a single byte. Next you should know that moving from any storage unit measure to the next closest measure is always a factor of 1000. Example. 1 kilobyte is 1000 bytes. 1 megabyte is 1000 kilobytes. 1 gigabyte is 1000 megabytes. 1 terabyte is 1000 gigabytes and so on. Understanding the relationship between these storage unit sizes will assist in converting between them when needed. Before I wrap this topic up, I wanted to do at least one measurement conversion with you. For our example, we will start with 44.6 megabytes. I will now convert this to kilobytes and then gigabytes. For those of you who don't trust your math skills, no problem. 
The most important part is to follow the decimal point, which I will now make red. As the difference from each storage unit size to the next closest size is a factor of 1000, we will see the decimal point move three place values to the left if going up one storage unit size. Or to the right three place values if we go down one storage unit size. I will start with converting 44.6 megabytes to kilobytes. As we went down a storage unit size, we have moved the decimal point three place values to the right. Now we can see that 44.6 megabytes is equivalent to 44,600 kilobytes. Now I will convert 44.6 megabytes to gigabytes. As we went up a storage unit size, we have moved the decimal point three place values to the left. Now we can see that 44.6 megabytes is equivalent to 0 0.0. 4. 4. 6 gigabytes. Exam objective 1.5, compare and contrast common units of measure. Throughput units. Throughput units are used for data in transit. Data in transit refers to digital data that is actively moving between two different computer systems, applications, or locations. Throughput units are measured in bits per second. That is lowercase b for bits, not uppercase b for bytes. The throughput unit, bits per second, can measure any digital data that is traveling from one point to another. This includes measuring the speed of network connections between computing devices or internal connections between computing components. Anytime you have data on the move, the preferred unit of measure will be bits per second. As a couple bits is not even enough to store a single ASCII character code point, we will have to deal in much larger quantities of bits to meet today's demands. Some relevant throughput unit quantities are Kilobits per second Kilobits per second are quantities measured in thousands of bits per second. This is a relatively low throughput rate for modern computing. We also have megabits per second. Megabits per second are quantities measured in millions of bits per second. Throughput rates in this range are common for internet connections in rural areas that are using slightly outdated technologies, where throughput rates are limited as a cost-saving measure, or where limited network infrastructure exists. Then there are gigabits per second, which are quantities measured in billions of bits per second. This is a common throughput rate for modern internet connections in urban areas. Gigabit connections are more than sufficient for most residential demands and many corporate environments. Now we are getting into some super fast throughput rates. Up next is terabits per second. Terabits per second are quantities measured in trillions of bits per second. Throughput rates in this range are relatively new and not very common. Unlike a bit, which is a static measurement, bits per second is a dynamic measurement. As such, I think it is worth breaking down this topic a bit further. Yes, that was an intended pun. Now for the breakdown. Let's start with bits. This is a quantity of binary digits, no different than we learned about prior. Per second is a measurement of time. The passage of time is what makes this measurement dynamic. Last, the division symbol makes this a ratio. In this case a ratio of bits to seconds. Putting all these pieces back together, we can conclude that bits per second is the number of bits that pass a fixed point every second. Time for a measurement conversion challenge. For this challenge, we will compare three different throughput measures each using a different unit and determine which throughput speed is the fastest. Here they are. In the top we have 0 0.4, 5, 8 gigabits per second. In the middle we have 49,896 kilobits per second. And down at the bottom we have 432 megabits per second. To compare these measures, I find it best to convert each value to the same throughput unit. Looking at my three values, I am going to choose megabits per second as my unit of choice. Back at the top we see gigabits per second which has a measure that is 1000 times larger than that of megabits per second. To convert from a larger unit of measure to a measure one unit smaller, we will move the decimal point three place values to the right. This results in 458 megabits per second. Returning to the middle value, we see kilobits per second which has a measure that is 1000 times smaller than that of megabits per second. To convert from a smaller unit of measure to a measure one unit larger, we will move the decimal point three place values to the left. 
This results in 49.89.6 megabits per second. At the bottom, 432 megabits per second is already in the correct unit of measure so no conversion is needed. Comparing these values is now much easier as they have all been converted to the same throughput unit of measure. Taking a quick peek at our original values, we can now see 0.4.5.8 gigabits per second is the fastest of the three values. Exam Objective 1.5 Compare and Contrast Common Units of Measure Precision Measurements Every measurement unit we have learned thus far has been based on factors of 1000. For example, with bits, lowercase b, there are 1000 bits in a kilobit. There are 1000 kilobits in a megabit. And so on. The same holds true for bytes, uppercase b, as well. There are 1000 bytes in a kilobyte. There are 1000 kilobytes in a megabyte, etc. And this is great, as it makes working with larger quantities a little easier. But you should know that these numbers do not represent the exact number of bits or bytes for a measure. These are rounded values. While the rounded values you have learned are great for most uses in the world of information technology, there will be times when precision measurements are needed. These measurements are based on the binary numbering system. Which makes sense as computers work at a fundamental level with the binary numbering system too. So, if we multiply by 2, a total of 10 times, or 2 to the 10th power, we will end up with 1024. 1024 is the precise factor between each unit of measure. 1024 is fairly close to 1000, but when precision measurements are needed, rounding to 1000 just won't do. Now let's take a closer look at these precision units of measure. For simplicity we will just cover bytes. Any principles we apply here to bytes, will also apply to bits. And bits per second. First, notice that 1024 bytes equals a single kibibyte. Wait, what was that unit of measure? Yes, the prefixes have changed just a little with these precision measurements. For this unit, the prefix kibi replaced kilo. We were also given a new acronym to look out for. A kibibyte can be represented as KB or KIB. Moving on, our next precision unit of measure is mebibyte. A single mebibyte is equal to 1024 kibibytes. Next, we have gibibyte. A single gibibyte is equal to 1024 mebibytes. Then there is tebibyte. And finally, pebibyte. Using our new knowledge of precision measurements, let's talk our way through a simple conversion. We are going to convert 4 kibibytes to bytes. Instead of 1000, our factor is now 1024. So we will multiply the 4 in kibibytes by 1024 and see that 4 kibibytes equals precisely 4096 bytes. Exam Objective 1.5 Compare and Contrast Common Units of Measure Processing Speeds Processing speeds are a unit of measure for data in use. Data in use in information technology means data that is currently being processed or acted upon by a system's processor. A computer has an internal clock. The clock speed controls the number of cycles or effectively the number of software instructions a processor can execute per second. The processor's speed measurement used to express cycles per second is hertz. A hertz is a unit of frequency equivalent to one cycle per second. Now that we have a base measurement for processing speed, we need to apply our prefixes as a computer processes way more than one instruction each second. Some relevant quantities you will most likely encounter for processing speeds are Megahertz Megahertz are quantities measured in millions of cycles per second. The clock rates for older computers and their processors worked at these processing speeds. It is more likely though, that you will encounter the unit gigahertz in modern computing devices and processors. Gigahertz are quantities measured in billions of cycles per second. Exam Objective 1.6 Explain the Troubleshooting Methodology Troubleshooting is simply the process of problem solving. In the world of IT, you will be called upon to solve problems on a regular basis. Having a step-by-step -step approach to troubleshooting will help make this task much easier. In Exam Objective 1.6, CompTIA has outlined a troubleshooting process to follow. 
CompTIA's troubleshooting methodology can be broken into eight steps. 1. Identify the problem. 2. Research knowledge base or internet, if applicable. 3. Establish a theory of probable cause. 4. Test the theory to determine the cause. 5. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and identify potential effects. 6. Implement the solution or escalate as necessary. 7. Verify full system functionality and, if applicable, implement preventive measures. 8. Document findings or lessons learned, actions, and outcomes. Each of these steps will be covered in other videos. For now, I want you to commit these steps to memory and be able to place them in order. Not only will you be asked to recall these steps on the CompTIA ITF Plus exam, but you will also see this troubleshooting methodology on other CompTIA certification exams as well. Exam Objective 1.6 Explain the troubleshooting methodology. Identify the problem. The first step in CompTIA's troubleshooting process is to identify the problem. To do this, we must turn to the left side of our brains and think logically. Fortunately, we have a few guidelines that can help keep us on track during this stage of troubleshooting. The main objective at this stage in the troubleshooting process is to gather information. Information can be gathered in many ways. You can try duplicating the problem. Observing the issue as it occurs can give great insight. You can question the users. If a user is experiencing the problem, they will have first-hand knowledge of the issue. Also, don't discount that the issue could be user error. Computing systems and their programs, at times, can be complex, so misuse is always a possibility. Identifying the symptoms will help narrow down possible causes for an issue. Symptoms could include error messages or physical conditions. Many times, we can use our sense of smell, sight, touch, or hearing as diagnostic tools. I would probably avoid taste. Determining if anything has changed is another way to identify a problem. Commonly, issues arise after changes or updates have taken place. Finally, if there are multiple problems, treat them as separate issues, at least until you're certain they are related. Assuming multiple symptoms are related to a single cause can lead to occasional misdiagnosis. Exam Objective 1.6 Explain the Troubleshooting Methodology Research Knowledge Base Step 2 in CompTIA's troubleshooting process is to research a knowledge base. A knowledge base is a self-serve library of information about a product, service, or topic. A knowledge base could be compiled by a company, manufacturer, or simply the internet, which would probably be the biggest knowledge base of all. The whole idea behind a knowledge base is to pull from the experience of those who have come before you. So don't waste time reinventing the wheel. Or, in other words, if someone has already experienced the same problem and has documented the solution, and you trust the source, then maybe their solution can work for you too. Exam Objective 1.6 Explain the troubleshooting methodology. Establish a theory of probable cause and test the theory. Step 3 in CompTIA's troubleshooting process is to establish a theory of probable cause. This step is closely related to step 4, which is to test the theory and determine the cause. These two steps may also be repeated as many times as necessary, as sometimes our initial theory is wrong. If at first you don't succeed, try again. If you have completed step 1, identify the problem. And step 2, research a knowledge base. Then you hopefully have gathered sufficient information about an issue to proceed to step 3, establish a theory of probable cause. Here you will begin to think about possible causes to an issue with the hopes of narrowing down the list of suspects. When first getting going, start with theories that are easy to test and be sure to question the obvious. Assumptions at this point can be catastrophic. Let's say we receive a complaint that a user's laptop is not working. An example of questioning the obvious would be to check if it is even charged. It also helps to think outside the box and consider multiple approaches. You could even work with another technician to attack the problem from different angles. You could work on one theory while your coworker tries another theory. This approach is referred to as divide and conquer. Step 4 in CompTIA's troubleshooting process is to test the theory to determine the cause. Coming up with a theory was a great start, but now you need to test it. 
While testing is the logical step after establishing a theory, we need to remember these two steps are an iterative process and we might need to repeat them a number of times. Testing a theory will require some kind of experiment or action to confirm the cause of an issue. This can include changing out a component for a known good component or performing an experiment on a test system. Once your theory is confirmed and you have found the root cause of an issue, the next step is to resolve the problem. If testing does not confirm your theory, establish a new theory. At some point you may run out of ideas, and that is okay. At that point you need to find a way to escalate the problem. A form of escalation could be seeking help from another technician, a supervisor, or a specialist in the area you are having an issue with. Exam Objective 1.6 Explain the troubleshooting methodology. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and identify potential effects. After determining the root cause of an issue, you can move on to step 5 in CompTIA's troubleshooting process. Establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and identify potential effects. Within your plan of action you are likely to come to one of three solution measures. Repair, replace, or ignore. Ignoring a problem as a solution measure is self-explanatory, so I will focus on repair and replace. The choice between repair and replace will usually come down to cost. Repairing is usually a cheaper alternative to replacing, but not always. When establishing your plan, start by deciding if you will repair, replace, or ignore the problem. The rest of your plan will fall in line after that. Another item to be aware of when establishing a plan is to identify the potential side effects of your plan. Many times in IT, systems are interconnected. A change to one system can often have unintended side effects on another system. You may not be able to prevent every side effect, but proper planning can at least keep these to a minimum. Exam Objective 1.6 Explain the troubleshooting methodology. Implement the solution or escalate as necessary. Once you have established a plan of action, according to Step 6 in CompTIA's troubleshooting process, it is time to implement your solution. The biggest concern with implementing a solution is minimizing disruptions and obtaining authorization. If you did a thorough job while establishing your plan, it will include detailed steps, required resources, and most importantly, a rollback or backout plan should things go wrong. Having these items in place will help the implementation process run smoother. Your job at this step is to cause as little disruption to the systems in place and their users as possible. In larger environments, it may even be necessary to seek authorization for a change. This authorization might come from a supervisor or a change advisory board. Exam Objective 1.6 Explain the troubleshooting methodology. Verify full system functionality and, if applicable, implement preventive measures. After the implementation of a solution, it is time for step 7 of CompTIA's troubleshooting process, which is to verify full system functionality. While you may have only made a change to one system, in IT, it is common that multiple systems will be interconnected. Thus, in addition to verifying that you resolve the initial issue, you will need to verify the system, as a whole, continues to function properly. Now that you have solved the problem, we want to make sure it does not happen again. Preventing the recurrence of an issue is where you can truly set yourself apart from other technicians. Though not always in your control, the recurrence of some issues can be avoided with user education, by changing a process, or by using an alternate software or equipment provider. Course. Exam Objective 1.6 Explain the troubleshooting methodology. Document findings, lessons learned, actions, and outcomes. The final and last step in CompTIA's troubleshooting process is to document your findings. Again, the last step is to document everything. Document the symptoms, document your actions, document your outcomes, and document any lessons learned. That way when a problem is resolved, there is a complete record of everything that transpired during the entire troubleshooting process. This can be extremely helpful when providing any technical support in the future. Do you remember step 2, research a knowledge base? Well where do you think a company's knowledge base comes from? Knowledge bases evolve and grow over time as issues are experienced. So do your best when documenting any issues you resolve, as people other than you, may come to rely on it in the future. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces 
When dealing with computing components, an interface is a physical connection across which two or more separate components of a computer system exchange information. Each interface type will conform to a standard. These standards are really what we will be talking about in this exam objective. The interface standards create a uniform way of encoding, transmitting, receiving, and decoding the binary bits being sent from one computing device to another. For the CompTIA ITF Plus exam, we will be grouping device interfaces into three categories. These three categories are Networking interfaces Networking interfaces will allow communication from one computing device to another computing device. An example would be an interface that creates a connection from a laptop to a smartphone. The second category is peripheral device interfaces. Peripheral device interfaces will allow communication from a computing device to a peripheral device. An example would be an interface that creates a connection from a laptop to a printer. And the third category is graphic device interfaces. Graphic device interfaces will allow you to transmit visual data for display purposes from a computing device to a graphic device. An example would be an interface that creates a connection from a desktop PC to a computer monitor. With our three categories aside, we can also classify interfaces as being either wired or wireless. Wired interfaces will require a cable to extend between two devices. These cables will terminate with a connector and these connectors will plug into a port on the device. Now let us quickly sort out the difference between connectors and ports. A connector is the side of a connection with a pin or pins. In the graphic displayed, the connectors for many common computing interface standards are lined up along the bottom. A port is the side of a connection with a hole or holes. In the graphic behind me, the ports for many common computing interface standards are lined up just above their corresponding connectors. Plug the connector into its port and we now have a physical connection with which to transmit data. For desktop computers, you may have ports on the front and back of the case, while laptops will typically have ports positioned around the edges of the case. Then there are the ports on a smartphone, tablet, television, projector, printer and so on. Quickly, you begin to see computing ports are everywhere. Thank goodness there are interface standards that keep device manufacturers all on the same page. If there is no cable, connector, or port we can see, then our interface must be wireless. Now before going any further, I would like to address a big misconception about wireless. Wireless does not mean. A physical connection does not exist. Wireless connections use radio frequencies, or RF for short. Radio frequencies are an electromagnetic signal used to connect computing devices without wires. This electromagnetic connection, even though invisible to the eye, is still a physical property that allows information to be transmitted from one computing device to another and is therefore classified as a physical interface. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces Electrical Signals in this video, I would like to do some bonus teaching. While electrical signaling is not an official CompTIA ITF plus exam topic, it will help with your understanding of interfaces, especially graphic interfaces. So what is an electrical signal? An electrical signal is when electricity is used to convey information. This is usually accomplished by manipulating the electrical property, voltage, up and down, as it travels across a medium, such as a copper wire. The most basic example of this was sending Morse code across a wire back in the day. As for the electrical signals themselves, there are two main types. Analog signals and digital signals. An analog signal is a signal that produces a smooth and continuous curve. In this type of signal, the binary ones and zeros that we transmit are represented by the highs and lows of the signal voltage. Here is a visual example of an analog signal. Notice how the signal produces smooth and continuous upward and downward curves. Unlike analog signals, a digital signal represents data as a sequence of discrete values where binary ones and zeros are represented by the presence or non-presence of voltage. An upside to digital signals is that they support higher data throughputs. This is probably why digital signals have mostly replaced analog signals in present-day computing. 
Here is a visual example of a digital signal. We can see that the gradual increases and decreases in voltage are replaced with discrete values, causing the square corners you see in the signal. Great, now you know the basic difference between analog and digital signals. Now keep an eye out for analog and digital signals as we move forward with this exam objective. You are sure to see it again. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces RJ11 RJ11 is a wired networking interface standard that has been around since the 1970s. RJ11, where the RJ stands for, Registered Jack, is a common connector for telephone communications and dial-up internet. The RJ11 connector can support up to six pins or positions into which wires can be inserted but most use cases for the RJ11 connector only utilize two or four of those pins. For those who may not be familiar with old-school telephones, dial-up internet, or even DSL internet, here is an example installation diagram. This diagram in particular depicts how DSL is commonly installed. I will start at the RJ11 wall socket. This is the connection point in the home or office to the telecommunication provider. Next, we have a splitter. This is specific to a DSL installation, as it separates internet and telephone traffic. For telephone or dial-up services, you would not have needed a splitter as you would just run an RJ11 cable directly to the telephone or dial-up modem. Continuing with our DSL installation, you would run two separate RJ11 cables from the splitter, one to the telephone and one to the DSL modem. Throughout this whole installation, only the RJ11 network interface standard was used. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces RJ45 RJ45 is a wired networking interface standard that has been around since the late 1980s. RJ45, where the RJ stands for, Registered Jack, is a common connector used to terminate Ethernet CAT cables which are the most common internet cables in use today. The RJ45 connector has eight pins or positions into which wires can be inserted. When placed side by side with an RJ11 connector, the RJ45 connector will appear similar in design to the RJ11 connector, but will be noticeably larger. Just to make sure I didn't lose you when I mentioned CAT cables a moment ago, here is a quick breakdown. Category or CAT cables are a type of twisted pair cabling. Inside a CAT cable are eight individual wires. These wires are grouped into four pairs. Each pair is color-coded and then twisted together. The cable is then terminated with an RJ45 connector. Most have experienced these twisted pair CAT cables, also referred to as Ethernet cables, when connecting their home routers to the internet or their computing devices to the router. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces NFC Near Field Communication or NFC is a wireless networking interface standard that was released in 2003. NFC uses radio frequencies to transmit and receive data over a short distance of a few centimeters. To be more precise, the official CompTIA ITF Plus study guide sets NFC distance limitations at 6 centimeters or 2 inches and NFC's data throughput rates max out at 424 kilobits per second. While NFC-based connections have many uses, by far the most common use is contactless payment processing. How many times a day do you take out your credit card or smartphone and tap that payment device? Each time you do, you are using NFC to send your credit card information to the payment device. NFC also provides a one-to-one -one connection with bidirectional communication. No one-way traffic here. And if that wasn't enough, NFC transmits and receives data with built-in security protocols. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces Bluetooth Bluetooth is a wireless networking interface and peripheral device interface standard that was introduced in 1998. Bluetooth uses radio frequencies to transmit and receive data over a short distance of a few meters. Stats associated with Bluetooth can be debatable, so I will give you the numbers provided in the official CompTIA ITF Plus study guide. The guide sets Bluetooth's distance limitations at 10 meters or 30 feet, 
and has Bluetooth's data throughput rates maxing out at 24 megabits per second in high-speed mode. To establish a Bluetooth connection, you will need to head to the setting menu. This process is consistent, no matter the device. Be sure you have the Bluetooth antenna enabled or turned on to allow for Bluetooth radio transmissions. Next, you will need to search for and select the device you would like to pair or bond with. Pairing is the process of establishing a Bluetooth connection between two devices. For last step, some devices will use an authentication passcode for security. If used, this passcode will be displayed at the time the pair request is initiated. At this point, just enter the passcode to accept the connection. Bluetooth is a versatile interface standard. If you recall from the beginning of this video, Bluetooth is a wireless networking interface and peripheral device interface standard. Two for the price of one. Networking interface uses include Bluetooth tethering or the sharing of an internet connection from one device to another through a Bluetooth connection. Then there is Bluetooth file sharing which allows the transfer of files between devices. Just remember to keep in mind that Bluetooth throughput data rates will be a significant limitation for larger data transfers. As for peripheral device interface uses, Bluetooth allows you to wirelessly connect a keyboard, mouse, printer, speakers, and many other peripheral devices to your computing device, so long as they are within a few meters of each other. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces USB USB or Universal Serial Bus is a wired peripheral device interface standard that was released in 1996. USB has been adopted, well, universally. You can find USB in use just about everywhere. USB also has a host of features. Feature number 1, USB Plug and Play. USB Plug and Play refers to the ability of a computer system to automatically detect and configure a USB device. Plug and Play revolutionized the way we connect and use peripheral devices by eliminating the need for complex manual software installations. Who doesn't like a convenient and user-friendly option? Just plug in your device that utilizes the USB peripheral device standard for connection and you're done. Feature number 2, Hot Swappable. Hot Swappable for USB means that you can plug or unplug USB devices from your computer while it is powered on, without needing to restart or shut down the system, providing convenient and seamless connectivity. Feature number 3. We got power. With the USB peripheral device interface connectivity is further enhanced as it enables the simultaneous transfer of data and power between devices. To do this, a USB cable contains four copper wires. Two wires to send and receive data and two wires to provide power and ground. With USB's main features explained, I will now help you with understanding the many types of connectors and ports that USB utilizes. Here is a quick look at the ports and connectors for the USB standard. Most of these should be recognizable, all except USB Type-B. This one doesn't get much love. The presence of USB Type-B ports has mostly been confined to printers. Another useful fact is that USB Type-C connectors are reversible or non-keyed. Meaning you can insert a USB Type-C connector into its port with either side facing up. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces FireWire FireWire is a wired peripheral device interface standard that was released in 1995. With FireWire, there is not much to talk about. In fact, I am sure a few of you are scratching your heads wondering what FireWire is. The FireWire standard came out about the same time as USB, but it did not receive wide support from computing manufacturers, leading to its obscurity. FireWire provides many of the same features as USB, including being plug-and-play capable, hot-swappable, and also provides peripheral devices with power in addition to data transmissions. Connectors for FireWire come with either 6 or 4 pins. Now one last word of caution. Be careful not to confuse the 6-pin connector with that of the USB, Type-B connector. They are very similar in appearance. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces Thunderbolt 
Thunderbolt is a newer wired networking interface, peripheral device interface and graphical device interface standard all in one. It was developed by Intel and released in 2011. Thunderbolt was primarily used with Mac workstations and laptops, but has continued to grow in popularity, expanding to all types of computing devices. Thunderbolt adds to many of the great features already offered by USB. First and foremost, Thunderbolt added the ability to transmit visual data for display purposes, thus making it a graphical device interface. It also offers throughputs up to 40 gigabits per second. Wow, that is fast. Another cool feature is Thunderbolt's ability to connect two Mac devices together by forming a network connection, known as a Thunderbolt bridge. This is what makes Thunderbolt a networking interface. Thunderbolt's latest versions have even become compatible with USB and even use the USB Type-C connector. Uh-oh. How do you avoid confusion then? Easy. Look for the Thunderbolt icon next to the port. Without the Thunderbolt icon, you will not get Thunderbolt's bonus features. One more detail for Thunderbolt, like USB-C, Thunderbolt connectors are reversible or non-keyed, meaning you can insert a Thunderbolt connector into its port with either side facing up. Of course. Exam Objective 2.1, Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces. RFID. RFID is an acronym for Radio Frequency Identification and is a wireless peripheral device interface technology used to communicate and interact with RFID-enabled peripherals. This interface allows for wireless identification, tracking, and data exchange between the peripheral devices and a source computing device. This standard is best suited for enhancing automation and efficiency in various industries and applications. When using RFID, an RFID reader scans a tag. The tag then responds back with information that has been programmed into it. RFID systems can be either passive or active in nature. Passive RFID systems consist of an RFID tag and reader, where the tag relies on the reader's energy, in the form of electrical inductance, to power and transmit its stored information. Active RFID systems, on the other hand, use battery-powered tags that actively send signals to the reader, allowing for longer ranges and continuous tracking. Passive RFID is cost-effective and suitable for short-range applications, while active RFID offers greater range and real-time tracking capabilities, making it ideal for scenarios like asset management or vehicle tracking. RFID technology is widely utilized for inventory control and tracking due to its ability to provide accurate and efficient identification and monitoring of assets. By tagging items with RFID tags and deploying RFID readers, businesses can automate inventory management, streamline supply chain operations, and gain real-time visibility into stock levels, location tracking, and movement history. RFID technology is also commonly employed for security access control systems. By utilizing RFID cards or key fobs embedded with RFID tags, individuals can easily gain authorized access to secured areas by presenting their credentials to RFID readers. Using RFID in this manner assists in ensuring only authorized personnel can enter restricted areas. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces VGA. VGA is short for Video Graphics Array and is a graphic device interface standard that was released in 1986 and was very popular with older computing devices. This standard is not the oldest graphic interface standard, but is the oldest one we will cover for this CompTIA ITF Plus exam. Some useful facts about this standard are that it uses a 15 pin connector that is often signified by the color blue. The standard is designed to transmit video only. So if you want audio too, you are going to need another interface and cable for that. VGA also uses analog signals to transmit data. Now, we discussed in the electrical signals video that analog signals do not transmit as fast as digital signals. As a byproduct, the use of analog signals with the VGA graphic interface standard causes it to be incapable of supporting higher resolutions or the amazing graphics that we have become accustomed to. No HD or high-definition images with this standard. The VGA standard also separated and individually transmitted the colors of red, green, and blue, or the RGB color values. 
this has led to some strange troubleshooting issues over the years. For example, damaged cables would cause screens to render colors incorrectly. In the case of this screen image behind me, it is very possible that the wire responsible for transmitting the green color values has been damaged within the VGA cable, leaving only the red and blue values. The same issue can also occur if the pins in the connector have become bent or broken. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces DVI Digital Video Interface, or DVI for short, is a graphic device interface standard that was released in 1999. That was over a decade after the release of the VGA standard. DVI had the main job of bridging the gap between old and new. Older display devices were using analog signals, while manufacturers were pushing to release newer display devices that utilized digital signals, in order to provide higher resolutions, or output better quality graphics. Improving upon VGA, the DVI connector came with a possible 29 pins. With more pins came more possibilities, including the ability to solve the problem manufacturers were faced with. With these additional pins, DVI was able to transmit and receive both analog and digital signals. Still no audio though. With up to 29 pins at its disposal, the DVI standard comes with five different variants. As I stated previously, DVI supports both analog and digital signals. So here is how we keep things organized. DVI-A is the analog variant. DVI-A transmits only analog signals. It is designed to transmit video signals in a manner similar to a VGA connection. DVI-D is the digital variant. DVI-D transmits digital signals only, and its connectors can come in different configurations, such as single link or dual link. In single link DVI, there is only one channel or pathway available for transmitting data and dual link has two channels. With a second channel, higher quality graphics can be achieved. It sure seems like we are always on a quest for bigger and better graphics. Okay, now for the last variant. DVI-I With DVI-I, the second I stands for integrated. This variant is a hybrid interface that combines both analog and digital signals in a single connector. DVI-I also offers single link and dual link configuration options but these options are only supported by the digital half of this variant. That was a lot of information and worthy of a quick summary. So remember, DVI-A transmits analog signals. DVI-D transmits digital signals. And DVI-I transmits both analog and digital signals. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces HDMI in 2004, the HDMI Graphic Device Interface Standard was released. HDMI stands for High Definition Multimedia Interface, and it comes with a 19-pin connector. Now the name, High Definition Multimedia, really says it all. HDMI supports multimedia, or audio and video in one interface. No longer do we need a second cable to transmit audio data. This standard was immediately adopted by television manufacturers and then quickly spread to all display devices. Today, it is the most widely used graphic device interface. Also, as the name implies, it supports high-definition resolutions or high-quality graphics. The HDMI standard also dropped analog signaling altogether and is fully digital. The HDMI graphic device interface standards connectors come in three different sizes to accommodate various devices and their space limitations. The standard HDMI connector, shown on the left, is the most common and is found on most consumer electronics such as TVs, Blu-ray players, and gaming consoles. On the other hand, smaller devices like tablets, smartphones, and some cameras often use the smaller mini HDMI connector, shown in the middle or the micro HDMI connector, shown on the right. Exam Objective 2.1 Classify Common Types of Input and Output Device Interfaces Display Port and Mini Display Port I have saved the best for last. Well, that is merely an opinion and certainly debatable, so I will invite you to comment with your personal thoughts. So here we go. A few years after the release of HDMI, in 2008, 
We were given the DisplayPort graphic device interface standard. Since 2008, DisplayPort and HDMI have been battling it out for top spot. Their rivalry is similar to the matchup between USB and FireWire, with the exception that DisplayPort does have a significant manufacturer following. In fact many manufacturers are providing both HDMI and DisplayPort interfaces on their computing devices to allow users to choose for themselves. So let's cover the basics of DisplayPort. It comes with a 20-pin connector, provides audio and video data streaming, and uses digital signaling. Sounds a lot like HDMI, doesn't it? So how are these two standards different? Well, the DisplayPort standard is free to use, or open source. While the HDMI standard charges the manufacturers a small fee per device for its use. Also, DisplayPort has a higher throughput speed for now. I say for now, as updates to these standards are always in the works. One last note, DisplayPort has a mini cousin. The mini DisplayPort. This connector was developed by Apple and provides a smaller physical interface that is great for smaller computing devices that have very little space for ports. A few examples of devices that use the mini display port interface are MacBook Pro, MacBook Air, and MacBook Mini. Also worth noting, mini display port is gradually being replaced in favor of the USB-C and Thunderbolt standards, which offer more versatility and compatibility with a wider range of devices. However, adapters and cables do exist, allowing mini display port devices to connect with newer systems using USB-C or Thunderbolt. Exam Objective 2.2, given a scenario, set up and install common peripheral devices to a laptop or PC. Device Setup With Exam Objective 2.2, I will be teaching you about common peripheral devices, basic configuration settings, and some installation types you might encounter along the way. The images I will be using will be based on the Windows 10 operating system. This is because CompTIA exam content and questions will lean more toward Windows than macOS or Linux. Well, with the exception of the Linux Plus exam, of course. For device setup, Windows 10 has two main utilities. Control Panel and Windows Settings. Control Panel and Windows Settings provide the ability to view and change system settings. It consists of a set of applets that include, but are not limited to, controlling user accounts, changing accessibility options, accessing networking settings, and as it applies to this exam objective, we can use these tools to add, remove, and configure peripheral devices. Exam Objective 2.2, given a scenario, set up and install common peripheral devices to a laptop or PC. Printer and Scanner we will cover printers and scanners together as they are fairly similar. In fact, it is very often that printers and scanners come packaged together as a single unit known as a multifunction device, or MFD for short. A printer is a peripheral device which makes a physical rendering of digital data, usually on paper, or creates a physical object from a three-dimensional digital model, in the case of a 3D printer. Some of the most common printer types are laser printers, inkjet printers, thermal printers, impact printers, and 3D printers. While a printer outputs digital data, a scanner does the exact opposite. A scanner is a peripheral device that optically scans images or objects and converts them into digital data. The most common scanner types are flatbed scanners and sheet-fed scanners. When connecting a printer or a scanner, we have multiple options available. For a printer or scanner that is directly connected to a computer, also referred to as a local connection, you would most likely use a USB interface. And probably a USB Type-B connector. Though less common, the wireless, Bluetooth interface can also be used as an alternative for a local connection setup. If the printer of scanner is to be made available to an entire network of devices, a wired network connection would be made with an Ethernet CAT cable that uses RJ45 connectors. And last, the wireless alternative for a network connection would be Wi-Fi. In order to configure a printer or a scanner, you would need to open the Windows Devices and Printers applet. This can be accessed using either the Windows Settings tool or Control Panel. My personal choice just happens to be Control Panel. For now, I will just cover a few configuration options. 
starting with duplex. Duplex is printing on both sides of a piece of paper during the printing process. If your printer has a duplex assembly, you would right-click on the printer of choice. Select Printer Properties and navigate to the Duplex Configuration option. There you would select two-sided printing or duplex printing. If your printer does not have a duplex assembly to automatically perform two-sided printing, duplex printing might still be performed manually. To go green for a moment, duplex or two-sided printing does have an added benefit of using half as much paper as standard printing. This is not only an environmentally friendly option but a cost-saving option as well. Another configuration option is the collate setting. In printing, collate refers to the arrangement of printed pages or documents in a specific order. It ensures that the pages are organized correctly, such as when printing multiple copies of a multi-page document, so that each set of pages is in the desired sequence. The last configuration option I will mention is orientation. Print orientation refers to the direction or alignment in which content is printed on a page. It determines whether the content is printed in a portrait orientation, meaning vertically, or landscape orientation, meaning horizontally. Exam Objective 2.2 Given a scenario, set up and install common peripheral devices to a laptop or PC. Keyboard A keyboard is a peripheral device used to input data and commands into a computer or other electronic device. When configuring a keyboard, you will notice the configuration options are spread out between Control Panel and Windows settings. I will start with the Keyboard Properties applet found in the Control Panel. To open the Keyboard Properties applet, navigate to Control Panel and select Keyboard. Here you can configure the repeat delay, repeat rate, and sensitivity for your key inputs. If you are using the Windows Settings tool, you would navigate to Time and Language to access additional keyboard configuration options. Here you will find options for adding a keyboard or setting a keyboard's default language. Exam Objective 2.2 Given a scenario, set up and install common peripheral devices to a laptop or PC. Mouse A mouse is a handheld pointing device that allows users to control the movement of a cursor or pointer on a computer screen. When configuring a mouse, you will be able to access the Mouse Properties applet from either Control Panel or the Windows Settings tool. I will start with Control Panel. To open the Mouse Properties applet, navigate to Control Panel and select Mouse. Here you can adjust button configurations, double-click speed, and customize your on-screen cursor or pointer. You can also control your pointer speed or how fast the cursor will move across your screen. If you want to use the Windows Settings tool, you would navigate to Devices, and then Mouse. Last, you would select Additional Mouse Options to access the Mouse Properties applet. Exam Objective 2.2 Given a scenario, set up and install common peripheral devices to a laptop or PC. Camera A camera is a peripheral device that records video images using a digital sensor. They may be an external device that is connected through a wired or wireless interface or built into the case of a device, which is common for smartphones, tablets, laptops, and some televisions. Also, cameras will often come with a microphone too, in order to capture audio data. The configuration options for a camera mostly revolve around privacy. In the Windows Settings tool, navigate to Privacy, and then Camera. Here you will have the option to allow or deny applications access to your camera device. Exam Objective 2.2 Given a scenario, set up and install common peripheral devices to a laptop or PC. External Hard Drive An external hard drive is a peripheral storage device that connects to the exterior of a computing device. These external hard drives are commonly connected using a USB or Thunderbolt interface and are designed to provide additional storage space, above and beyond what a device's internal storage can offer. Configuration options for an external hard drive will not be found in Control Panel or Windows settings like many other devices. Instead, all system hard drives, both internal and external, are handled by the Windows Disk Management Utility. With Disk Management, you can configure an external hard drive however you would like. 
Exam Objective 2.2 Given a scenario, set up and install common peripheral devices to a laptop or PC. Speakers Speakers are a peripheral output device that converts digital data to audible sounds. Speakers may also be referred to as a playback device. When configuring an audio output device like a pair of speakers, you will be able to access the sound applet from control panel or use the Windows settings tool to make your configuration changes. I will start with control panel. To open the sound applet, navigate to control panel and select sound. Here you can adjust which sound output device or playback device will be used by the system. It is common for a computing device to have multiple playback devices, so heading to the sound applet to ensure the correct playback device has been selected is a fairly common task. You can also use the sound applet for selecting which sound input device or microphone the system should use. Microphones may also be referred to as a recording device. If you want to use the Windows Settings tool, you would navigate to System and then Sound. The Windows Settings tool for sound configurations may look a bit different than the sound applet, but here, you will still be able to select the output or playback device and the input or recording device that should be used by the system. Exam Objective 2.2 Given a scenario, set up and install common peripheral devices to a laptop or PC. Displays a display is a peripheral output device that converts digital data into visual images for human observation. Some of the most common display types are Computer monitors, which can be connected to a desktop Built-in screens, like those embedded in laptops, tablets, and smartphones Projectors, which cast images onto a surface, typically a screen or wall, for large-scale viewing And televisions when connecting a display device we are going to need a graphic device interface. Luckily, we have multiple options available. For older display devices, we have VGA and DVI, and for newer display devices, we have HDMI and DisplayPort. Many of today's displays come with touchscreen capabilities. A touchscreen acts as an alternative to a mouse and or keyboard. With a touch screen, a user can interact directly with the display through a series of touches or hand gestures in order to input data. When configuring your display or displays, you will be using the Windows Settings tool. So open Windows Settings, navigate to System and then select Display. Here you will be able to configure Scaling Options Display Resolution Display Orientation or configure how your device will utilize multiple displays. Now I will explain a bit about each of these configuration options. Scaling is a configuration option that adjusts the size of text, icons, and navigation elements presented to the user. This can make a computer display easier for people to see and use, especially for those who are visually impaired. Next we have display resolution. Display resolution is a configuration option that adjusts the number of pixels displayed on a screen, thus, determining the level of detail and clarity in the visual content displayed. A pixel can be thought of as a dot of color. The more dots of color included in a fixed area, the more detail we can achieve. So to understand a resolution, we need to build upon this idea of pixels. Looking at the list of display resolutions to my left, we see the first resolution on the list is 1920 by 1080. The 1920 is the number of pixels or dots of color that a display will have extending from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. Thinking of this in a grid or table format, the 1920 would be the number of pixel columns defining the width of the screen in pixels. The 1080 would then be the number of pixels or dots of color that a display will have extending from the top to the bottom of the screen. Once again, thinking of this in a grid or table format, the 1080 would be the number of pixel rows defining the height of the screen in pixels. Put these two numbers together, 1920 by 1080 and you have an overall display resolution defining the width and height in pixel counts. If you multiply the two numbers together, you will also get the total number of color pixels displayed on the screen. So I hope you are a curious learner and you are now wondering why the word recommended is displayed next to 1920 by 1080.
Well, that is a great question. Thank you for bringing it up. For every display, a manufacturer has designed their device to perform optimally at a specific resolution. Even though you can select from many different display resolutions in order to suit your needs, you will always see the word recommended next to the intended resolution for that display. The recommended resolution is also called the native resolution. Now we have display orientation. Display orientation refers to the direction or alignment in which content is displayed on a screen. It determines whether the content is displayed in a portrait orientation, meaning vertically, or landscape orientation, meaning horizontally. To wrap this exam topic up, we will discuss the three common configuration options for multiple displays. The duplicate option mirrors the same content on all connected displays. This is ideal for presentations or sharing information. The extend option allows a user to drag and arrange windows, applications, and content across multiple screens. This gives a user the flexibility to customize the arrangement, resolution, and orientation of each screen according to their individual needs. There is also the option to display content on only one display at a time. This allows a user to view content on only the primary or PC display, or just the secondary display, even though two displays may be available. Exam Objective 2.2 Given a scenario, set up and install common peripheral devices to a laptop or PC. Installation Types Our first installation type for peripheral devices is Plug and Play. Plug and Play refers to an installation type that allows a peripheral device to be easily connected or installed without the need for complex configuration, setup processes, or software installation. It allows for seamless integration and immediate functionality reducing the need for an average user to be technically proficient. There is a downside though. With a plug-and-play installation, you will only have access to basic peripheral device features. The next installation type is a device driver. A device driver is a software program that facilitates communication between a computing device's operating system and a specific peripheral device. The device driver acts as a translator allowing the operating system to understand and utilize the features and functions of our peripheral device. Installations requiring a device driver to be installed results in a slower overall installation process and requires the installer to be technically proficient. The upside is that you will be able to access a device's complete range of features. To help compare a plug-and-play installation to a manual driver installation, I have selected the mouse peripheral type. And before you ask, no this is not a plug for the HP G160 gaming mouse. The graphic just fit the scenario and layout well. Okay, so let's start with the mouse on the left. It will have the ability to left click, right click, and scroll. These are features that can be found on most every mouse. So why would a peripheral device manufacturer or operating system developer want to make a user go through the process of locating? and installing a custom device driver to get this mouse to work. Why not have a stripped-down version of a driver already loaded and available in the operating system? Voila, that is plug-and-play in a nutshell. Now the mouse on the right has a bunch of custom features and additional programmable buttons. Well, we cannot expect the operating system to be prepared with every possible feature for every device on the market, so a more specialized device, like the mouse on the right, will come with a device-specific driver that you would need to manually install on the operating system in order to unlock the bonus features. Without the custom device driver, you could still use the mouse, but only those most basic features of left-click, right-click, and scroll. The last installation type we will cover is IP-based installation. The IP stands for Internet Protocol, so IP-based installations take place across an Internet network connection. This is perfect for setting up and configuring devices remotely. For the example on the screen, I have selected a wireless router. With this type of installation, the device is accessed using a web browser. Once connected, you will be presented with a web-based interface. Here you can interact with and configure the device in the same manner you interact with any website on the internet. Exam Objective 2.3 Explain the purpose of common internal computing components. Motherboard A motherboard is the main circuit board in a computing device that connects and allows communication 
between all the other computing components. Another way of saying that is to refer to the motherboard as the backbone that ties a computer's components together. Without it, none of the computer's components could interact. It sits at the heart of the system and all other components must align with it in terms of compatibility. Though not as common, you may hear a motherboard described as a system board. The motherboard will have built-in functions, like basic graphics support, audio support, and network adapters. It will also offer a range of sockets, slots, and ports to connect all the other components that are needed to make a fully functioning compute device. Exam Objective 2.3 Explain the purpose of common internal computing components. BIOS The topic of this video is BIOS, but before we can understand BIOS, we need the definition of firmware. Firmware refers to a type of software program or set of instructions programmed into electronic devices and provides the most basic control of a hardware component. Unlike general-purpose software applications that can be installed and uninstalled, firmware is designed to be more permanent and is essential for the basic functioning of the device. Firmware is responsible for managing and controlling various hardware functionalities, such as booting up the device and controlling input and output operations. Overall, firmware plays a crucial role in the operation and functionality of electronic devices, ranging from simple devices like computer peripherals to complex motherboards. In the case of motherboards, the firmware is typically called the BIOS. BIOS is short for Basic Input-Output System and is firmware that is stored on a computer's motherboard. It provides the fundamental instructions and settings necessary for the computer to start up, initialize hardware components, and establish communication between the hardware and the operating system. Without it, your computer's operating system would never get off the ground or launch. While BIOS was the traditional firmware used in older systems, let's bring you up to date. On modern motherboards, UEFI, which is short for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, has become the standard. It is defined exactly like we defined BIOS, it is just newer and has more features. UEFI offers enhanced features and capabilities compared to the older BIOS including support for larger storage devices, faster boot times, and options for a more secure boot-up process. Additionally, when making configuration changes to the firmware, you will be provided with a graphical user interface, known as a GUI, instead of the text-based interface that was available with BIOS. Here we have a BIOS configuration screen. For now just notice the text-based interface. And here is the UEFI interface. Your interface may look a bit different. I just wanted to give you an idea of what to expect when accessing the BIOS or UEFI for configuration purposes. As for accessing the BIOS or UEFI on a computing device, you will need to start or restart your computer. Once powered on, your computer will only be able to access the BIOS or UEFI for a brief period of time. Once the BIOS or UEFI initializes and launches your operating system, the window of time will have closed. Look for a key prompt during the boot process. As your computer starts up, pay attention to the screen for any messages that indicate which key to press to access the BIOS or UEFI settings. Common keys include F1, F2, F10, Delete, or Escape keys. Press the indicated key before the operating system starts loading and you will be directed to the BIOS or UEFI Configuration Interface. Exam Objective 2.3 Explain the purpose of common internal computing components. RAM RAM, or Random Access Memory, is a form of computer memory that stores working data or programs currently in use by a computer. RAM is also the type of memory used for the system memory of most computing devices. In case you forgot by now, I introduced you to the topic of system memory back in exam objective 1.3, and to avoid confusion, just think of RAM and system memory as interchangeable. At least for this video. Anyways, once a software program is started, its instructions are loaded into the system memory and remain there until no longer needed by the computing device, or until the computing device is powered off. System memory is different from long-term storage devices such as hard drives because it provides much faster access to data. When the processor needs to receive or output data, it can interact directly with the system memory, which allows for faster execution of instructions by the processor. 
The amount of RAM in a computer is an important factor in determining its performance. More RAM allows the computer to store and access larger amounts of data, which is particularly useful when running memory-intensive programs or when several applications are opened simultaneously. On the other hand, insufficient RAM can lead to slower performance, as the computer may not be able to store all the data it needs in system memory all at the same time. Exam Objective 2.3 Explain the purpose of common internal computing components. CPU The central processing unit, or CPU for short, is the primary component of a computer responsible for executing instructions and performing calculations. The CPU acts as the brain of the computer, carrying out essential tasks such as arithmetic operations, logical comparisons, and managing data movement between various hardware components. It interprets and executes instructions from computer programs, allowing the computer to perform tasks and run applications. It is also worth noting that the CPU generates more heat than any other computing component. Probably because it works so hard. Worse, if you work your CPU too hard, it may overheat, which can lead to unexpected reboots or shutdowns. Next we will discuss the difference between the 32-bit and 64-bit CPUs. These are two common types of CPUs that you are likely to find installed in a laptop, workstation, or a server. The difference between 32-bit and 64-bit CPUs lies in the way they handle data. 32-bit CPUs are appropriately named as they support instructions that are 32 bits in size. And since you are so smart, I am sure you have already deduced that 64-bit CPUs are designed to handle 64-bit instructions. This has a trickle-down effect. First up is the operating system. A 32-bit processor is compatible with a 32-bit operating system, while a 64-bit processor is compatible with both 64-bit and 32-bit operating systems. This trickles down a little further, with the same arrangement holding true for applications. A 32-bit operating system is capable of running a 32-bit application, while a 64-bit operating system is capable of running 64-bit applications and most 32-bit applications. Having fun? How about a few more interesting facts? Okay, don't beg, I'll keep going. So, when working with these two CPU architectures, you may see the terms x86 and x64. Though there is some history with these terms, you should at least know that x86 is referencing the 32-bit architecture, while the x64 is referencing the 64-bit architecture. I know x86 is confusing to use as a reference to 32-bit architectures and would have been a lot easier to remember if it was x32 but I don't make the rules. Alright, one last fact for 32-bit and 64-bit CPUs before I move on. A 32-bit CPU will limit the amount of RAM that can be recognized by a computing system to 4 GB. 64-bit systems also have a limit, but the number is super large and not a real concern. Now I will teach you about one last CPU type. The ARM processor. ARM stands for Advanced Risk Machine and is a family of CPUs based on the risk or reduced instruction set computing architecture. ARM processors are smaller in size, generate less heat, and consume less power than processors found in laptops, workstations, and servers, making ARM processors a great candidate for mobile phones and tablets. The downside is they are limited in processing power. Exam Objective 2.3 Explain the purpose of common internal computing components. Internal Storage Internal storage refers to the storage drives within a computing device that are designed to store digital data. Internal storage drives exist to provide long-term storage to contrast the temporary or short-term storage offered by RAM. Internal storage serves as the primary storage medium used by the computing device making it the preferred location to store the device's operating system and software applications. Two common types of internal storage drives are the hard disk drive and the solid state drive. These drive types will be covered in more detail with exam objective 2.5. Along with optical drives, flash drives, network storage, and cloud storage. Exam Objective 2.3 Explain the purpose of common internal computing components. GPU A GPU, or a graphics processing unit, is a specialized processor designed to rapidly process and render graphics, images, and videos. 
A GPU will have the primary function of producing visual output to a monitor or other display device. So obviously they are great for gaming PCs. GPUs can be both internal or external. Internal GPUs are integrated directly into the computer's motherboard or as a partition portion of a CPU. External GPUs are separate graphics processing units that can be connected to a computer system externally. They are typically housed in an external enclosure and connect to the computer via high-speed interfaces such as Thunderbolt or USB-C. If a simple GPU is not enough, you can step up your game with a graphics card. Now let me warn you. The terms GPU and graphics card are often used interchangeably by those who are not lucky enough to be taking my course. But I will make sure you know better. A GPU and a graphics card actually refer to different aspects of a computing system. To demonstrate, let me strip off the cooling unit and the cover on the graphics card behind me. That's better. Okay, here is the GPU. It is just a part of the graphics card and only handles the processing. A graphics card is actually much more. A graphics card has its own circuit board, dedicated memory, the GPU of course, and interface ports. One last fact, just like a CPU, a GPU generates a lot of heat too. Let a GPU overheat, and just like a CPU, it can lead to unexpected reboots or shutdowns. Exam Objective 2.3 Explain the purpose of common internal computing components. Cooling Heat is a natural byproduct of electronic operations. As such, efficient cooling methods are needed to prevent damage and maintain safe operating temperatures. Within a computing device, you are likely to find one or more of the following three cooling methods in use. First up we have a heatsink. A heatsink is a metal structure that absorbs and disperses heat generated by electronic components, such as CPUs or GPUs. It helps prevent overheating by providing a larger surface area for heat dissipation into the surrounding air through the process of convection. Heatsinks are a passive cooling device capable of minimal heat dispersion, but they can be combined with cooling fans in order to increase their efficiency. Oftentimes computing devices output too much heat for a passive heatsink to handle, so a more common cooling method is to utilize fans. Fans are considered active cooling and improve heat dissipation by increasing the airflow across computing components. The general logic is more fans will equal more cooling. But there will be a limit. If fans still come up short and things are getting hotter, there is one more option. You can use liquid cooling. Liquid cooling offers superior cooling but comes with a higher price tag. This type of cooling would be best suited for a high-end gaming PC. In a PC, liquid cooling involves actively circulating a liquid, typically water or a coolant, through a closed-loop system. This method provides the best cooling because liquids are more efficient than air convection at dispersing heat. In summation, heat sinks are good, fans are better, and liquid is best, unless cost is an issue. Exam Objective 2.3 Explain the purpose of common internal computing components. NIC A NIC, or Network Interface Card, is a computer hardware component that allows a computer to connect to a network or other computing device, and acts as a communication link enabling the transfer of data. The primary function of a NIC is to convert the digital data generated by the computer into electrical signals that can be transmitted as an output. Also, they need to be able to receive data by converting electrical signals back into digital data as an input. NICs can come in many different forms. When classifying NICs, the first thing we can consider is whether they are wired or wireless. Wired NICs use physical cables, such as Ethernet cables, to establish a network connection. They generally offer faster and more reliable data throughput rates. Wireless NICs, on the other hand, utilize wireless technologies, such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, or even cellular to connect to a network without the need for physical cables. You can also classify NICs into two more groups. They can be integrated into the motherboard of a computer. We refer to these as onboard NICs, or they can be added as a separate expansion card or add-on card. An integrated NIC is built directly into the motherboard of the computer. It is already present and does not require any additional installation. 
This may seem like a benefit, but it does pose some restrictions as we lose the ability to upgrade in the future. Add-on NICs however, can be easily replaced or upgraded. If you want to change or upgrade your network connection, you can simply remove the existing add-on NIC and install a new one. Exam Objective 2.4 Compare and Contrast Common Internet Service Types An internet service provider, or ISP, is a company or organization that provides individuals, businesses, and other entities with access to the internet. ISPs are responsible for connecting customers to the internet through various technologies. Wired technologies include fiber optics, cable, and DSL. Wireless technologies include satellite and cellular. They typically offer a range of subscription plans that vary in terms of throughput speeds and pricing to meet the needs of different users. Another consideration is location. Not all connection types are available in all areas. Now that we know what an ISP is, let's discuss each of the available connection types, one at a time. Fiber optic is a type of wired internet connection that utilizes fiber optic cables to transmit data. It is considered one of the fastest and most reliable forms of internet connectivity available today. Fiber optic cables are made of thin strands of glass or plastic, known as optical fibers. These fibers are designed to transmit data using pulses of light. Fiber optic internet connections can be relatively more expensive compared to some other types of internet connections and are commonly deployed by ISPs in urban areas. Cable internet is a type of wired internet connection that utilizes the same coaxial cables used for cable television transmission to deliver high-speed internet access to homes and businesses. It provides sufficient speeds for most homes and small businesses, but falls short of the speeds possible with fiber optic connections. As a plus, cable internet is usually cheaper than fiber optic connections and has a larger coverage area. DSL, or Digital Subscriber Line, is a type of wired internet connection that uses existing copper telephone lines to transmit data. It is a popular alternative to cable and fiber optic connections in areas where these options may not be available. To establish a DSL connection, a DSL modem is required. The modem connects to the telephone line and translates the digital data from the user's devices into signals that can be transmitted over the copper telephone lines. DSL is relatively slow compared to fiber optic and cable connections, but DSL tends to be more cost-efficient. And since it uses the existing telephone network, coverage is pretty widespread. Satellite internet is a type of wireless internet connection that uses communication satellites and satellite antennas to provide internet access to users. It is a viable option for areas where traditional wired connections like fiber optic, cable, or DSL are not available or practical usually due to a lack of existing infrastructure. While satellite may be your only option in a remote location, it is probably going to be expensive and slow. This connection type is expensive because a satellite internet service provider operates a network of communication satellites in geostationary orbit around the Earth. And this connection type is slow because these satellites are positioned approximately 35,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. It takes a fair amount of time for a radio signal to travel 35,000 kilometers to the satellite and then back down again. And if you have bad weather like a rainstorm interfering with your radio signals, just forget it. Cellular Internet, also known as mobile internet, is a type of wireless internet access that utilizes cellular networks to provide connectivity to devices such as smartphones, tablets, and computers. It enables users to access the internet while on the go or traveling, without relying on fixed wired connections. Each device will have an antenna that allows it to connect to a cellular network infrastructure. This infrastructure consists of a system of interconnected base stations or cell towers that are strategically placed to provide coverage over a specific geographic area. Also, when I lost my power the other day, I noticed an additional benefit to a cellular internet connection. I could still surf the web in the dark, as my phone was battery-powered. And to be clear, I said surf the web in the dark, not surf the dark web. Exam Objective 2.5 Compare and Contrast Storage Types Volatile versus Non-Volatile Storage volatility refers to the degree to which stored data will remain accessible over a given period of time. In general, storage volatility can be categorized into two main types, volatile storage and non-volatile storage. 
Volatile storage refers to a type of storage that requires a continuous power supply to retain data. Random access memory RAM, is the most common example of volatile storage. When the power is cut off or the system is turned off, the data stored in volatile storage is lost. This is your temporary storage option. Non-volatile storage, on the other hand, refers to a type of storage that retains data even when power is lost or the system is turned off. Examples of non-volatile storage include hard disk drives, solid-state drives, optical disks, and flash drives. This is your more permanent storage option. Exam Objective 2.5 Compare and Contrast Storage Types In this video, I will be covering the various storage types used to store digital data. There are several types of computer storage, each with its own characteristics, including speed, capacity, volatility, and cost. To align with the CompTIA ITF Plus Exam Objective 2.5, I will break these into three specific storage types. These categories will be local device storage, local network storage, and cloud storage. Now let's learn more about each of these categories. Local device storage encompasses hardware components used to store data on a computer device locally, as opposed to remotely or on another device. The types of local device storage we will cover for the CompTIA ITF Plus exam include RAM, hard disk drives, solid state drives, optical drives, and flash drives. Next up, we have local network storage. Local network storage refers to the various types of storage systems that are accessible over a local area network connection, allowing multiple devices to share and access stored data. The types of local network storage we will cover for the CompTIA ITF Plus exam include file servers and network attached storage. The last category of storage types we will discuss is cloud storage. Cloud storage refers to the practice of storing and managing data on remote servers accessed over the internet. It involves using the infrastructure of a cloud service provider, which maintains large-scale data centers to store and protect the data of individuals and organizations. Some of the largest cloud service providers are Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform. In the following videos, we will further discuss each storage type with greater detail with the exception of RAM as it was covered in Exam Objective 2.3. Exam Objective 2.5, Compare and Contrast Storage Types Hard Disk Drive A hard disk drive, or HDD, is a type of local device storage where digital data is stored magnetically on a spinning disk. HDDs are known for their large storage capacities and relatively lower cost compared to other storage technologies. They are widely used in desktop computers, laptops, and servers. However, HDDs are mechanical devices and are susceptible to wear and tear over time. They can also be slower in terms of data access and retrieval compared to solid-state drives. The basic structure of an HDD consists of one or more magnetic disks or platters that rotate at high speeds. Each platter has a magnetic coating that stores the data. The platters are stacked vertically on a spindle, and the entire assembly is enclosed in a protective casing. To read or write data, an HDD uses a read-slash-write head that hovers just above the surface of the rotating platters. The read-slash-write head moves rapidly across the platter's surface to access the desired data. When reading data, the head detects the magnetic changes on the platter's surface and converts them into electrical signals that can be processed by the computer. When writing data, the head applies a magnetic field to the platter to encode the information. It might go without saying, but keep these devices away from strong magnets, as they could seriously damage an HDD drive. Exam Objective 2.5 Compare and Contrast Storage Types Solid State Drive A solid state drive, or SSD, is a type of local device storage where digital data is stored on non volatile flash memory chips. SSDs have many benefits when compared to HDDs. SSDs are faster, that means faster at accessing and storing data, including personal files, to software applications, to operating system boot files. They are also more resistant to physical shocks, vibrations, and extreme temperatures due to their lack of mechanical components. Additionally, with no moving parts, SSDs can operate silently. 
While SSDs offer many advantages over traditional HDDs, they are generally more expensive per unit of storage. However, the cost of SSDs has been decreasing over time, making them more affordable and popular for both personal and professional use. The main component of an SSD is NAND flash memory, which is a type of non-volatile memory that can retain data for long periods without the need for power. Access to the NAND flash memory is provided by the SSD controller, which acts as the interface between the computer and the flash memory. The controller manages data read and write operations. The last piece of the puzzle is the cache. To enhance performance, SSDs often incorporate a cache, or high-speed buffer that stores frequently accessed data for quicker retrieval. Course. Exam Objective 2.5 Compare and Contrast Storage Types Optical Drive An optical drive is a type of local device storage where digital data is stored optically on a spinning disk. Optical drives are classified based on the type of optical disks they can read and write to. The three main types of optical disks are CDs or compact disks, DVDs or digital versatile disks, and Blu-ray disks. As for how an optical drive works, it consists of a tray or slot where you insert the disk. When you insert a disk, the drive uses a laser beam to read the data stored on the disk's surface. The laser scans the disk, reflecting off its surface, and the drive interprets the reflected signals as digital data, such as audio, video, or computer files. Similarly, when writing data to a disk, the optical drive uses a laser to etch or burn information onto the disk's surface. This process creates pits and lands on the disk that represent the data being written. Once the data is written, it can be read by any compatible optical drive. Another topic worth discussing with regard to optical disks is their storage limits. According to the CompTIA official study guide, the maximum storage limit for a CD is 700 megabytes. That is roughly 74 minutes of uncompressed stereo digital audio. The maximum storage limit for a DVD is approximately 17 gigabytes. And the maximum storage limit for a Blu-ray disc is 128 gigabytes. Exam Objective 2.5 Compare and Contrast Storage Types Flash Drive A flash drive is a type of portable storage device where digital data is stored on non-volatile flash memory chips. This definition may look similar to the definition of an SSD drive. Well it should. Flash drives and SSDs use the same flash memory chips to store data. The difference is that flash drives are small and compact, making them portable. A flash drive may also be called a thumb drive or a USB flash drive if it has a USB connector. Just like an SSD, flash drives use flash memory, a type of non-volatile memory that retains data even when power is removed. This allows you to store files on the drive and access them later without the need for a continuous power source. Flash drives have a connector or interface on one end, which plugs into a computer, laptop, or other compatible device. The interface provides both data transfer and power to the flash drive, eliminating the need for additional cables or power adapters. Once connected to a computer, the flash drive appears as a removable storage device in the operating system. From there, you can simply drag and drop files or folders onto the drive to store them. Similarly, you can copy files from the flash drive to your computer for accessing or editing. Yes, memory cards can also be considered a form of flash drive. It too uses flash memory technology to store and transfer data. However, there are some differences in terms of form factor and usage. Memory cards are typically smaller and thinner than traditional USB flash drives. They are designed to be inserted into specific memory card slots on devices such as cameras, smartphones, tablets, and other computing devices. Common types of memory cards include secure digital or SD cards, mini SD cards, micro SD cards, compact flash cards, and XD picture cards. Exam Objective 2.5 Compare and Contrast Storage Types Local Network Storage In this video, we will cover two options for local network storage, starting with a file server. A file server is a type of local network storage in which a general computing device provides centralized storage, 
and file sharing capabilities to multiple users on a network. When a computer is part of a network, any internal or external local drives can be shared with other computers. When a computer shares its directly attached storage, the computer is acting as a file server. To simplify things, a file server is a general computer or server that has been configured with the purpose of sharing and storing files with other computing devices on a local network. While a server is a general computing device that can be purposed for many different functions, network attached storage devices or NAS devices are a dedicated device with a specific function. NAS devices are primarily focused on file storage and sharing. While they may offer additional features such as media streaming, their primary function is to provide reliable and efficient file storage capabilities. NAS devices are designed to be user-friendly and easy to set up. They often come with a web-based interface that allows users to configure settings, manage file shares, and set access permissions without requiring deep technical knowledge. That is why they are commonly used in home networks, small businesses, and environments where a simple file sharing solution is preferred. Exam Objective 2.5 Compare and Contrast Storage Types Cloud Storage The last storage category we will discuss is cloud storage. Cloud storage refers to the practice of storing and managing data on remote servers accessed over the internet. It involves using the infrastructure of a cloud service provider. In an earlier video, we discussed some of the largest cloud service providers, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform. Now let's narrow it down and talk specifically about cloud storage services. A cloud storage service provides a cloud-based file storage and synchronization service developed to allow users to store, access, and share files and folders across various devices, such as computers, smartphones, and tablets. Take a peek at the icons behind me. Recognize any? These four services are some of the largest cloud storage services on the market. From left to right, we have Microsoft OneDrive, Google Drive, Dropbox, and iCloud. Exam Objective 2.5 Compare and Contrast Storage Types Read and Write It is time to break away from the exam objectives for a moment and do a bit more bonus teaching in order to discuss read and write. Data read and write operations are a foundational topic with various applications, including software development, database management, data analysis, and file storage. And I feel this is the perfect time to talk about read and write as we have just finished working with storage drives. Okay, so what is a read? A read involves retrieving information from a storage device and bringing it into the computer's system memory for processing. Some synonyms we have used for read have been access and retrieve. A read would also be considered a drive output operation. Now that we have defined read, write is mostly the opposite. A write involves storing or updating information on a storage device, allowing you to modify existing data or add new data. A write would also be considered a drive input operation. With read and write defined, we can now move on to some performance metrics that help us to evaluate a storage drive. I will first cover transfer rates. A transfer rate, also known as data rate is very similar to throughput but instead represents the speed at which data can be read from or written to a storage drive, as opposed to the speed at which data moves between locations. Also, transfer rates are usually measured in bytes per second, with a uppercase B, bytes, as opposed to throughput being measured in bits per second, with a lowercase B, bits. Okay, to summarize transfer rates. Read speed is how fast a drive can retrieve information when requested. Write speed is how fast a drive can record or store incoming data. Looking at the image behind me, 3.1 megabytes per second read speed means data is currently being retrieved from this drive at a rate of 3.1 megabytes of data every second. Any thoughts on how long it is going to take if the file being retrieved is 31 megabytes in total? That's right. It will take approximately 10 seconds. In addition to transfer rates, we can measure a storage drive's performance based on IOPS. IOPS stands for Input-Output Operations Per Second, 
AND IS A PERFORMANCE METRIC THAT MEASURES THE NUMBER OF READ AND WRITE OPERATIONS A STORAGE DEVICE CAN HANDLE IN ONE SECOND. CALCULATING IOPS INVOLVES TWO PARTS, THE AVERAGE SIZE OF EACH OPERATION AND THE STORAGE DRIVE'S TRANSFER RATE. THE AVERAGE OPERATION SIZE REFERS TO THE AMOUNT OF DATA READ FROM OR WRITTEN TO THE STORAGE DEVICE IN A SINGLE OPERATION, AND IS TYPICALLY MEASURED IN BYTES. The transfer rate represents the amount of data that can be read from or written to the storage device per second. Now to calculate IOPS, take the transfer rate and divide it by the average operation size. While you may not see this information right away in your IT journey, it will prove useful in time. Exam Objective 2.6 Compare and contrast common computing devices and their purposes. There are many different types of computing devices. In this video, I will present some information about some of the more common computing devices, starting with mobile phones. A mobile phone is a portable device designed for wireless communication over a cellular network. Sounds like such a simple definition considering what a mobile phone can do. It enables users to make and receive phone calls, send and receive text messages, access the internet, and use various applications. No wonder people now refer to a mobile phone as a smartphone. A mobile phone works by utilizing a combination of hardware and software components including an internal antenna to receive and transmit cellular network signals. They also utilize ARM processors due to space limitations. Next we have tablets. A tablet can be defined the same as a mobile phone or smartphone. Just like a smartphone, tablets have internal antennas allowing them to connect to a cellular network. They utilize ARM processors and provide similar functionality. The main difference is the screen size. While a smartphone screen typically measures 4.5 to 5.7 inches, a tablet screen will measure 7 to 10 inches in size. Looks like our devices keep getting bigger. Next up on the size scale, we have laptops. A laptop is a computing device that integrates the display, system components, and multiple peripheral devices within a single portable case. They have an internal battery power source, but can also utilize external power sources as well. Some of the built-in peripherals may include a keyboard, touchpad instead of a mouse, touchscreen, webcam, and or microphone. Up next is a workstation. A workstation is a type of computing device that is designed to be used in a fixed location. A workstation may be known to you by the name desktop PC or just desktop, mostly because we place these computing devices on or under a desk. Unlike a laptop, a workstation's peripheral devices will be external and attached using a variety of interfaces. Our next device is a server. And this is where things get tricky, so time to listen closely. A server in a logical sense is a computing device that provides a service to other computing devices. A perfect example of this was the centralized file server discussed in exam objective 2.5. There are also print servers, email servers, web servers, and so on. Then there is a server in a physical sense. And the physical definition of a server is what we are going to be focused on for now. Okay, with that clarification out of the way, a server is defined as a powerful computing device designed to support a number of users simultaneously. It will have the same internal components as a workstation, but the components will be more powerful, more reliable, and more expensive. Another note, since a server provides a service to many other computing devices, consideration must be taken when upgrading, updating, or patching a server as these actions will have an impact on the server's ability to provide its services. The last computing device I will cover is gaming consoles. A gaming console is a specialized computing device designed primarily for playing video games. Most of us are probably familiar with gaming consoles, especially the market leaders, Sony PlayStation, Nintendo Switch, and Microsoft Xbox. These devices are not just specialized computing devices, but also come with specialized operating systems, which may be referred to as an embedded operating system. Exam Objective 2.6 Compare and contrast common computing devices and their purposes. IoT We have covered the major types of computing devices in the previous video. But what about everything else that is embedded with processing and networking functionality? Well, we have a category for them too. 
They are classified as IoT devices, where IoT stands for Internet of Things. These well things are physical devices, objects, and sensors that are connected to the Internet and can collect, exchange, and transmit data. These devices, which can range from everyday household objects to industrial machinery, come with sensors, embedded operating systems, and network connectivity to enable communication and data sharing. This Internet of Things allows these devices to interact with each other, as well as with humans, to gather and analyze data, automate processes, and enable remote monitoring and control. IoT devices have been deployed in various ways. You can find IoT devices for home appliances, home automation, in modern cars, with IP cameras, streaming media devices, and medical devices, to name a few. IoT devices have transformed the functionality of home appliances, including refrigerators, ovens, microwaves, washers, and dryers, making our lives more convenient and efficient. With IoT technology, smart refrigerators can offer features such as tracking food items, their expiry dates, and even suggest recipes based on the available ingredients. Ovens and microwaves equipped with IoT capabilities allow remote control and monitoring through smartphone apps, enabling users to preheat, adjust cooking settings, and receive notifications when meals are ready. IoT-enabled washers and dryers offer remote control and scheduling options allowing users to start or pause cycles and receive alerts when clothes are ready for the next step. In addition to home appliances, IoT devices have paved the way for advanced home automation. IoT devices for home automation, including thermostats and security systems, revolutionize our living spaces. Smart thermostats offer remote temperature control and energy management, optimizing comfort and efficiency. IoT-based security systems integrate cameras, sensors, and locks for remote monitoring and real-time alerts. These devices enable personalized schedules for lighting, entertainment, and centralized control through mobile apps, enhancing convenience, energy savings, and home security. The use of IoT devices in modern cars has greatly enhanced the driving experience and safety features. Connected car technologies allow for real-time monitoring, analysis, and communication between vehicles and the surrounding environment. IoT-enabled features include GPS navigation systems with live traffic updates, vehicle diagnostics, maintenance alerts, or my personal favorite, remote lock, unlock, and start capabilities, all from an application on my smartphone. The integration of IoT with IP cameras has revolutionized surveillance and monitoring systems. IoT-enabled IP cameras offer advanced features and functionalities for enhanced security and remote monitoring. These cameras can connect to the internet, allowing users to access live video feeds and recordings from anywhere through mobile apps or web browsers. With the integration of IoT technology, streaming media devices, such as smart TVs, streaming sticks, and set-top boxes have become more than just devices for content consumption. They now offer seamless connectivity, personalized experiences, and a wealth of innovative features. By connecting to the internet, these devices provide access to a vast array of online streaming platforms, allowing users to enjoy their favorite movies, TV shows, and music with ease. One last use for IoT devices includes the healthcare industry. IoT-enabled medical devices, such as wearable health trackers, smart implants, and remote patient monitoring systems, enable continuous monitoring of vital signs, medication adherence, and overall patient well-being. These devices can collect real-time data and transmit it securely to healthcare providers, facilitating remote patient monitoring and timely intervention. Wow, now that is a lot to take in. IoT devices are really everywhere. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts Basics of Network Communication It is now time to welcome you to the world of network communication. In this video, we will embark on a journey to demystify the basics of computer networking and explain their significance in modern computing. So let's dive in by defining the word, network. A network is two or more computing devices linked together by some form of transmission medium that enables them to share information. You can also imagine a network as a digital web or virtual highway connecting computers, smartphones, servers, and more. 
So why are networks so important in modern computing? Well, they form the backbone of our interconnected world. Networks enable us to stay connected with friends and family across the globe, access information on the internet, stream movies, play online games, and collaborate with colleagues remotely. They facilitate the exchange of data, providing a platform for businesses, education, entertainment, and so much more. Now, let's talk about protocols. In the world of computer networking, a protocol refers to a set of rules and standards that govern the exchange of information between devices or systems. It defines how data is transmitted, received, interpreted, and acted upon during communication. Just as we follow social norms to interact with others effectively, devices on a network adhere to specific protocols to ensure seamless communication. Think of protocols as a common language that devices use to understand and interpret each other's messages. Protocols also define how devices identify one another and how errors are handled. They provide a structured framework that allows devices to communicate in a reliable and standardized manner. Without protocols, communication across networks would be chaotic and prone to errors. Throughout Exam Objective 2.7, we will cover some of the most common networking protocols. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts LAN and WAN Networks of different sizes can be categorized in different ways based on their coverage and scale. In this video, we will cover the most common network types, starting with LAN. LAN is short for Local Area Network and refers to a wired network that covers a small geographical area, typically within a building, small office, or home. In a LAN, devices such as computers, laptops, printers, and servers interconnect, allowing for the sharing of resources, data, and services within the network. In addition to LAN networks, we have WLAN networks. WLAN stands for Wireless Local Area Network. A WLAN is similar to a LAN, but the key difference is the use of wireless technology for connectivity. Instead of relying on physical cables, WLANs use wireless signals, such as Wi-Fi, to connect devices within a localized area. A WLAN may also be connected to a LAN. In this way a WLAN can extend a LAN by providing a method for wireless devices to connect to and share resources with the wired LAN network. Now we can move on to WANs, or Wide Area Networks. WANs cover a much larger area than LANs or WLANs. A WAN is a network that spans a large geographical area, typically connecting multiple LANs or remote locations. WANs are used to connect networks across cities, countries, or even continents. They enable long-distance communications and data exchanges between geographically dispersed sites. The Internet itself can be considered a massive WAN, connecting networks worldwide. And just like LAN has a wireless equivalent, so does WAN. The WAN wireless equivalent is a WAN. WAN stands for Wireless Wide Area Network. It refers to a wireless network that provides coverage over a large geographical area, typically larger than what a WLAN can cover. WANs most commonly use cellular networks, such as 3G, 4G, or 5G, to provide wireless connectivity to devices across wide-ranging areas. A WAN may also extend a WAN by providing a method for wireless devices to connect to a WAN network. This is accomplished when a WAN cell tower has a wired connection to a WAN. Now that we understand what a LAN and WAN are, how do they work together? LANs and WANs are interconnected and complementary components of an overall network infrastructure. LANs serve as the foundation for local communication and resource sharing within a limited area, providing fast and efficient connectivity between devices in close proximity. They enable seamless collaboration, file sharing, and access to shared resources within a building, small office or home. While a WAN extends the reach of LANs by connecting geographically dispersed networks. Together, LANs and WANs create a comprehensive network architecture that enables seamless and scalable communication across both local and global distances. And there you have it. An introduction to LANs, WLANs, WANs, and WANs the fundamental network types in computer networking. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts 
Basics of Packet Transmission Network packets are like small envelopes that carry chunks of data across a computer network. When you send or receive information over a LAN or WAN network, it's divided into smaller pieces called packets. These packets contain both the data you're sending and additional information needed to ensure proper delivery. This is the same concept as a company that wants to send a large shipment of goods to another location. Instead of sending the entire shipment in one massive box, they will divide it into smaller boxes, each containing a portion of the goods. Similarly, data is divided into packets, with each packet containing a portion of the total information to be sent. Just as shipping smaller boxes is easier to handle and transport, breaking information into small packets allows for more efficient data transmissions. Now with our theoretical shipment broken down into many smaller boxes, each box will require a label. The label should include additional information to help with successful delivery. Our data packets will do the same. In addition to the data being sent, each data packet will include information such as addressing, sequencing, error checking, and much more. What can I say, computers like to be precise. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts Networking Devices In networking, we have many network devices that help us to connect our different computing devices together. Before learning about the different networking devices, you will need to learn a couple definitions to expand your vocabulary. In Exam Objective 2.6, you learned about all the common computing devices, to include mobile phones or smartphones, tablets, laptops, workstations, servers, and IoT devices. Yes, I left out gaming consoles as they don't come up very often in networking conversations. And allow me to add in printers and voice over IP or digital phones as they do come up a lot. Now all of these computing devices have a specific classification with regard to networking. They are called end devices. A definition of end device would then be any device that directly connects to a network and is used by individuals or organizations to access or provide information, services, or resources. So if a device is not classified as an end device, it is probably a network device. A network device is any component that facilitates the communication and transfer of data within a computer network. These devices play a crucial role in establishing and maintaining network connectivity, enabling the transmission of information between different end devices, networks, or systems. The network devices we will cover for the CompTIA ITF Plus exam are modem, switch, access point, router, and firewall. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts Modem Hold on one second while I try to connect. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, time to get back to work. There are many different types of modems depending on the transmission medium and service connection type in use, so I will stick to the general functions of a modem and use telephone lines and the public switch telephone network as the transmission medium and service connection type for my example later in this video. Okay, so what is a modem? A modem is a network device that connects a computer or LAN using digital signals to an analog-based WAN network. It serves as a bridge between the digital signals used by computers and the analog signals used by communication lines, such as telephone lines or cable lines. Consider a modem to be the gateway between your computer and the vast world of the internet. It's the first point of contact that enables your computer to access online resources and services. Using the image behind me, I will walk you through the process of sending data from one computing device to another computing device across an internet service provider's network. In this case, a telephone network, such as dial-up or DSL. On the far left, we have a workstation that will be sending a data packet. The network interface card on the workstation will send out a digital signal comprised of binary digits. Here the digital signal will be received by the modem on the left and the modem will perform a process called signal modulation. Modulation is the process of taking an incoming signal, in this case a digital signal, and modifying the signal into another form to be transmitted, in this case an analog signal. The analog signal will then travel across an internet service provider's network until the destination network is reached. 
Here, another modem will perform a process called demodulation. Demodulation is the reversal of the modulation process. Here, the incoming signal, which is currently an analog signal, will be converted back to a digital signal. Now the network interface of the workstation on the far right can receive the digital signal as an input and process the newly received data packet. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts Switch At the heart of any modern local area network you are likely to find a network switch, or maybe multiple switches if the network is large and complex. A switch is a network device that connects multiple devices within a local area network. It acts as a central hub, allowing devices like computers, printers, servers, or other end devices to communicate with each other by forwarding data packets on the same LAN. Think of a network switch as a traffic controller in a network. It receives data packets from one device and intelligently forwards them to the intended recipient, ensuring efficient and direct communication between devices within the network. Network switches commonly use Ethernet cables or CAT cables to connect end devices to the ports on the network switch and communicate using the Ethernet protocol. When a device wants to send data to another device within the LAN network, it encapsulates the data into a data packet. This data packet will contain the destination address, the sender's source address, and the actual data or payload being transmitted. This encapsulated data packet is then given the name Ethernet frame. The switch then receives the data packet and examines the destination address. It then uses this information to determine the best path or port to forward the packet to the intended device. This direct forwarding allows for fast and efficient communication between devices. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts Access Point In a traditional wired LAN, devices are physically connected using cables and network switches, but in a wireless LAN, we eliminate the need for these cables. This is where wireless access points come into play. A wireless access point, also known as a WAP, is a network device that allows wireless communication between devices in a network. Think of a network access point as a central hub that enables wireless connectivity. It acts as a bridge between devices and the network, creating a wireless connection for them to communicate with each other. But how does a wireless access point work with other wired networks? Well, it's quite simple. The wireless access point takes the data packets it receives from devices, such as smartphones, tablets, and laptops and transmits it wirelessly to the network. Similarly, it receives data from the network and sends it wirelessly to the devices connected to it. This two-way communication allows devices to access the network and share information with each other seamlessly. Now, you might be wondering how devices connect to a wireless access point. Well, it's as easy as connecting to a Wi-Fi network. When you turn on your device's Wi-Fi, it scans for available wireless networks, and when it detects a wireless access point, it prompts you to connect to it. Once connected, you can access the network's resources and communicate with other devices in the network, just like you would in a wired network. So if an access point sounds a lot like a switch, you are right. An access point is just a wireless version of a switch that provides local device connectivity. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts Router Before we delve into the specifics of a network router, let's review the concept of computer networking. Computer networks are like digital highways, connecting devices together to facilitate communication and resource sharing. And just as roads have intersections and signs to guide traffic, networks have switches and routers to direct data packets. A network router is a network device that directs data packets between different computer networks. Yes, this is similar to a switch, with the exception that a switch directs traffic within a LAN, and a router controls data packets entering or leaving the LAN. But how does a network router actually work? Well, when a device wants to send data to another device in a different network, it compiles a data packet. These data packets will contain a source address and a destination address. The data packet will then seek out the router. The router examines the packet's destination address, much like reading a street sign, and determines the most efficient path for the data to reach its intended destination. 
To sum up a router, a router is a gateway, sitting at the edge of a network, controlling inbound and outbound connectivity to other networks. These could be other directly attached LANs, or maybe a WAN connection to the internet. And these routers make decisions based on addressing information found within each and every data packet. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts Soho Network In this video, I have some more bonus material to cover. Specifically, the topic of a Soho network. Having just covered the topics of network switch, access point, and router, I figured now would be a great time to discuss how these devices fit into a smaller setting of a home or small business environment. The type of networking equipment used in a home or small business environment can be described as SOHO, where SOHO stands for small office, home office. This particular type of network will commonly utilize a multifunction network device referred to as a SOHO router. But don't let the name fool you. Though similar in some aspects, this is not like the enterprise-grade router we studied earlier in this exam objective. A SOHO router can perform routing functions, but that is not all it can do. So let's break down the main components that make up a SOHO router. First up, we have the network switch. You may recall that a network switch is a network device that connects multiple devices within a local area network. And yes, the SOHO router has a built-in network switch. It may not have as many ports as an enterprise switch, but it will still function the same. The SOHO router displayed here can only connect four computing devices together in an Ethernet LAN. The switch ports are the yellow RJ45 ports inside box number one. Next, we have the access point. As a refresher, the access point is a network device that allows wireless communications between devices in a network. And yes, the Soho router has a built-in access point too. It may not support as many wireless clients as an enterprise access point, but it will still function the same. The Soho router displayed here has an antenna inside box number 2 that can transmit and receive Wi-Fi signals. Lastly, let's talk about the router itself. The router is the gateway between your Soho network and the internet or ISP. That is where box number 3 comes in. This is your WAN connection. Pretty cool how a Soho router seamlessly integrates all these components into one compact device. If you are dealing with a limited number of computing devices in your network, a Soho router would be the perfect choice to provide network connectivity. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts Network Firewall Let's imagine our computer network as a fortress. Just like a fortress has protective barriers and guards, a computer network needs a way to safeguard against unwanted intrusions and threats. This is where network firewalls come into play. A network firewall is a network security device that acts as a barrier between a computer network and outside network traffic. It monitors and controls incoming and outgoing network traffic. So, how does a network firewall work? Well, it examines each data packet that tries to pass through it, inspecting its source address, destination address, and content. It compares this information against a set of predefined security rules and policies. If a data packet matches the allowed criteria, it's permitted to pass through and continue towards its destination. However, if a data packet violates any of the security rules, the firewall blocks it from entering or leaving the network. Predefined security rules and policies, in the context of network firewalls, are often implemented using a mechanism called access control lists, or ACLs. An ACL defines the specific criteria that determines whether network traffic will be allowed or denied by the firewall. Access control lists are essentially a set of rules that dictate what types of network traffic are permitted and what types should be blocked. As a data packet is received by a network firewall, the network firewall will compare the data packet against the security rules listed in its access control list. If the data packet does not match any of the allow rules in the access control list, the data packet will be denied. Then the next packet can be processed. The network firewall will again compare the data packet against the security rules listed in its access control list. If the data packet matches an allow rule in the access control list, the data packet will be permitted and forwarded on. 
Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts MAC Address I will begin this video with the definition of a MAC address, where MAC stands for Media Access Control. Simply put, a MAC address is a unique hardware identification address issued to a networking device at the time of manufacturing. It's like a digital fingerprint for that device within a network. Every device that can connect to a network, including both end devices and networking devices, has its own MAC address. This is also very similar to how automobiles have VIN numbers, or vehicle identification numbers, that are unique to every vehicle manufactured. Now, you may be wondering, how are MAC addresses represented? Well, MAC addresses use the hexadecimal numbering system. Unlike our familiar decimal system with numbers from 0 to 9, Hexadecimal uses a base of 16 and includes numbers from 0 to 9 and letters from A to F. If you need a refresher on hexadecimal, this topic was covered in the videos for exam objective 1.1. Now let's take a closer look at the structure of a MAC address. A MAC address consists of 12 hexadecimal digits, which is equivalent to 48 binary bits. The first part of a MAC address is the OUI, which stands for organizationally unique identifier. This section comprises the first six hexadecimal digits of the MAC address. The OUI helps identify the manufacturer or vendor of the network interface card. The second part of a MAC address is the NIC or network interface controller. It follows the OUI and consists of the remaining six hexadecimal digits of the MAC address. The NIC part provides a unique identifier for the device itself within the manufacturer's range of MAC addresses. This portion of the MAC address distinguishes individual devices produced by the same manufacturer. It's important to note that MAC addresses are globally unique. This means that no two devices in the world should have the same MAC address. Manufacturers issue these addresses during the production process. This ensures that each device has its own unique identifier, even if they are made by the same company. This uniqueness is crucial for proper communication and data transmission within a network. Could you imagine if a mailman had to deliver a letter to a specific address, but there were two houses with the exact same address? Which one would get the letter? The same holds true for a data packet. If two devices were using the same MAC address, which network interface would receive the data packet from the network switch? The switch and I surely don't know. Now, you might be wondering, how are MAC addresses used? Well, MAC addresses play a vital role in the communication between devices on a local area network or LAN. When you send data from your device to another device within the same local area network, the MAC address is used to identify the intended recipient. It helps ensure that your message reaches the correct destination. How about seeing this in action? First, we need a data packet to be sent. Luckily. The workstation in the top left of our diagram has a data packet to send to another device in our local area network. Now the workstation needs to encapsulate the data to be sent into an Ethernet frame. The Ethernet frame will include the destination MAC address, or the MAC address of the device the workstation will be sending the data packet to. The Ethernet frame will also include the workstation's own MAC address, known as the source MAC address, and finally the data or payload that will be sent with this packet. Next, the data packet will then be sent out of the workstation's network interface card to the network switch. The switch will determine which network path is to be used to reach the device matching our destination MAC address in the Ethernet frame. And if everything goes right, our data packet will finally be delivered. All thanks to the help of MAC addresses. CompTIA ITF plus Complete Training Course Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts IP address. By the end of this video, you will have a basic understanding of what an IP address is and how it functions in the world of networking. So let's get to it. First up is to define what an IP address is. IP stands for Internet Protocol, and an IP address is a unique numerical identifier assigned to every device connected to a network. Within this definition, the keyword is assigned. An IP address differs from a MAC address in this regard. Where a MAC address is hard-coded into a network interface card, an IP address is logically assigned, can be changed, and even reassigned as needed. Currently, there are two versions of IP addresses in use. IPv4 and IPv6. 
IPv4, which stands for Internet Protocol version 4, is the older and more widely adopted version. An IPv4 address identifies a device in an Internet Protocol version 4 or IPv4 network. It is worth noting that IPv4 addresses use a specific type of notation called dot .decimal notation. Dot .decimal notation is a way of displaying a big number in manageable chunks. In the case of an IPv4 address, each address is 32 binary digits long. This is a bit difficult to understand, so let's group this 32 binary digit address into different containers that are separated by dots. This will create four sets of eight binary digits, also known as octets. Next we will convert each octet from binary to their decimal value equivalents resulting in a dot decimal notation that is much easier to read. With this dot decimal notation, each octet can range from 0 to 255 providing us with over 4.2 billion numerical combinations. IPv6 addresses are considerably longer than an IPv4 address, at 128 binary digits long. IPv6 addresses also use a different addressing scheme. IPv6 addresses include eight groups of four hexadecimal digits, separated by colons. Each group of four hexadecimal digits can also be called a hextet. Next, let's explore how IP addresses are assigned to devices. There are two main methods, static and dynamic. A static IP address is manually assigned to a device and remains constant over time. This is often used for servers, printers, or other devices that need a persistent, unchanging address in order to be consistently located by other devices. On the other hand, dynamic IP addresses are automatically assigned by a service called DHCP, which stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. With dynamic addressing using DHCP, a device receives an IP address from a DHCP server when it connects to the network. This dynamic addressing using DHCP allows for efficient assignment and use of IP addresses. Additionally, dynamic IP addressing using DHCP simplifies the process of getting connected to a network for non-technical users. Instead of manually configuring IP addresses, DHCP automatically assigns an IP address to a device when it connects to the network. This eliminates the need for users to have prior knowledge of networking or IP addressing, making it more user-friendly and convenient. Non-technical users can simply connect their devices to the network and DHCP takes care of the rest. Now let's talk about private and public IPv4 addresses. Private IPv4 addresses are used within local networks, such as your home or office. They are not routable on the internet and are meant for internal communications such as between a workstation and a printer or for an internal corporate web server, known as an intranet. These addresses fall within specific reserved ranges. These private IP address ranges are displayed just above me. Any IPv4 addresses falling within these ranges will be considered a private IPv4 address and will be restricted to use within a LAN or private network. It will be a good idea to remember these ranges as they will show up again and again throughout your IT journey. Public IPv4 addresses behave a bit differently. They are assigned to devices that connect directly to the internet. These addresses are unique globally and allow devices to communicate with each other across the internet. Internet service providers, ISPs, assign public IP addresses to devices connected to their network. Now this is a video that might be worth watching a couple times. We covered the definition of an IP address, the different IP protocols version 4 and version 6, static and dynamic IP address assignment, and the difference between private and public IP addresses. Great job! Oh, and one last piece of knowledge, don't get an IP address and a MAC address confused. An IP address is a unique identifier for a device's network location, while a MAC address is a unique hardware identifier belonging to a network interface card. While an IP address facilitates communication between networks, a MAC address will enable communication within a local area network. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts DNS DNS stands for Domain Name System and it's like a phone book for the internet. DNS is a system used in computer networking to translate human-readable website names into their corresponding numerical IP addresses. Essentially, DNS enables us to access websites using memorable names instead of complex numerical IP addresses. So how does DNS translate a website name to its IP address? It starts when you type a website name, known as a URL, or Uniform Resource Locator, into your browser. The URL has multiple parts. 
Using the graphic behind me and starting at the left, there is the protocol, the subdomain, the domain name, and the top-level domain, and the file path. For example, in the URL, https colon forward slash forward slash www.example.com forward slash info forward slash about us html. The protocol is HTTPS, which is a protocol for secure web traffic. The subdomain is www, which stands for World Wide Web. The domain is example. The top-level domain is .com. And the file path is info forward slash about us to HTML. When you hit enter, your browser sends a request to a DNS resolver, which is a server that handles DNS queries or requests for information. The resolver then begins the process of looking up the IP address associated with the domain name you entered. When you hit enter, your browser sends a request to a DNS recursive server, which begins the process of looking up the IP address associated with the domain name you entered. The first stop is a root server. A root name server provides a referral to the appropriate top-level domain server. For our scenario, the .com TLD server. The DNS recursive server then reaches out to the TLD server, which then directs the DNS recursive server to the domain name server responsible for the specific domain. The domain name server will then return the IP address associated with the domain to the DNS recursive server. The DNS recursive server will complete the lookup process by providing the requested IP address back to your browser. Now that we know how the DNS lookup process works, Let's take another look at the URL and see how much you learned. Which part of the URL correlated to the location where the IP address was actually stored? That is right. The domain, example, was the portion of the URL that led us to the domain name server where the IP address information or record was stored. In addition to translating website names to IP addresses, DNS also plays a role in translating device names within a local area network. In a home or office network, devices such as workstations, laptops, printers, and other network-enabled devices are often assigned human-readable names for easy identification and communication. For example, a printer might be named Office Printer or a laptop might be named John's Laptop. When devices on the local network need to communicate with each other, they can use these friendly names instead of IP addresses. The local DNS server, often provided by the router or a network server, maintains a database of these device names and their corresponding IP addresses. This allows devices to communicate efficiently within the local area network, making it simpler for users to access and share resources without needing to remember complex IP addresses. Thank goodness we have DNS to make our lives easier. I would hate to have a bunch of sticky notes all over my desk just to be able to visit my favorite websites. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts HTTP and HTTPS Up to now, we have discussed networking protocols that support the addressing and forwarding of data packets to their intended destinations. With that behind us, we will move forward with application protocols. Application protocols deal with the data or payloads themselves. And I am going to start with a protocol most of us are already familiar with. HTTP HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol and is the foundation of data communication on the World Wide Web. HTTP enables web browsers and servers to exchange information, allowing you to access and view web pages and other resources on the internet. In simpler terms, think of it as a set of rules that allow web browsers and web servers to understand and exchange information with each other. For a moment, imagine you're using a web browser, like Chrome or Firefox, to access a website. When you type the website's address into the URL bar and hit enter, your browser sends an HTTP request to the web server hosting that site, asking for the web page's content. The server then processes the request and sends back an HTTP response containing the requested web page's data. This entire process happens seamlessly in the background, enabling you to see the web page on your screen. This all happens because of the HTTP protocol. Now you should know that HTTP is not a secure protocol. And if you need to access your bank account information or any other sensitive information, you will not want to use HTTP. So what should you use? The answer is HTTPS. 
HTTPS stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure and is a secure version of the standard HTTP protocol used for data communication on the World Wide Web. HTTPS incorporates an additional layer of security using encryption to protect the data being transmitted between a user's web browser and a web server. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts POP3, IMAP, and SMTP In this video, I will be discussing three essential email protocols, POP3, IMAP, and SMTP. If these acronyms sound like a foreign language to you, don't worry, I will break them down in simple terms. By the end of this video, you'll understand how these protocols work together to manage your emails effectively. Let's get started. In the world of computer networking, email protocols are like sets of rules that govern how emails are sent, received, and managed between email clients, like your email app, and email servers, where your emails are stored. So let's imagine your email client is like your mailbox, and the email server is the central post office. The protocols we'll discuss help manage the flow of emails between these two points, ensuring a smooth email experience. Our first email protocol is POP3, which stands for Post Office Protocol Version 3. POP3 is like the traditional way of receiving mail. When you use POP3, your email client connects to the email server and downloads new messages. The POP3 protocol then removes the messages from the server. It's like fetching your mail from the mailbox and taking it inside your home. Once downloaded, the emails reside on your device, and they're no longer stored on the server. While POP3 is useful for offline access to your emails, one limitation is that your emails are tied to a single device. If you access your emails from another device, you won't see the same messages. Now let's talk about IMAP. IMAP stands for Internet Message Access Protocol. IMAP is a modern, synchronized way of handling emails. When you use IMAP, your email client remains connected to the email server. Instead of downloading and removing the emails, IMAP keeps your emails stored on the server while syncing them with your email client. Or clients. If you haven't deduced this already, the main advantage of IMAP is that you can access your emails from multiple devices, like your workstation, laptop, or smartphone, and they'll always be in sync. Any changes you make on one device, like reading, replying, or deleting emails, are reflected on all your devices. Now you know two different protocols for receiving emails. Do we have a protocol to send emails to? We sure do. Last but not least, let's discuss SMTP, which stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. SMTP is the protocol that handles the sending of emails. When you compose an email and click Send, your email client uses SMTP to transfer that email to the email server for delivery. SMTP also ensures that your email is sent to the recipient's email server, which then stores it until the recipient checks their inbox. And there you have it, POP3, IMAP, and SMTP, the protocol trio that manages all your email communications. Exam Objective 2.7 Explain Basic Networking Concepts FTP, FTPS, and SFTP I hope you don't mind, but I have a few bonus protocols for you in this video. They are FTP, FTPS, and SFTP. These protocols are considered file transfer protocols and these protocols are essential for sharing documents, images, videos, and other files between users and servers. To kick things off, I will start with the FTP protocol. FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol. FTP is a standard network protocol used to transfer files from one computer to another over a network, such as the internet. FTP allows users to upload and download files between their local computer and a remote server. FTP is widely used, but it lacks security measures. So luckily, we have some secure file transfer protocols too. These secure file transfer options are FTPS, which stands for File Transfer Protocol Secure and SFTP, which stands for SSH File Transfer Protocol. Each of these protocols provides data encryption during transmission, ensuring your data remains private. So if you need to send files from one device to another, look to any of the FTP protocol variants. But if you want to move sensitive data electronically from one location to another, make sure that protocol acronym has an S in it to ensure security. 
Exam Objective 2.8 Given a scenario, install, configure and secure a basic wireless network. Wireless Networks 802.11, A, B, G, N, and AC. To talk about wireless networks, we need to first talk about Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, short for Wireless Fidelity, is a technology that allows computing devices to connect to and communicate with other computing devices wirelessly. It enables the transmission of data over short distances using radio waves, typically within a home, small office, or public space, by connecting to a wireless access point. Now that we have a definition for Wi-Fi, we can move on to wireless standards. There have been multiple standards since Wi-Fi came onto the scene in 1997, with each standard being developed by the IEEE. So I guess the next thing to do is to explain what IEEE is. IEEE is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. They're a professional association known for developing technical standards across various industries, including networking and telecommunications. Now we know who develops the standards for Wi-Fi. I guess we are getting warmer. But we don't have the complete picture yet. Out of all the standards compiled by the IEEE, the numerically labeled 802 set of standards are the standards that pertain to local area networks or LAN communications. From here we need to break open and look at a small subset of the 802 standards. This subset of standards that we will be focusing on for now is labeled 802.11. 802.11 is all about Wi-Fi how it works and what makes it tick. Or more technically speaking, 802.11 is an evolving family of specifications for wireless local area networks or WLANs. And for your CompTIA certification exam, we will focus on the following 802.11 specifications. 802.11a 802.11b 802.11g 802.11n and 802.11ac. In the next few videos, I will discuss different aspects of these 802.11 standards including the information in the table you see here. Eventually, I am hopeful you will not only commit the information in this table to memory, but will also understand all of its components. Exam Objective 2.8 Given a scenario, install, configure and secure a basic wireless network. Older versus Newer Standards The first Wi-Fi standard came about in 1997 with the introduction of the IEEE 802.11 standard. With Wi-Fi, we could now connect to the internet and communicate with each other without the need for physical cables. And over the past few decades, this has completely transformed the way we live and work. So let's briefly journey through the evolution of Wi-Fi as we explore the timeline of 802.11 standards, that have shaped the wireless connectivity we know today. After the most basic 802.11 standard was released in 1997, demand skyrocketed and newer more robust Wi-Fi standards were needed. So naturally, we got an upgrade. In 1999, the 802.11a standard was released. This Wi-Fi standard, though not the first, was responsible for solidifying Wi-Fi as the predominant communication standard for short-range wireless computer networking. Not even a year later, in the fall of 1999, we were given 802.11b. It then took four more years before 802.11g was released. 802.11n came next, with a 2009 release date. And 802.11ac is the last standard we will cover with the CompTIA ITF Plus exam, and this standard was released in 2013. Now there are newer standards currently out, like the 802.11ax standard, which is also referred to as Wi-Fi 6, but they are not part of our exam topics for this exam. And there you have it, the evolution of the 802.11 standards from oldest to newest. Exam Objective 2.8 Given a scenario, install, configure and secure a basic wireless network. Speed limitations. Wi-Fi communications, while providing convenient and wireless connectivity, do have inherent speed limitations. These limitations are mainly influenced by factors such as the Wi-Fi standard being used, the frequency band it operates on, the number of devices connected to the network, and the distance between the devices and the wireless access point.
each Wi-Fi standard, from 802.11a to 802.11ac, offers varying theoretical maximum speeds. So let's take a look at those threshold throughput speeds now. We begin with 802.11a. This standard clocked in with a maximum speed limitation of 54 megabits per second. 802.11b was a bit slower, offering speeds up to 11 megabits per second. 802.11g sped things back up again to 54 megabits per second, matching the speed of 802.11a. Now things really started to heat up with the release of 802.11n. With 802.11n maximum theoretical throughput speeds jumped to 600 megabits per second. And then 802.11ac just came in and blew the rest of the standards out of the water, with a theoretical maximum speed of 1.7 gigabits per second. Now there are newer standards currently out, like the 802.11ax standard, which offers throughput speeds well above those offered by the 802.11ac standard, but they are not part of our exam topics for this exam. Now you should have a firm grasp of the speed limitations of each Wi-Fi standard. Exam Objective 2.8 Given a scenario, install, configure and secure a basic wireless network. Wireless Frequency Bands Imagine Wi-Fi signals as invisible waves carrying data through the air. These waves have different frequencies, which determine how they behave and what tasks they excel at. A signal frequency is like how fast a wave moves up and down. Think of a bouncing ball and you counting how many times it bounces up and down in one second. Signal frequency is similar, it measures how many times a wave goes up and down in one second. If it moves up and down quickly, it has a high frequency. But if it moves up and down slowly, it has a low frequency. Signal frequencies are usually measured in hertz, which represents the number of cycles per second. The electromagnetic spectrum chart behind me shows the entire range of electromagnetic frequencies. This is just to give you an idea of the vast nature of wireless signal frequencies. But we are going to hone in on the two main ranges or frequency bands used by Wi-Fi. These frequency bands are the 2.4 GHz band and the 5 GHz band. The first frequency band we will discuss is the 2.4 GHz band. It's like a slow but steady marathon runner. The 2.4 GHz band offers better range, meaning it can travel further. This characteristic makes it ideal for providing Wi-Fi coverage in larger spaces. However, since it's quite popular, the 2.4 GHz band can get crowded, leading to potential interference from other devices that also use this frequency. Now, let's meet our speedy sprinter, the 5 GHz band. It may not travel as far as the 2.4 GHz band, but it offers faster and more reliable connections over shorter distances. Due to its higher frequency, the 5 GHz band can handle more data, making it ideal for bandwidth-intensive tasks like HD video streaming, online gaming, and file transfers. Additionally, since the 5 GHz band is less crowded, it experiences less interference, providing a smoother and more consistent Wi-Fi experience. Now let's take one last look at our 802.11 standards and see which standards support which frequency bands. We will once again start with 802.11a. This standard utilized the 5 GHz band. Next, 802.11b was a bit slower because all other factors the same. It used the 2.4 GHz frequency band. 802.11g uses the 2.4 GHz band, but was able to match the speeds of the 802.11a standard by incorporating a new signal modulation technique. With the release of 802.11n, we were given the option to use either the 2.4 or 5 GHz bands. This was a big deal when it was released, as there was now a standard to support computing devices on both the 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz spectrums. And last, 802.11ac uses the 5 GHz band. One final note, there are many 802.11ac routers on the market, that are labeled dual band routers. These dual band routers support both 2.4 GHz and 5 GHz transmissions. They do this by creating two separate Wi Fi networks. 
One network will use the 5 GHz 802.11 AC standard, and the other will use an alternate 802.11 standard that supports the 2.4 GHz band. Now you know about the two main Wi-Fi frequency bands. The steady 2.4 GHz band, a bit slower, but has better range. And the speedy 5 GHz band, a bit faster, but with less range. Understanding each band's strengths and weaknesses will help you make the most of your wireless network setup. Exam Objective 2.8 Given a scenario, install, configure and secure a basic wireless network. Interference and Attenuation We will start this video off with the topic of interference and save attenuation for the end. With that said, there are two types of interference that we will cover. The first of which is electromagnetic interference. Electromagnetic interference, or EMI, is a disturbance or noise caused by electromagnetic signals that interfere with the proper functioning of electronic devices. Electromagnetic interference happens when electromagnetic waves, from one electronic device, interferes with the signals or operations of another nearby electronic device. These waves can be produced by various sources, such as Wi-Fi signals, cell phones, power lines, and even microwave ovens. So how does this topic fit in with our current exam objective covering wireless networks? Because, when electromagnetic interference becomes too great, it can lead to a disruption in wireless communications and cause weaker than expected broadcast signals. So what should you do if you have a problem? Ensure that EMI sources are either removed or at least kept to a minimum if you want reliable wireless communications. Next up we have another related topic. Signal-to-noise ratio, or SNR for short. Signal-to-noise ratio is a measure used to describe the quality of a signal by comparing a desired signal against any background noise or interference that is present. Imagine you're having a conversation with someone in a noisy room. The desired signal is your voice, and the noise is the background chatter and other sounds in the room. The clarity of your conversation depends on how loudly you speak compared to the noise level. If your voice is much louder than the noise, the other person can hear you clearly, and the conversation is successful. This is a high signal-to-noise ratio. Speak to softly and your voice will not be distinguishable from the crowd. This is a low signal-to-noise ratio. In the context of technology, a signal-to-noise ratio works similarly. It compares the strength of the desired signal, like a Wi-Fi signal, to the background noise, such as electromagnetic interference. A high signal-to-noise ratio means the desired signal is strong compared to the noise, resulting in clear and reliable communication or data transmission. On the other hand, a low signal-to-noise ratio means the signal is weaker, making it more challenging to distinguish the signal from the noise, leading to slow or unstable communications. Now that you understand the impact of EMI and the importance of maintaining a high signal-to-noise ratio, Let's now explore the second type of interference, physical obstructions. Yes, a physical obstruction can also introduce signal interference. For instance, any solid structure, such as a brick wall, can cause interference and weaken a wireless communication signal that has to pass through it. And just like EMI, this form of physical interference can also lead to slow or unstable communications. The frequency of a wireless signal will also have an effect on how much interference is experienced as a result of a physical obstruction. To keep this brief and on topic, the 2.4 GHz band will experience less physical interference than the 5 GHz band in most cases. You're almost there. We just need to cover one more property that can result in a weakened communication signal. And that is attenuation. Attenuation is the loss of signal strength as the transmission distance increases. Or alternatively, you can say, a signal decreases in strength the further it travels from its origination point or source. To grasp this concept, imagine the light coming from a flashlight getting dimmer as you move further away from its source. Similarly, as a signal travels over distance it becomes weaker. The farther the signal travels, the more it attenuates. Okay, great job with this video. You should now understand how EMI, physical interference, and signal attenuation can collectively weaken a communication signal and lower the signal-to-noise ratio. If not, try watching this video again. Exam Objective 2.8 
Given a scenario, install, configure and secure a basic wireless network. Wireless Network Best Practices Whether you are setting up and configuring an access point, a wireless router, or a Soho router, there are common tasks that should be performed to maintain the security of your wireless network. And this list can be extensive. But CompTIA's exam objective 2.8 has us focusing on two particular configuration best practices. They are, changing the SSID. And, changing the device's default administrative password. I will assume for a moment that you are unfamiliar with the term SSID and will therefore explain what it is. The term SSID stands for, Service Set Identifier. The SSID is a unique alphanumeric identifier given to a wireless local area network. The SSID serves as the name or label for the network, allowing devices like computers, smartphones, and other Wi-Fi-enabled devices to recognize and connect to it. The SSID is essential because it helps devices identify and connect to the correct wireless network. When you want to join a Wi-Fi network, you select its SSID from a list, like the one behind me. Look familiar? Now that you know what an SSID is, why should you change it when setting up and configuring a new wireless network device? Changing the SSID when first configuring a wireless device is a security best practice that is designed to enhance the overall security of your network. Most routers come with default SSIDs set by the manufacturer. These default names are often well-known and can be easily identified. Malicious actors or the bad guys might use this information to specifically target networks with default settings for potential attacks. In addition to changing the default SSID, you should also change the default administrative password on the wireless network device. This password serves as the device's login credentials and is used to access and configure the device's settings and features. Again, just like the default SSID, default admin passwords are often well-known and can be easily exploited by malicious actors or the bad guys, if not changed right away. So to recap, when configuring a new wireless network device, it is best practice to change the default SSID and the default admin password as soon as possible. Exam Objective 2.8 Given a scenario, install, configure and secure a basic wireless network. Encrypted versus Unencrypted When configuring a wireless network device, you will be presented with a very important security option. Do you want to encrypt your wireless network? Now before you jump right in and say, of course I want to encrypt, I will cover a few cases where you might want to leave your wireless network unencrypted. Leaving your wireless network unencrypted or having what is called open authentication allows unrestricted access to the network without requiring a password or authentication credentials. This can be useful in public spaces or guest environments to offer convenient and seamless internet access to a wide range of users. A perfect example would be a popular coffee shop in the heart of the city. With an open authentication wireless network in place, customers can easily connect to the internet without the need for a password or any authentication process. This makes it hassle-free for patrons to use their laptops, smartphones, or tablets. In doing so, users do need to be aware that they are responsible for their own data security while using the open network. Using an unencrypted wireless network is risky due to lack of password security protocols. Without encryption, information on the network can be seen by others. So try not to log into your bank account while connected to one of these networks. Paired with open authentication, you will often come across captive portals and keeping in step with our coffee shop scenario. On the right, we have a captive portal from my local Starbucks. Captive portals are commonly used with open authentication networks to provide an additional layer of control when sharing a wireless network with strangers. Even though we may not be requiring a password to authenticate, we may still want a user to at least agree to some terms and conditions of use. Some additional reasons for a captive portal may include informing a user of data collection or to provide management of a user's session. Captive portals are typically displayed as web pages that appear automatically when a user connects to an open network or attempts to access the internet for the first time after connecting. These web pages are designed to capture the user's attention and require them to take specific actions before gaining full access to the network. Now that we have covered the unencrypted option, let's switch over to encrypted networks. 
We will be covering four key encryption standards, WEP, WPA, WPA2, and WPA3. And if you looked at the CompTIA ITF plus exam objectives, you might have noticed I have added WPA3 to the list. This may not be a part of the current ITF plus exam as it is a newer standard, but it has found its way into the exams of many other IT certifications, so I figured, why not cover it in this video? Now, as I briefly work my way through these four wireless encryption standards, use the table behind me to keep yourself organized. I will start at the top and work my way down. First up, we have WEP, or Wired Equivalent Privacy. This is the oldest and weakest of the encryption standards. WEP used an RC4 encryption mechanism, which had some serious security flaws and could be easily cracked by determined hackers. So, it's best to avoid using WEP and opt for a more secure option. Next, we have WPA, or Wi-Fi Protected Access. WPA was an improvement over WEP and offered better security. It used a more robust encryption mechanism known as TKIP. This made it a bit harder for attackers to break into your network. However, like WEP, WPA is also considered outdated and not the best choice for modern Wi-Fi security. Moving on to WPA2, or Wi-Fi Protected Access 2. This is a more modern standard for securing Wi-Fi networks and has been widely used for years. WPA2 uses a stronger encryption mechanism known as AES. AES is highly secure and much more difficult for attackers to crack. If you have a relatively new router, it will likely support WPA2, and this is the best and most secure standard of those listed in the CompTIA ITF plus exam objectives. And now for the bonus encryption standard, WPA3. WPA3 is the latest and most advanced wireless encryption standard. WPA3 builds on the strengths of WPA2 and adds even more security features, such as the SAE encryption mechanism. WPA3 is currently the gold standard for Wi-Fi security, and if your wireless network device supports it, it is the best choice for keeping your network safe. One last note about these encryption standards. Just because your wireless network device supports a specific encryption standard does not mean the wireless clients do. It is very common that an older wireless client, such as a laptop, smartphone, or even a wireless IoT device like an oven, refrigerator, or light switch, may not support some of the newer encryption standards. If this happens, the client may not be able to connect to the network. Just some food for thought. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain the Purpose of Operating Systems for the CompTIA ITF plus Exam Objective 3.1, we will be taking an in-depth look at operating systems. This first video will just be an overview of the videos to follow. So let's kick this off with a definition of an operating system. An operating system, or OS for short, is the fundamental software program that serves as the backbone of a computer or any other computing device. It has the primary job of being the intermediary between the hardware components of the computer and the applications, or software running on it. More simply put, an operating system is like the boss of a computer, coordinating all its tasks and making sure everything runs smoothly. Or it is like a conductor, who leads an orchestra, ensuring all the musicians play together in harmony to create beautiful music. Well we got the primary function of being the intermediary between the hardware components and the applications out of the way. So what else does the OS do? Quite a bit. I have put together a list for now, but each of these items will get their own video, so no specifics yet. To run through the rest of the list we have. Disk management. Process management and scheduling. Application management. Memory management device management. And lastly, an OS provides access control functions. As we learn about each of these OS functions in the following videos, the images and demonstrations I will be using will be based on the Windows 10 operating system. This is because CompTIA exam content and questions will lean more toward Windows than Mac OS or Linux. Well, with the exception of the Linux plus exam, of course. See you in the next video. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain the Purpose of Operating Systems Disk Management In the context of an operating system, 
Disk management refers to the way the operating system organizes and provides structure for file and data management. Imagine your computer's storage as a big cabinet with drawers. Disk management is like arranging files neatly into different drawers, labeling them for easy retrieval, and ensuring there's enough space for new files without causing clutter. Or you can think of your computer's storage as a massive bookshelf, and the operating system is the librarian that organizes all the books on each separate shelf. Similarly, by using disk management tools, we can also create separate logical compartments on our storage devices, called partitions. A partition is a separate and distinct section or compartment of a storage device. It acts as a virtual division, allowing you to organize and manage data separately from other partitions. In Windows, for example, we can access the disk management utility and create a new partition for any portion of a drive that is unallocated or is not currently in use. The thick red line represents where I have added a partition. In addition to creating a partition, we can shrink a partition or decrease the allocated space. We can also extend a partition or increase the allocated space. And finally, we can delete a partition altogether. When deleting a partition, however, please be aware that any data inside of it will be lost. Now, let's talk about hidden partitions. These are partitions that are not readily visible to the user. Hidden partitions are often used for system recovery or specific system functions. They are typically hidden from the user to prevent accidental tampering or deletion. But they will still be visible with disk management tools. Let me create a hypothetical scenario for you to help you understand. If you were to purchase a 1 terabyte hard drive, but after installation you notice it only offered 900 gigabytes of storage space, the first thing you might want to do is use the operating system's disk management tool to see if the drive has any hidden partitions, as a hidden partition might be responsible for the missing 100 gigabytes of storage space. And that wraps up the basics of disk management. On to the next video and the next OS function. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain the purpose of operating systems. Process Management in the context of a computer program, a process refers to an instance of an executing program or application. It represents the computing resources, such as memory, CPU, files, etc., allocated to that specific program while it's running. Each process operates independently and follows its sequence of instructions, enabling the computer to execute multiple programs simultaneously, a capability known as multitasking. The operating system manages these processes, ensuring that they don't interfere with each other and that the system resources are allocated efficiently to provide smooth and responsive computing experiences to the user. While the operating system handles processes rather seamlessly, we do have tools that can help us when processes don't behave the way we expect or would like. In Windows, we have the Task Manager. Task Manager is a system utility that provides real-time monitoring and control over processes and system performance on a Windows computer. It offers several features that allow users to manage tasks effectively. In viewing tasks, the task manager displays a list of running processes, applications, and services, along with their current resource utilizations. This information helps users identify which programs are consuming the most resources and potentially causing performance issues. The task manager also allows users to close non-responding applications by selecting the application and clicking End Task. This sends a close request to the program, terminating the application, freeing up system resources, and resolving any potential unresponsiveness. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain the purpose of operating systems. Application Management in the context of IT, an application refers to a software program or set of programs designed to perform specific tasks or functions to meet the user's needs. Applications can include everything from simple utilities like text editors and web browsers to complex software like office suites, photo editors, and video games. And just so you don't confuse the definitions of an application and a process, an application represents the software itself and its intended purpose. A process refers to the running instance of that application on a computer. When you start an application, it becomes a process, 
and it runs independently with its allocated system resources, memory, CPU, etc. One application can have multiple processes if you run it multiple times, each process operating separately. The operating system manages these processes to ensure efficient use of resources and to prevent interference between them. In summary, an application is the software, while a process is the running instance of that software on the computer. Now that we have defined what an application is, managing these applications is another function of the operating system. Within Windows we have the Programs and Features applet to assist users in performing the basic functions of application management. Once an application is installed, the Programs and Features applet will allow you to view, manage, or uninstall applications. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain the purpose of operating systems. Memory Management The next operating system function we will discuss is Memory Management. From a user's standpoint, there is very little we need to do as the OS pretty much takes care of this for us behind the scenes. With memory management, there are two primary components, memory allocation and deallocation. Memory allocation involves allocating memory space to various processes or programs that are running on the computer. When a program is launched, the operating system allocates a portion of the available memory to it. This allocated memory is used to store the program's code, data, and variables during its execution. Memory deallocation occurs once a program completes its execution or is terminated. Memory deallocation, also known as memory release, involves freeing up the memory space previously allocated to the program so that it can be reused by other processes. Proper deallocation ensures that memory is efficiently utilized. One more item about memory management you should know is the concept of virtual memory. Virtual memory, also known as a page file, is a memory management technique used by operating systems to extend the available memory beyond the physical RAM, random access memory, installed on a computer. It allows the system to use a portion of the computer's storage, typically a hard drive, as an extension of RAM. Virtual memory is needed because some programs and tasks may require more memory than the physical RAM available, and without virtual memory, the system may become limited in its ability to run multiple programs simultaneously or handle large processes. Now let's take a look at virtual memory in action and discuss each of its parts. First up, virtual memory or page file. The page file is a designated area on the hard disk that acts as a repository when the physical RAM becomes fully occupied. When a program requires more memory than the available RAM, the operating system temporarily stores the less frequently used or inactive pages of that program in the page file. This frees up space in the physical RAM to accommodate the more actively used pages of other programs. Next, we have page swapping. As the user switches between different programs, the operating system uses a technique called page swapping. It moves pages in and out of the physical RAM and the page file as needed. When a program that has pages stored in the page file becomes active again, its pages are moved back to the RAM for faster access. While virtual memory enables the system to handle larger processes and multitasking effectively, using the page file on the hard drive is slower than accessing data directly from the RAM. This is because drive access times are significantly slower compared to RAM access times. Excessive reliance on virtual memory due to insufficient physical RAM can lead to performance slowdowns, where the system spends more time swapping pages in and out of the page file than executing actual tasks. And that wraps up this video on memory management. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain the purpose of operating systems. Device Management Device management is the process of controlling and coordinating the various hardware devices connected to a computer system. It is a vital function of the operating system that enables it to recognize, configure, monitor, and interact with hardware components, such as printers, graphics cards, network adapters, and storage devices. Device Manager in Windows is a built-in utility that allows users to manage hardware devices connected to their computer. It provides an intuitive graphical interface to perform various device-related tasks, to include Viewing device information Updating device drivers. Enabling and disabling devices. Troubleshooting device issues. And facilitating device removal. To provide an example. 
If you were having trouble with a printer's driver, this would fall under the device management function of the operating system, and the device manager tool in Windows would be a great place to start your troubleshooting efforts. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain the purpose of operating systems. Access Control Access control, in the context of an operating system, refers to the process of managing and regulating the permissions and privileges granted to users or processes, attempting to interact with system resources. It ensures that only authorized entities can access specific resources, preventing unauthorized access and maintaining the security and integrity of the system. In an operating system, access controls extend their authority over various aspects, including file permissions, application installations, and administrative tasks. File permissions dictate who can read, write, or execute files and directories, ensuring that sensitive data remains secure and only authorized users can access it. Application installations are controlled to prevent unauthorized software from being installed reducing the risk of malicious or unapproved programs compromising system stability or security. Administrative tasks, such as user account management, system configurations, and software updates, are restricted to authorized personnel to maintain the overall integrity and stability of the operating system. This concludes my breakdown of the different purposes or functions of the operating system. There were seven functions in total. How many can you recall? Exam Objective 3.1 Explain the Purpose of Operating Systems Types of Operating Systems We just learned in the last few videos what an operating system is and what an operating system does, but does every computing device use the same OS? Absolutely not. There are many, and each is designed for a specific use case. Now, I have laid out a few icons behind me. How many do you recognize? Most of us are familiar with Apple, represented by the Apple icon and no doubt you have spotted the Microsoft Windows icon behind me too. The penguin on the left, whose name is Tux, is the universal symbol for the Linux OS and on the right we have the icons for Google's Chrome OS and Android. Next I will present some use cases and list appropriate operating systems for each. I will start with workstation OSs. A workstation OS is designed to provide a user-friendly and feature-rich environment for individual users, often emphasizing multimedia capabilities, productivity tools, and personal customization options. So which operating systems apply to this scenario? First we have Linux. Linux has many different distributions, some of which are great for workstations. Next we have Apple. Apple also offers an OS for workstations. Their workstation OS is Mac OS. Microsoft offers Windows 10 and Windows 11. And a little less known, but also considered a workstation OS, is Google's Chrome OS. Servers have operating systems that are very similar to a workstation OS, but they are likely to be optimized for robustness, security, and stability to efficiently manage and serve resources and services to multiple clients in networked environments. This is an area where Linux excels. Many of the Linux distributions have been purpose-built for server environments. Windows also has server-specific operating systems. The most recent versions are Windows Server 2019 and 2022. Additionally, we have Unix. Unix is very similar to Linux as they share a lot of history, but are different enough to be mentioned separately. Moving on, we have mobile device OSs. Mobile device operating systems are fairly different than workstations and servers, as these OSs must be tailored for the constraints of smartphones and tablets, prioritizing items such as touch-based interfaces, virtual keyboards, power efficiency, and ARM processor compatibility. Currently, the mobile device market is dominated by two main OS options. They are Apple iOS and Android. Embedded operating systems are specialized OSs designed to run on resource-constrained devices with specific functions, providing real-time capabilities, minimal resource requirements, and efficient power management, making them suitable for a wide range of embedded systems like IoT devices and gaming consoles. They often provide high reliability for static environments where regular updates are not required. I do have one more OS type to cover. It is a Type 1 hypervisor, but I will save that for my next video. Exam Objective 3.1 Explain the Purpose of Operating Systems Hypervisor 
I know that I am expected to teach about hypervisors in this video, but I can serve you better by teaching about the broader topic of virtualization. For most, it is assumed that a single computing device can only run a single operating system at a time. And for a long time, that was true. But with modern computing, a new feature called virtualization has unlocked the ability for a single computing device to divide and share its resources in order to simultaneously run multiple operating systems. With virtualization, there are two common methods of deployment. The first virtualization setup starts with the computing device without an operating system installed. This will be represented by the empty green box behind me. Within this computing device, we will have hardware. This will include items like the CPU, RAM, and storage drives. And inside of a virtualized environment, this computing device is often called the host device. Next, we will need a hypervisor. A hypervisor manages the virtualization environment and facilitates interactions with the host device's hardware. With hypervisors, there are two types. With this virtualization setup, we will be using a Type 1 hypervisor. A Type 1 hypervisor, also referred to as a bare metal hypervisor, is a purpose-built operating system that is installed directly on the host device as the host device's OS, and this will be the hypervisor managing our virtualization environment and facilitating interactions with the host device's hardware. With the hypervisor in place, we can now complete our virtualization setup with the installation of virtual machines, or VMs for short. Virtual machines are simulated computer systems created by the hypervisor that allows you to run multiple independent operating systems and applications on a single physical computer simultaneously. Each virtual machine acts as a self-contained, isolated environment, complete with its own virtual hardware and resources, allowing it to run like a separate computing device from within the host device. Now for our next virtualization setup. Again, I will start with the computing device or host device, and I will use the same empty green box behind me in order to represent it. This computing device will still have hardware, to include items like the CPU, RAM, and storage drives. And we will still refer to this computing device as the host device. Now here is where we will differ from the first setup. Instead of installing a Type 1 hypervisor, or bare metal hypervisor, as the host device's OS, we will install an OS like Linux, Windows, or Mac OS. So effectively, we have an extra virtualization layer in our setup. Next, we will still need a hypervisor to manage our virtualization environment and facilitate interactions with the host device's hardware and network. So instead of a Type 1 hypervisor, we are going to install a Type 2 hypervisor. A Type 2 hypervisor runs as a software application installed on the host operating system just like any other software application. In this scenario, the host operating system will retain direct control of the host device's hardware, and the hypervisor must request use of it through the host OS. Otherwise, it will still behave the same as a Type 1 hypervisor. With our Type 2 hypervisor in place, we can now complete our virtualization setup with the installation of virtual machines. And in case you are wondering what this might look like in use, here is a screenshot of a host device with Windows 10 installed on it as the host OS. A Type 2 hypervisor was then installed on the Windows 10 host OS as a software application. This Type 2 hypervisor was then used to start up a virtual machine that utilizes a Linux operating system, which can now be operated from within the window here. The Linux device will behave the same as if it was installed on its own separate computing device thanks to the power of virtualization. By using a hypervisor to create virtual machines, we have an operating system designed to manage other operating systems. So where else might this technology be used? Well, a very common scenario is in a data center. Here a hypervisor can be used to create and manage multiple virtual machines on a powerful server enabling efficient resource utilization and consolidation of various workloads, such as web servers, databases, and application servers, on the same hardware. This also reduces the space requirement or physical footprint needed to store computer hardware. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System File Systems and Features in this video, we will cover what a file system is, and some of the more common features offered by varying file systems. 
So let's start with a basic definition. A file system in the context of computing is a method of organizing and storing data on a computer or storage device. It provides a structured way to manage and access data efficiently. For an analogy, think of a file system as a digital filing cabinet. Just like you use a physical filing cabinet to organize and store your documents, a file system does the same for your digital files on a computer. It ensures that your files are neatly arranged and easily accessible, making it simpler for you to find and use the information you need. Now, let's explore some key features offered by various file systems. The first feature I will cover is file compression. File compression is the process of reducing the size of a file to save storage space and enable faster data transfers. Sounds like a great solution if you are running out of storage space on your workstation or server. Now, different types of data may compress better with different compression formats. Here are some commonly used compression formats and their associations with operating systems and data types. Zip is a widely used compression format supported by Linux, macOS, and Windows. It is effective for compressing various types of files, including documents, images, and multimedia files. Gzip is a popular compression format used mainly by Linux and macOS. It is designed to provide efficient and fast compression and is commonly used for compressing text files, log files, and web content. Rarer is a compression format associated with WinRAR, primarily used on Windows. It is known for providing higher compression ratios and is suitable for compressing large files and archives. TAR, short for Tape Archive, is a compression format commonly used on Linux and macOS. An ISO is a standard file format used for creating images of optical disks like CDs and DVDs. It is compatible with various operating systems and commonly used to distribute software and operating system installation files. Our next file system feature is file encryption. File encryption is the process of converting the contents of a file into a secure and unreadable format using encryption algorithms. This transformation ensures that only authorized users can access the original content. File encryption is an essential security measure to protect sensitive information from unauthorized access and ensure data confidentiality. Just imagine if you lost your smartphone or your laptop. With the right encryption in place, no one would be able to view or read your data. Now let's talk about file permissions. File permissions are access rights that determine what actions users can perform within a file system. These permissions are set by the file's owner or system administrator to control who can read, write, execute, or have full control over the file. This enhances data security and prevents accidental data loss. The read permission allows users to view the contents of a file. The write permission allows users to modify the contents of a file, in addition to allowing users to add, delete, or rename files. And the execute permission allows users to run a file if it is an executable program or script. Last, full control is exactly what it sounds like. This permission provides a user full control over the file. Our next feature is journaling. Journaling is a feature that records changes made to the file system in a log, acting like a transaction history. It helps ensure data integrity during unexpected events like power outages or system crashes without losing data or corrupting files. We are nearing the end of this video and you are doing great. Just two more features to cover. Next up limitations. Or more specifically, file system limitations. Depending on the file system you are working with, there may be maximum capacity limits for a hard drive partition or a maximum size limit for an individual file. And last, file systems will each have naming rules. These rules will dictate which characters are allowed or disallowed in a file name, such as the forward slash character, and how many characters each file name can contain. Having a file adhere to a set of naming rules ensures that all files are easily identifiable and accessible within the file system. Now that you know some common file system features, are you ready to learn which file systems incorporate these features? Great, see you in the next video. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System NTFS
NTFS stands for New Technology File System and is a proprietary file system developed by Microsoft and is the default file system used in modern Windows operating systems, including Windows 10, Windows 11, and Windows Server. Now that we have a definition for NTFS, let's quickly see which file system features it supports. Our first feature is file compression, and NTFS does support file compression through its built-in feature called NTFS compression. When enabled, this feature allows files and folders on an NTFS formatted drive to be automatically compressed to occupy less disk space, reducing storage usage without compromising data accessibility. Next we have file encryption, and again NTFS does support file encryption through the encrypting file system, or EFS feature. EFS allows users to encrypt individual files or folders on an NTFS formatted drive, providing robust security by ensuring that only authorized users with the correct encryption keys can access and decrypt the encrypted data. NTFS also supports file permissions allowing users to control access to files and folders on an NTFS formatted drive. Through NTFS permissions, administrators can assign different levels of access rights to users and groups, such as read, write, execute, and modify, to ensure data security and restrict unauthorized access to sensitive information. And continuing with yet another checkmark, NTFS also supports journaling which is a feature that enhances data integrity and recovery after system failures or unexpected shutdowns. The NTFS journal keeps a record of changes before they are committed to the file system, helping to prevent data corruption. While NTFS is a powerful file system, it still has some limits. It can only handle hard drive partitions up to 16 exabytes in size and limits file sizes at 16 exabytes as well. While these limits are quite large and usually not a problem for regular computer use, they're important to know for specific cases where extremely large data storage is involved. And finally, NTFS follows specific naming rules for files and folders. It restricts the use of certain characters like the double quotation mark, asterisk, forward slash, colon, less than and greater than angle brackets, question mark, backslash, and vertical bar or pipe. Additionally, the maximum length for a file name is 255 characters. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System FAT32 FAT32 stands for File Allocation Table 32. It is a file system used to manage data on storage devices, such as hard drives, USB flash drives, and memory cards. FAT32 is an older file system that has been widely supported across different operating systems, including Windows, macOS, and Linux. Now that we have a definition for FAT32, let's quickly see which file system features it supports. Spoiler alert! Not many. Our first feature is file compression, and FAT32 does not support file compression as it lacks the built-in features to compress individual files or folders. Next we have file encryption, and again FAT32 does not support file encryption either. FAT32 also does not support file permissions as it lacks the ability to assign different access rights to individual files or folders for different users or groups. And journaling is a big no too. While FAT32 is widely compatible and accessible across different platforms, you can already see it is very limited. These limitations continue with its partition size restrictions. FAT32 imposes a maximum partition size of 2 terabytes, making it unsuitable for modern large capacity hard drives that often exceed this limit. Another significant constraint of FAT32 is its file size limit. Individual files stored on a FAT32 formatted drive cannot exceed 4 GB in size. This limitation can be problematic when dealing with large video files, high-resolution images, or other large data files that surpass the 4 GB threshold. Try to create a file over 4 GB in size and you are likely to see an error message. And finally, FAT32 follows some very specific naming rules for files and folders. It restricts the use of certain characters like the double quotation mark, asterisk, forward slash, colon, less than and greater than angle brackets, 
question mark, backslash, and vertical bar or pipe just like NTFS, but also restricts the plus symbol, commas, periods, semicolons, the equal sign, and square brackets as well. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System HFS Plus HFS Plus stands for Hierarchical File System Plus. It is a file system developed by Apple and used as the primary file system for Macintosh computers. HFS Plus organizes files and directories in a hierarchical structure, enabling users to manage and access their data efficiently. HFS Plus was preceded by HFS and has since been superseded by APFS, Apple File System, as the default file system on macOS. Now that we have a definition for HFS Plus, let's quickly see which file system features it supports. I will also slip in a few details about HFS and APFS as we go too. Our first feature is file compression. HFS Plus, an extension of the original HFS, introduced file compression capabilities that were not available in the original HFS. With HFS Plus, users have the option to compress individual files or directories, reducing their size on disk and saving storage space. This enhancement addresses a limitation of the original HFS, which lacked built-in support for file compression, making HFS Plus a more versatile file system for Mac users. Next we have file encryption. HFS Plus does not natively support file encryption leaving it without the built-in capability to encrypt individual files or directories. In contrast, APFS, the successor to HFS Plus in macOS, introduced file-level encryption, allowing users to encrypt specific files and directories for enhanced data security and privacy on compatible macOS devices. As for our next feature, file permissions, HFS Plus does support this feature enabling users to assign different access rights to files and directories for different users or groups on macOS devices. It allows administrators to control and manage access to data, providing a level of security and control over file access. APFS continued with this feature as well. And gaining one more check mark, HFS Plus does support journaling. Now, for file system limitations, HFS Plus supports partitions up to 8 exabytes, and it also supports file sizes up to 8 exabytes as well. You are not likely to hit these limits with your everyday use cases though. And finally, HFS Plus has pretty loose naming rules for files and folders. It restricts the use of only two characters when naming a file or a folder. The two characters are the forward slash and the colon. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System EXT4 EXT4 stands for Fourth Extended File System. It is the primary file system used in Linux-based operating systems. EXT4 is designed to provide improved performance, scalability, and reliability compared to its predecessor, EXT3. Now that we know EXT4 is Linux's primary file system, let's quickly see which file system features it supports. Our first feature is file compression. EXT4 does not natively support file compression as a built-in feature. However, it is possible to use external tools or compression utilities within the Linux environment to compress individual files or directories stored on an EXT4 file system, allowing users to save storage space and manage data efficiently. Next we have file encryption. And yes, EXT4 does support file encryption. There is even a tool, called FScript, that is used for managing the native file encryption of the EXT4 file system. As for our next feature, file permissions, EXT4 does support file permissions, allowing users to control access to files and directories in a Linux-based environment. EXT4 employs standardized permissions, where users can set read, write, and execute permissions for the owner, group, and other users, ensuring data security and access control on files and directories. EXT4 also supports journaling which is a crucial feature that enhances data integrity and recovery in case of system crashes or unexpected shutdowns. 
Now, for file system limitations, ext4 supports partitions up to 1 exabyte, and files sizes up to 16 terabytes. You are not likely to hit these limits, unless you are working with some very large data sets. And finally, ext4 has some of the most lenient naming rules for files and folders. It restricts the use of only one character when naming a file or a folder. And that character is the forward slash. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System Folders and Directories In the world of information technology, Understanding file structure is essential for organizing and managing data efficiently. Think of it as the blueprint that guides how information is stored and accessed on our computers. Imagine having a huge pile of papers without any order, it would be impossible to find what you need quickly. Similarly, without a file structure, our computers would become chaotic, making it challenging to locate and manage data effectively. To provide some sense of order our computers organize data into files and folders. So let's define files and folders and see how they work to bring order to our data. A file, in the context of information technology, is a digital container that holds data such as documents, images, videos, or any other type of information. It could be your essay for school, a picture from your last vacation, or even a program that runs your favorite game. Imagine files as individual pieces of a jigsaw puzzle when they are organized and put together correctly. They create a complete picture, enabling your computer to perform its various tasks. Without files, there would be no data to work with, and your computer would be nothing more than a lifeless box. Now, let's talk about folders, also known as directories. A folder is like a virtual container that helps you organize your files in a logical manner. Think of folders as your file cabinet, with each drawer containing related documents. You can have separate folders for work-related files, personal documents, pictures, or any other category that makes sense to you. Organizing files into folders not only keeps your data tidy, but also makes it easier to find and access specific information when needed. Moreover, folders can be nested inside other folders, creating a hierarchical structure, just like subfolders within a larger main folder. To summarize, keep your computer neat and tidy. Organize your files into meaningful folders and your computer will be a whole lot happier. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System File Types and Extensions When dealing with files, it is important to know that files come in different types, such as documents, images, videos, and more. Each file type is identified by a unique extension, which is a few characters at the end of the file name. Understanding file types and extensions is crucial because they tell your computer how to interpret and handle the data within the file. So let's dive in and unravel the secrets behind file extensions. File extensions are little tags that convey specific information about a file. For instance, a document might have the doc extension, while an image could have a JPEG or PNG extension. When you double-click on a file, your computer uses the extension to determine which program should be used to open and read the file's contents. It's like telling your computer, hey, this file is a document, so use the word processing software to open it. Extensions make file handling easier for both users and computers, ensuring that the correct software is used to access each file's data. Now, let's talk about a scenario that is specific to Linux and Unix operating systems. In Linux and Unix-based systems, extensions are not required. I repeat, in Linux and Unix-based systems, extensions are not required. Instead, these operating systems rely on file permissions and the content within the file to determine how to handle it. However, there's a neat trick, called a shebang, that allows scripts to specify which program should be used to open and read the file's contents directly in the file. For example, if the first line in a script starts with a hashtag, followed immediately with an exclamation point, this is a shebang. The shebang will then be followed with the file path leading to the program that should be used to open and read the file's contents. In my example, forward slash bin forward slash bash will call a program known in Linux as the bash shell to execute the script. Using this shebang provides flexibility and allows developers to create powerful and portable scripts without relying on file extensions. Congratulations!
you now have a solid grasp of file types, extensions, and how they function in the IT world. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System Services A service is a software program or function that runs in the background of a computer or device, providing specific tasks, functionalities, or capabilities to support the operating system or applications. You can think of services as dedicated helpers that work behind the scenes to manage and coordinate various tasks on our devices. They provide fundamental functionalities that allow us to interact with our computers and perform everyday activities effortlessly. From managing hardware resources like memory and processing power to handling software applications and user interfaces, OS services are the unsung heroes that make our digital experiences possible. Another essential feature of services is that they can be configured to start automatically when the computer is booted up. This, in turn, allows certain applications to run without requiring manual intervention from the user each time the computer starts. As a user, OS services are indispensable because they simplify our computing experiences and shield us from the complexities of hardware and software interactions. They ensure that our devices run smoothly and provide a user-friendly environment where we can work, play, and communicate effortlessly. Imagine trying to print a document without the device management and print spooler services, or accessing your photos without the file management service. Now that would be a challenging and frustrating experience. Thanks to these OS services, we can focus on what we want to achieve without worrying about the technical intricacies happening beneath the surface. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System Processes I know that I covered this topic in Exam Objective 3.1, but a refresher sure wouldn't hurt. So here it is again. In the context of a computer program, a process refers to an instance of an executing program or application. It represents the computing resources, such as memory, CPU, files, etc., allocated to that specific program while it's running. Each process operates independently and follows its sequence of instructions, enabling the computer to execute multiple programs simultaneously, a capability known as multitasking. The operating system manages these processes, ensuring that they don't interfere with each other and that the system resources are allocated efficiently to provide smooth and responsive computing experiences to the user. And once again, just so you don't confuse the definitions of an application and a process, an application represents the software itself and its intended purpose. A process refers to the running instance of that application on a computer. An application and a process are not the same. When you start an application, it becomes a process, and it runs independently with its allocated system resources, memory, CPU, etc. One application can have multiple processes if you run it multiple times, each process operating separately. The operating system manages these processes to ensure efficient use of resources and to prevent interference between them. In summary, an application is the software, while a process is the running instance of that software on the computer. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System Drivers A device driver is a software program that facilitates communication between a computing device's operating system and a specific hardware device. The device driver acts as a translator, allowing the operating system to directly communicate with, understand, and utilize the features and functions of the attached hardware device. With a driver in place, the next step is to keep your driver up to date. Updating drivers is crucial to ensure optimal performance, security, and compatibility with evolving hardware and software. As technology advances, manufacturers release driver updates that address potential bugs, improve device functionality, and enhance overall system stability. These updates can unlock new features, boost performance, and resolve vulnerabilities that could be exploited by malicious actors. By regularly updating drivers, users can harness the full potential of their hardware, experience fewer compatibility issues, and safeguard their systems against potential security threats. It also ensures that the hardware can seamlessly integrate with the latest operating systems and applications, providing a smoother and more enjoyable computing experience. But performing these updates does not always go to plan. 
In the event that something goes wrong after updating a driver, the option to perform a rollback is a valuable safety mechanism. Sometimes, an updated driver may inadvertently introduce problems or conflicts with specific hardware configurations or software setups. If these issues cause performance degradation or malfunctions, users can revert to the previous driver version through a rollback process. By doing so, the system can return to a stable state where the hardware was functioning correctly before the update. This ability to roll back a driver provides an important undo function, giving users confidence to experiment with new updates while maintaining a safety net to recover quickly, in case of any adverse effects. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System Utilities Operating system utilities are a set of essential tools and programs built into an operating system to help users manage, maintain, and optimize their computers. These utilities perform various tasks, such as file management, system maintenance, security, and more. Operating system utilities are like a toolbox for your computer. Just like a toolbox contains a range of tools that help you fix, build, and organize things, operating system utilities provide the necessary tools to manage and maintain your computer efficiently. One of my favorite operating system utilities is Task Scheduler. Task Scheduler is a built-in utility in Windows that allows users to automate and schedule tasks to run at specified times, or in response to certain events. It provides a way to execute programs, scripts, or commands automatically without user intervention. Task Scheduler enables users to set up tasks to run at specific intervals or on specific dates and times. This automation is useful for repetitive tasks, such as system maintenance, backups, and software updates. Tasks can also be triggered based on specific events, such as when the computer starts up, when a user logs in, or when a certain event occurs in the system. But the real beauty lies in the fact that tasks created in Task Scheduler are centrally managed by the Windows operating system. Users can review the history of task executions, monitor task status, and make adjustments to task settings as needed. If you think the Task Scheduler utility is cool, just wait. The CompTIA A Plus Core 2 exam is chock full of Windows utilities to learn about. Exam Objective 3.2 Compare and Contrast Components of an Operating System Interfaces In this video, we will explore the two primary interfaces used to interact with computers, the Command Line Interface, or CLI, and the Graphical User Interface, or GUI. Let's begin with the Command Line Interface. The Command Line Interface, or CLI, is a text-based interface used to interact with a computer or operating system. You can imagine it as a direct, text-based way to communicate with your computer. Just like having a conversation with someone using written language. By typing commands into the CLI, users can execute various tasks, such as navigating the file system, launching applications, managing files, and configuring system settings by entering specific commands and receiving text-based responses. CLI provides a powerful and efficient way to control a computer, especially for advanced users and system administrators. Now, our second interface type is a graphical user interface. A graphical user interface, or GUI, is a visual interface that allows users to interact with a computer or software application through graphical elements, such as icons, buttons, and windows. In a GUI, users can perform tasks by clicking on these graphical elements using a mouse or touchpad, making it more intuitive and user-friendly, especially for those who are not familiar with text-based commands in the command line interface, CLI. GUIs are commonly used in modern operating systems and applications to provide a visually appealing and interactive way for users to navigate, manage files, and perform various tasks with ease. One last note. In some situations, the GUI might not be accessible, may not have the necessary tools you need, or may not be available at all, but the CLI will always be there to help control your computer efficiently. Exam Objective 3.3 Explain the purpose and proper use of software. Productivity Software Productivity software refers to software applications that assist users in performing various work-related activities and tasks. It empowers users to create, manage, and manipulate digital content, saving time and effort while improving productivity. 
Some types of productivity software include word processing software, spreadsheet software, presentation software, web browsers, and visual diagramming software. Now let's examine each one of these software types, one at a time. First we will look into word processing software, which allows you to create, edit, format, and print text documents. It's like a digital typewriter with a whole lot of powerful features. Three popular examples of word processing software would include Microsoft Word, LibreOffice, and Google Docs. Next we will examine spreadsheet software, which allows users to organize, manipulate, and analyze numerical data in a tabular format. It consists of rows and columns, where data can be entered, calculated, and displayed in an organized manner. Spreadsheet software is commonly used for tasks such as performing calculations and compiling data. Three popular examples of spreadsheet software would include Microsoft Excel, LibreCalc, and Google Sheets. Now we have presentation software, which allows users to combine text, images, videos, and other multimedia elements to create visual slideshows or presentations. These slideshows or presentations are commonly used for educational, informative, or persuasive purposes in business, academic, or personal settings. Presentation software provides tools to design and organize slides, add animations or transitions, and share engaging and dynamic presentations to an audience. Three popular examples of presentation software would include Microsoft PowerPoint, Libra Impress, and Google Slides. Moving on, we have web browsers. A web browser allows users to access and view content on the World Wide Web. It serves as a gateway to the internet, enabling users to navigate websites, search for information, and interact with various online resources and cloud-based applications. Three popular examples of a web browser would include Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome, and Microsoft Edge. And the last productivity software type we will cover is visual diagramming software. Visual diagramming software allows users to create visual representations of information, concepts, processes, or relationships. And this is accomplished using images, diagrams, flowcharts, text, numbers, and other graphical elements. It provides a user-friendly interface with various tools and shapes that users can use to design and connect elements to illustrate complex ideas visually. Visual diagramming software is commonly used for planning, brainstorming, problem solving, and communicating ideas in a clear and structured manner. Three popular examples of visual diagramming software would include Microsoft Visio, Draw.io, and Lucidchart. Exam Objective 3.3 Explain the purpose and proper use of software. Collaboration Software Collaboration software is a category of software applications designed to enhance communication among individuals, working on shared files or projects, regardless of their physical locations. It enables users to collaborate in real-time, share resources, and streamline workflows. Some types of collaboration software include Email clients Conferencing software Instant messaging software Online workspaces and document sharing software. Now let's examine each one of these collaboration software types, one at a time. First we will look into email clients, which allows users to access, send, receive, and manage email messages from their email accounts. Additionally, it may feature built-in calendar functions that enable users to create, manage, and schedule events, appointments, and meetings. Three popular examples of email client software would include Microsoft Outlook, Google Gmail, and Apple Mail. Next we will examine conferencing software, which enables real-time communication between multiple participants through video and audio calls. It allows users to conduct virtual meetings, video conferences, webinars, and screen sharing sessions fostering effective communication and teamwork among remote individuals or teams. 
Conferencing software plays a crucial role in modern work environments, facilitating seamless interactions, idea sharing, and decision making without the need for everyone to be physically present in the same location. Three popular examples of conferencing software would include Zoom, Google Meet, and Skype. Now we have instant messaging software, which enables real time text based communication between individuals or groups. It allows users to send and receive text-based messages and file attachments instantly, fostering quick and efficient communication among users regardless of their geographical locations. Three popular examples of presentation software would include Slack, WhatsApp, and Discord. Moving on, we have online workspaces. Online workspace software provides a virtual environment where team members can collaborate on projects and organize resources. Online workspaces are designed to enhance remote collaboration, making it easier for team members to access and work on shared materials from anywhere. A popular example of online workspace software would be Microsoft SharePoint. And the last collaboration software type we will cover is document sharing software. Document sharing software allows users to share, access, and collaborate on digital documents with others over the internet. It enables individuals to upload, store, and distribute various types of files, such as text documents, spreadsheets, presentations, and multimedia files. Document sharing software promotes efficient collaboration by providing secure and easy access to shared documents, allowing multiple users to view, edit, and comment on the same files simultaneously. Three popular examples of document sharing software would include Microsoft OneDrive, Google Drive, and Dropbox. Before closing out this video, it is important to note that not all collaboration software will fit into a single category. Let me give an example to explain what I mean. Zoom may function primarily as conferencing software, but also has built an in instant messaging capabilities to improve the user's experience. Another example is how online workspace software will typically offer a range of features designed to enhance collaboration, including document sharing. Just keep this in mind come exam time. Exam Objective 3.3 Explain the purpose and proper use of software. Business Software Business software refers to software applications that are specifically designed to assist with various business processes and tasks. Business software helps organizations streamline operations, improve efficiency, and make informed decisions by managing and processing data effectively. Some types of business software include Database software Project management software Business-specific applications And accounting software Now let's examine each one of these business software types, one at a time. First we will look into database software, which allows users to store, organize, manage, and retrieve structured data efficiently. It provides a structured framework for collecting and storing information, making it easily accessible and searchable. Database software is commonly used in businesses and various industries to store large volumes of data such as customer records, sales records, and inventory records. Additionally, database software is designed to allow these records to be edited by multiple people at the same time. Three popular examples of database software would include MySQL, Microsoft SQL, and MariaDB. Next we will examine project management software, which enables teams to plan, execute, track, and collaborate on projects. It provides a centralized platform for managing tasks, timelines, resources, and communication related to a project. Project management software is designed to increase efficiency, productivity, and organization by facilitating effective coordination and monitoring of project progress from start to completion. Three popular examples of project management software would include Microsoft Project, Asana, and Trello. Now let's talk about business-specific applications. These are specialized software applications tailored to meet the unique needs and requirements of specific businesses or industries. 
Unlike generic software, business-specific applications are designed to address industry-specific challenges and processes, providing targeted solutions and functionalities. These applications aim to enhance efficiency, productivity, and decision-making within a particular business domain by focusing on the specific tasks and workflows relevant to that industry. And the last business software type we will cover is accounting software. Accounting software enables businesses and individuals to manage their financial transactions, record income and expenses, generate invoices, track expenses, and create a general ledger. It automates various accounting processes, such as bookkeeping, payroll, and tax calculations, making it easier to track and analyze financial data. Accounting software helps businesses maintain accurate financial records, streamline financial operations, and ensure compliance with financial regulations and reporting requirements. Three popular examples of accounting software would include QuickBooks, Sage, and Wave. With the topic of business software behind us, we have successfully covered Exam Objective 3.3. Hopefully you now have a good idea of all the available types of software out there and how they can be used. Great job! Exam Objective 3.4 Explain Methods of Application Architecture and Delivery Models Application Architectures In the world of IT, application architectures are like the blueprints that architects use to design buildings. Just as architects plan the structure of a building to ensure functionality, IT professionals design application architectures to create efficient and reliable software systems. In this video, we will cover three basic software layers that serve as the foundation for most application architectures. These layers are the presentation layer, the application layer, and the data layer. The presentation layer, also known as the front-end or user interface, is the part of an application that interacts directly with users. Its primary purpose is to present information and provide a user-friendly interface. This layer handles the visual elements, such as graphics, menus, buttons, and forms, that users see on their screens. It also facilitates user input, capturing data, and transmitting it to the application layer for processing. In essence, the presentation layer acts as the bridge between the user and the application. Next, there is the application layer. The application layer, also referred to as the middleware or business logic layer, is the core functional component of an application. It processes and manages user requests received from the presentation layer and performs the necessary computations and data manipulations to fulfill those requests. This layer contains the business logic, algorithms, and rules that define how the application functions and processes data. It acts as an intermediary between the presentation layer and our next layer, the data layer. As for that data layer, we usually refer to it as the backend or data access layer, and it is responsible for storing, retrieving, and managing the application's data. It deals with databases or other data storage mechanisms where information is persistently stored. When the application requires data, the data layer retrieves and sends it to the application layer for processing. Similarly, when data needs to be saved or updated, the data layer handles the storage process. In the next video, we will see how these application architecture layers are deployed within varying architecture models. Exam Objective 3.4 Explain Methods of Application Architecture and Delivery Models Architecture Models to keep in line with CompTIA's ITF plus Exam Objective 3.4, this video will cover the 1-tier, 2-tier, 3-tier, and N-tier application architecture models. Now let's start with the simplest model, the 1-tier architecture, and see how the application architecture layers we learned about in the previous video are organized. In a 1-tier architecture, also known as a monolithic architecture, all the components of an application reside on a single machine or system. There is no separation of the presentation layer, application layer, and data layer. Instead, they are all tightly integrated into one unit. To better understand the one-tier architecture, let's imagine a computer game that runs entirely on your personal computer or workstation. In this scenario, your computer becomes the complete application ecosystem. The game's graphics, sounds, user interface, logic, and data storage are all bundled together and operate within your computer's resources. 
While this approach is suitable for simple and standalone games, it may encounter challenges when dealing with more complex and larger scale applications. For more extensive applications, modern software design emphasizes breaking down the different layers into separate modules, allowing for better scalability, maintainability, and flexibility. To achieve these benefits, multi-tiered architecture models should be used. So let's try breaking down our one-tier architecture into a two-tier architecture. Here the components of an application will be divided into two main parts. The client and the server. In this two-tier architecture model, the presentation layer will be handled by the client side of the application. As for the application layer and the data layer, they will be handled by the server side of the application. And what do you know? I have another analogy for you. For this two-tier architecture scenario, picture a fast food restaurant with a cashier at the counter and a kitchen in the back. The cashier takes your order and communicates directly with the kitchen to prepare your food. This parallels our two-tier architecture, the client handling the presentation layer is our cashier, and the server handling our application layer and data layer is our kitchen. While this model is an improvement over the one-tier architecture, it can still become challenging to maintain as the application grows. So let's keep going and break down our two-tier architecture into a three-tier architecture. In a three-tier architecture, all three application architecture layers are broken into separate components. Again we will have a client and a server, but the data layer will now be handled by a distinct database component. In this three-tier architecture model, the presentation layer will be handled by the client, the application layer will be handled by the application server, and the data layer will be handled by a separate database server. This model allows for better scalability, as each layer can be managed separately, making it easier to add or modify components without affecting the others. Lastly, we have the N-tier architecture. In the N-tier architecture, the N is meant to represent any number of tiers. Imagine a large corporation with several departments. Each department has its specific tasks, and they collaborate when needed. In an N-tier architecture, we have multiple layers, each with a specific role and responsibility. These tiers can range from three to many, depending on the complexity of the application. This model provides the highest level of flexibility, making it ideal for complex applications. So, to summarize, application architecture models are like building your application with Lego blocks. You can start simple with a one tier, add more features with two tiers, get even fancier with three tiers, or go full on architect mode within tiers. Exam Objective 3.4 Explain Methods of Application Architecture and Delivery Models Application Delivery Methods Application delivery methods define how software applications are accessed and made available to users. In this video, I will cover three popular methods of accessing and using software applications. Our first application delivery method will be locally installed. This is a perfect method to use with standalone or one-tier applications. For this type of application delivery method, the application files and data are stored directly on your local computer's hard drive. When you use the application, it fetches and processes the data from your device. There is no specific network requirement for running locally installed applications. Once the application is installed, you can also use it offline, without a need for an internet connection. Our next method is local network hosted applications. With this delivery method, the application and any associated data files will be stored on a server or multiple servers within a local area network or LAN. The application server can then be accessed by clients on the same LAN. This type of delivery method does require a local area network to function, but does not require an internet connection. Our last application delivery method will be cloud hosted applications. This method is becoming increasingly popular as it allows access to applications and data over the internet from anywhere. With this method, the application, files, and data will be stored on an off-premises, remote server, accessible across an internet connection, or as we have come to refer to it, in the cloud. While it does sound great to be able to access an application from anywhere, being dependent on an internet connection does have its downsides. No internet, no app. So which application delivery method do you prefer and why? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. 
Exam Objective 3.4 Explain Methods of Application Architecture and Delivery Models Internet, Intranet, and Extranet Now that we have finished up our study of application architectures and delivery models, it is a perfect time for a bit of bonus teaching. In this video, I will be adding three new terms to your IT vocabulary, starting with Internet. Okay, so you may know this one, but let me define it anyways. The internet is a global network of interconnected computers and devices that allows people to communicate, share information, and access a wide range of online resources such as websites and services. It enables data to be transmitted across the world, facilitating seamless communication and access to information. This is super cool. But what if we don't want to share with the whole world? Do we have any other options? Of course we do. And that option is called an intranet. An intranet is a private network that exists within an organization, such as a company or institution. It allows authorized members of an organization to communicate, collaborate, and share information securely, no matter where they are located. Unlike the public internet, intranets are restricted to only those within the organization and are used for internal purposes. Great, we have a fully public option, an internet, and a private option, an intranet, for sharing websites and other resources. But do we have something in between? Yes, we have a little something for everyone. And that will bring us to our last term for this video, extranet. An extranet is an extension of an intranet that allows specific external parties, such as partners, suppliers, or customers, to access certain parts of the organization's internal network. It provides a secure and controlled way for external entities to collaborate and share information with the organization while keeping sensitive data separate from the public internet. I hope this bonus video helps you to never get these three terms confused, as I am sure you will see these terms used in a certification exam, or two, or maybe more. Exam Objective 3.5 Given a scenario, configure and use web browsers. Web browser caching. We have now reached Exam Objective 3.5, which will be all about configuring and using web browsers. First up for this objective, we have caching. Caching is a technique used in information technology to store copies of frequently accessed data or resources temporarily. By doing so, it allows for faster access to the data, reducing the need to fetch it from the original source every time it is requested. Caching is widely used in various systems, including web browsers, to improve performance and efficiency. Caching is like having a handy storage area on your browser. It saves copies of web pages, images, and other resources you've visited recently so that if you revisit those sites, your browser doesn't need to fetch everything from the internet again. Instead, it retrieves the stored resources from its cache, making the process much faster and more efficient. When you access a website for the first time, your browser downloads all the necessary files from the internet and stores them in its cache. The next time you visit the same website, your browser checks its cache first. If it finds the required files there, it loads them directly from the cache, reducing loading times and saving bandwidth. Caching significantly improves your web browsing experience, especially when you revisit frequently accessed sites or navigate back and forth between different pages of the same website. While caching provides numerous benefits, it's essential to understand why cache clearing is necessary from time to time. First, cached resources may become outdated. Websites are continually updating content, and if your browser continues to use outdated resources from the cache, you might not see the latest changes on the website. Second, caching can sometimes lead to privacy and security concerns. Cache data can include sensitive information, such as login credentials or personal details. If someone gains access to your computer or device, they could potentially access this cache data. Third, cache accumulation over time can consume significant storage space on your device, potentially slowing down your computer or smartphone. Clearing your cache is a simple process that varies slightly depending on the web browser you use. Generally, you can find the cache clearing option in your browser settings or preferences menu. It is a good practice to clear your cache regularly, especially if you notice any of the problems we discussed earlier. Doing so will ensure you have the most up-to-date content and a smoother browsing experience. Exam Objective 3.5 Given a scenario, configure and use web browsers. Website scripting 
In this video, you will be exposed to the magic behind scripting for websites. But before we delve into the technicalities, let's start with a simple definition to help you understand what scripting is all about. Scripting refers to the use of programming code to instruct a website on how to behave and interact with users. It enables websites to perform various tasks, respond to user inputs, and create dynamic and interactive elements, enhancing the overall user experience. With the right script, you can make websites come alive. Let's take a look at some examples of what website scripting can do. A script can create an image carousel that cycles through pictures, adding a dynamic touch to the website. A script can also ensure that users provide valid information in forms before submitting them, reducing errors and improving data quality. Or scripting can enable websites to display customized banner ads. The possibilities with website scripting are infinite. With web scripting, there are two primary types, client-side and server-side. Client-side scripting occurs directly within the user's web browser. It allows for interactive elements, like the image carousels and form validations we discussed earlier, without relying on constant communication with the server. On the other hand, server-side scripting takes place on the web server itself. It handles tasks that require data processing, like database operations or user authentications, and then sends the results to the user's browser. While scripting does improve the user's experience, there are some security concerns, especially with client-side scripting. This is due to its potential for abuse by malicious actors, since client-side scripts are executed within the user's web browser. One option to safeguard your computer is to deactivate client-side scripting altogether by adjusting your browser settings. While this may enhance security by preventing potentially malicious scripts from running, deactivating it may result in a degraded user experience, rendering certain features non-functional or limiting the usability of the website. Another option is to use a script blocker. A script blocker, also known as a script blocking extension or add-on, is a browser tool designed to control the execution of client-side scripts on websites. It allows users to selectively enable or disable the running of individual scripts. By choosing a script blocker over client-side scripting deactivation, you will maintain more granular control over script execution. Exam Objective 3.5 Given a scenario, configure and use web browsers. Browser extensions. Browser extensions, also known as add-ons or plugins, are small software programs that integrate with your web browser. They are designed to extend the functionality of the browser and provide extra features for tasks like ad and script blocking, language translation, password management, and much more. In order to add browser extensions to tailor your browsing experience, you will need to open your web browser and navigate to the browser's extension store or marketplace. From here, you can search for the desired extension using the search bar. Once you find the extension you want, click Add, and the extension will download and install automatically. Should you wish to remove an extension, the process is just as simple. Now that you know how to add and remove extensions, let's explore how to enable and disable them based on your preferences. Just because you have an extension installed, does not mean you have to have it enabled all the time. You can choose when and where to use the extension. To enable and disable the extension, open your browser and navigate to the extension settings. Here you can toggle the extension between enabled and disabled. When enabled, the extension will run and function as intended. When disabled, the extension will be deactivated and its functionality will be suspended until you re-enable it again. Also, don't assume the extension is enabled just because you installed it. Sometimes, the default state for a newly installed extension will be the disable state and not the enabled state. Exam Objective 3.5 Given a scenario, configure and use web browsers. Private Browsing Private browsing, also known as incognito mode or private mode, is a feature found in most web browsers that allows users to browse the internet without leaving any traces of their online activity on the device they are using. It is designed to provide a higher level of privacy and prevent the browser from storing data related to the user's browsing session. When you use private browsing, the browser does not store any records of the websites you visit, the searches you make, or the pages you view. 
This means that after closing the private browsing window, there will be no history of your online activities on that session. Additionally, in private browsing mode, cookies and temporary data are not saved, preventing websites from remembering your preferences or tracking your online activities. And if that wasn't already enough anonymity, private browsing also disables autofill and saved passwords, so your login credentials and personal information won't be automatically filled in on websites either. In short, if you use private browsing, it is as if you had cleared all your browsing data before closing the session. Exam Objective 3.5 Given a scenario, configure and use web browsers. Proxy Settings In this video, let's start with the basics. What is a proxy server? A proxy server is an intermediary server that acts as a bridge between a user's device and the internet. Or you could think of it as a middleman or a mediator between you and the internet. Imagine you want to access a website. Instead of connecting directly to that website, your request goes through the proxy server first. This server then forwards your request to the website on your behalf and returns the website's response back to you. It's like having someone fetch information for you. This also provides the proxy server with supervisory control over the connection. Now let's take a closer look at a proxy server in action. A standard connection provides direct access between the local network and resources across the internet. So where does a proxy server fit in? A proxy server interrupts the standard connection in order to establish a monitored connection. That is why we can refer to it as a middleman. The proxy server can then intercept network traffic allowing only approved traffic to pass through. Security rules that permit traffic can be applied to requests leaving the network or to responses entering the network. Conversely, the proxy server will deny network traffic that does not meet any security rule requirements. So what are some issues that might accompany this type of setup? Well for starters, if the proxy server is misconfigured or down, you might not be able to access the internet at all. It's essential to check the settings and make sure everything is set up correctly. Another problem that can arise is a slow internet connection. Sometimes, if the proxy server is overloaded or not optimized for your needs, it could result in slower loading times for websites. Other issues might be the ability to receive some types of traffic like email, but not HTTP traffic, or having the ability to access the company's intranet, but not external websites. These may be intentional restrictions imposed by an organization or just a misconfiguration of the proxy settings. So if you are having any of these issues, press 2 for technical support. Otherwise, stay on the line for my next video. <laughs> Exam Objective 3.5 Given a scenario, configure and use web browsers. Website Security Certificates To begin this video, let's discuss what a website security certificate is. You can think of a certificate as a digital ID card for a website. Just like you need identification to verify who you are, websites need certificates to prove their authenticity and ensure secure communication. Imagine you're about to enter a secure website. Your web browser checks this certificate to confirm the site's identity, like a virtual handshake, before it establishes a secure connection. These certificates are crucial in safeguarding sensitive data, such as personal information or credit card details, from falling into the wrong hands. So how are certificates acquired? Great question. Certificates are issued and managed by trusted third-party entities known as Certificate Authorities or CAs. These CAs act as digital notaries, verifying the identity and authenticity of the websites. When a website owner wants a certificate, they go through a validation process with the CA. The CA will verify the website owner's identity and domain ownership to ensure they are legitimate. Once the validation is successful, the CA issues a digital certificate containing the website's public encryption key and other essential information. Let's now look at the process step by step. Just keep in mind I will be presenting you with a simplified version of this process that is appropriate for the ITF Plus certification exam. Okay, step 1, the CA issues a certificate to the server. Next, a client will request identification from a server. The server will then send its certificate and a public encryption key. The client will then verify the authenticity of the certificate with the CA. If all goes well, a secure connection will be formed between the client and the server. 
So that was a little bit of a behind the scene view of certificates, I will now move to a user's viewpoint. When you access a website using HTTPS in the URL, your web browser recognizes this and checks for a valid certificate. If the certificate is valid and trusted, your browser establishes a secure encrypted connection with the website's server. The lock icon you see in the browser's address bar indicates a secure connection. It means your data, such as login credentials or credit card information, is encrypted while being transmitted, making it extremely difficult for hackers to intercept or decipher. But be careful, not all certificates are trustworthy. Let's talk about valid and invalid certificates. A valid certificate is one that has been issued by a reputable CA and is within its expiration date. On the other hand, an invalid certificate raises a red flag. This could happen if the certificate has expired, the website's domain name doesn't match the certificate, or the certificate was issued by an untrusted or unauthorized CA. When you encounter an invalid certificate, your web browser will display a warning message to protect you from potential security risks. In such cases, it's best to avoid proceeding to the website. Exam Objective 3.5 Given a scenario, configure and use web browsers. Browser Compatibility Browser compatibility refers to how well a website or web application functions across different web browsers. With numerous browsers available like Safari, Firefox, Chrome, Edge, and Opera, ensuring your digital creations work seamlessly on all of them is essential. Poor browser compatibility can lead to frustrating user experiences, broken functionality, and even security vulnerabilities. Various factors can impact browser compatibility. But one major factor is the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript code used by websites. Browsers tend to interpret these languages differently, which can cause some website pages to have visual or functional discrepancies. Behind me, I have a graphic of the same web page being rendered by two different web browsers, Firefox and Safari. Can you spot any differences? And lastly, when it comes to web applications, compatibility issues can arise from older applications not being able to function on newer browsers or the opposite, newer applications not functioning on an older browser. Exam Objective 3.6 Compare and contrast general application concepts and uses. Single Platform versus Cross Platform In this video, we will compare single and cross platform applications. A single platform application is designed to work exclusively with one type of computer or operating system. For example, a single platform application developed for Windows might not work on a Mac, and vice versa. This can create compatibility issues, limiting the application's usability to a specific group of users. But single platform applications do have some benefits. Having a targeted approach does allow developers to fully leverage the features, functionalities, and design elements of that particular platform. As a result, users of single platform applications often experience a highly optimized and tailored user experience. Now let's explore cross-platform applications. These applications are designed to work on different types of computers and operating systems, like Windows, Mac, and even mobile devices like smartphones and tablets. Cross-platform applications have been designed to be versatile, making them accessible to a wider audience. They break down language barriers between different computer systems, ensuring that the same application can run seamlessly on various devices. While cross-platform applications offer a consistent user experience across varying devices and operating systems, developers will often have to sacrifice certain features and functionalities to achieve this goal. Exam Objective 3.6 Compare and contrast general application concepts and uses. Open source versus proprietary. For this video, we will imagine software as a recipe. In open source, the recipe, or the source code, is like a publicly posted recipe. Anyone can access it, modify it, and even share their changes with others. It's like a collaborative cooking project where everyone can add their own ingredients and improve the recipe. The beauty of open source software is that it encourages collaboration, innovation, and transparency. Since anyone can contribute, issues can be fixed faster, and updates can come out more frequently. To give an example, many Linux distributions are open source. As for proprietary software, 
picture this as a secret recipe that only a specific chef knows. The source code is kept hidden, and you usually have to pay to use the software. It's like ordering a dish at a restaurant, you don't know exactly what goes into it, but it is expected that it will taste good. Similarly, proprietary applications often come with dedicated support, a polished user experience, and a clear chain of responsibility. The company behind the software takes care of updates and maintenance to ensure it operates as intended. As for a couple proprietary software examples, we have the Windows and Mac OS operating systems. Exam Objective 3.6 Compare and Contrast General Application Concepts and Uses Subscription versus One-Time Purchase Over the last few years, there's been a fundamental shift in the way software companies do business. Specifically, the shift from one-time purchases to subscription-based service. Previously, with one-time purchases, you bought a software product, paid a one-time fee upfront, and it was yours to keep and use forever. For example, Microsoft Office used to be available as a one-time purchase. You'd buy a version, like Office 2019, and it would be installed on your computer. You could use it as long as you wanted, without any further payments. Now let's talk about subscriptions. Instead of buying the software outright as a one-time purchase, you pay a recurring subscription fee at regular intervals, like monthly or annually, to continue using the software. In keeping with our Microsoft Office example, the subscription alternative is called Office 365. While a one-time software purchase benefits from no ongoing payments, subscription-based software offers continual access to the latest features, updates, and support, and the flexibility to cancel or change software as needed. Exam Objective 3.6 Compare and Contrast General Application Concepts and Uses Software Licensing Before we dive into the different types of software licensing, let's understand what software licensing actually is. Think of software licensing as a set of rules and permissions that govern how you can use a piece of software. It's like a digital contract between you and the software creator. Okay, now let's talk about the first type of software licensing we are expected to understand for the CompTIA ITF Plus certification exam, the single-use license. Imagine you're buying a ticket to a movie. That ticket grants you one-time access to watch the film. Similarly, a single-use software license allows you to install and use the software on one device. For example, if you purchase a single-use license for a photo editing software, you can install and use it on one computer. Next up, we have the group use or site license. Imagine you're organizing a group event and you purchase a group ticket that allows multiple people to attend. Similarly, a group use or site license permits you to install and use the software on multiple devices within a defined group or location. For instance, a school might buy a site license for educational software. This would allow all the computers in the school's computer lab to have the software installed. It's like buying a bunch of group tickets for everyone attending your event. This is a great licensing solution when the number of users is expected to fluctuate regularly. And lastly, let's discuss the concurrent license type. Imagine you're a restaurant owner and you have a limited number of seats available. Only a certain number of people can be seated at the same time. A concurrent license operates similarly, it limits the number of users who can access the software simultaneously. For example, a company might purchase a concurrent license for project management software or accounting software. This means that only a specific number of employees can use the software at the same time. This is just like having a fixed number of seats at your restaurant. Exam Objective 3.6 Compare and Contrast General Application Concepts and Uses Software Installation The process of installing software can be broken down into some common steps, the first of which is to read the installation instructions. This will cover important topics, like is the software compatible with your operating system, or does your current hardware support the program and meet the minimum RAM, processor, or hard drive requirements. After reading the installation instructions and verifying your system can operate the software, the next step is to download the software from the installation media. Software installation media refers to the physical or digital means by which software is delivered and installed onto a computer or device. Installation media transitions software from a collection of digital instructions into a functional application. 
Installation media can come in various forms, such as CDs, DVDs, USB drives, or downloadable files from the internet. But once it has completed its task, the result will be an operational program that can be used by the computing device. Next, depending on the software product you are likely to need a product key. These product keys are like digital passports that grant access to specific software applications. Much like a unique fingerprint, each product key is distinct and serves as a verification mechanism to ensure that users have acquired legitimate and authorized copies of the software. Acting as both a security measure and a licensing control, a product key is typically a combination of letters, numbers, or characters, separated by hyphens, that users enter during the software installation process. This key unlocks the software, enabling its full functionality. Another part of the software installation process involves agreeing with the EULA. A EULA, or End User License Agreement, is a legally binding contract between the software creator or publisher and the end user of a software application. Operating as a virtual rulebook, the EULA outlines the terms and conditions that govern the usage of the software. Comparable to a set of guidelines for navigating a digital landscape, the EULA specifies important aspects such as permitted usage, restrictions, intellectual property rights, liability limitations, and any obligations or responsibilities of both parties involved. By agreeing to the EULA, users acknowledge and accept the rules under which they can utilize the software. The last part of the software installation process I will explain is the difference between the default and the advanced installation option. Starting with the default installation option, this option is designed to offer an express and hassle-free approach to installing software. Comparable to following a well-marked path, a default installation takes care of the essential steps, making it ideal for users seeking a quick and straightforward setup. However, for those who wish to take their software experience a step further and customize it to their specific needs, advanced options come into play. These custom options provide users with the ability to fine-tune various aspects of the installation process. This includes selecting specific components or features to install, choosing where installation files will be placed, adjusting performance settings, and even modifying the user interface. Be sure to pay attention to each of these software installation steps next time you install a program. Maybe even take a peek at the advanced installation options. What could go wrong? Exam Objective 4.1 Compare and Contrast Programming Language Categories Programming Levels With this video, we will be starting our study of Domain 4.0 of the CompTIA ITF Plus Certification Exam, which is all about software development concepts or computer programming. We will start from the very basics and work our way up, so don't worry if you're completely new to information technology or programming. Let's get started. At the most fundamental level, computers receive, transmit, process, and store information in binary form. Computers work in this manner because they utilize billions of tiny electronic switches called transistors. These transistors can be in either an off or on state. The digits 0 and 1 used in binary reflect the off and on states of a transistor, where 0 is off and 1 is on. If this sounds familiar, that is because we covered this in exam objective 1.1. Moving up a level, we have machine language or machine code. Machine code consists of hexadecimal representations of binary instructions that are used by the computer's processor to directly control the computer's hardware. This is like the computer's native language, but it's not something humans find easy to work with and is not quite readable. Moving up yet another level, we have assembly language. This language represents machine code instructions using mnemonics that are easier for humans to understand. It is the closest language we have to machine code and is great for designing and programming low-level device drivers, but it is still not quite user-friendly. Finally, as computers evolved, so did programming languages. High-level languages, like Python, Java, C++, C Sharp, and many others were created. These languages are much more human-friendly. In high-level languages, you write code using words and syntax that closely resembles everyday human language. In the next few videos, I will be focusing on the high-level languages, but at a minimum, don't forget the basics about each level we just discussed. Exam Objective 4.1 Compare and Contrast Programming Language Categories Compiled Languages This video will focus on a subset of high-level programming languages called compiled languages. 
But to begin understanding what a compiled language is, you first need a definition for a compiler. A compiler is a translator for computer programs. It takes the human written instructions you give in a high level programming language and turns them into machine code. It is important to note that a compiler translates the entire program into machine code prior to running or executing the program. Just as we use different languages to communicate with each other, computers require specific languages to understand the instructions we give them. A compiler takes the human readable source code you write in a compiled programming language and translates it into machine code, the low level instructions that the computer's processor can execute. Once the entire program has been translated by the compiler, the program is ready to run. Now, here's an important aspect of compiled languages they are single platform. What does that mean? Well, a compiled program is tailored to run on a specific type of computer or platform. This means that if you've written a program using a compiled language, it will work best on the platform it was compiled for. If you want the program to run on a different platform, you'll need to recompile it for that specific platform. As an upside, since the program has already been translated to machine code, when you do run the program, it will execute or run faster. To wrap things up, let's take a quick look at some popular compiled programming languages. We have Go, C, Java, C, and COBOL, just to name a few. Exam Objective 4.1 Compare and Contrast Programming Language Categories. Interpreted Languages. This video will focus on another subset of high level programming languages called interpreted languages. But to begin understanding what an interpreted language is, you first need a definition for an interpreter. An interpreter is a real-time translator for computer programs. It takes the human written instructions you give in a high-level programming language and turns them into machine code. This is very similar to the compiler we discussed in the previous video, with one clear difference. The interpreter translates and executes the program, line by line, in real time. Just as you might use a translator to understand a language you're not familiar with, computers use interpreters to understand and execute the instructions you give it in a programming language. Unlike compilers, which translate the entire program up front, interpreters work line by line, converting your human readable code into machine instructions as it goes. Now, here's an important aspect of interpreted languages, they are cross-platform. But what does that mean? Well, an interpreted program is more flexible in terms of platform. This means that the same program can run on different types of computers without needing to be rewritten or recompiled. Interpreters adapt the code on the fly to match the computer's specific architecture, making it easier to create software that works on various platforms. As a downside, since the program has to be translated to machine code line by line at runtime, it will execute or run a bit slower. To wrap things up, let's take a quick look at some popular interpreted programming languages. We have PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby, and JavaScript, which should never be confused with Java. Exam Objective 4.1 Compare and Contrast Programming Language Categories Scripting Languages this video will focus on scripting languages, which is a subset of interpreted languages. But before I talk about scripting languages, let's talk about scripted languages. These are programming languages that are used to create applications, software, or functionalities that can stand alone. They're like the main actors on a stage. They are ready to perform without needing a director or another program to guide them. Now on to scripting languages. You can think of these as the supporting actors. They are used to create scripts, which are sequences of instructions that merely guide other software programs. It's like giving cues to the main actors on how to perform specific actions. Great, now you know the subtle difference between scripted languages and scripting languages. With that out of the way, let's look a bit closer at scripting languages. Scripting languages focus mostly on creating scripts that automate tasks or control other software. These scripts often work behind the scenes and are comprised of a series of command line instructions or commands grouped together. These instructions are written in a specific order to automate tasks or perform actions on a computer or system. Think of it as a quick and efficient way to make the computer carry out multiple tasks without manually typing each and every command. 
Some examples of scripting languages include Bash, which is common in Linux distributions, and PowerShell, which is specific to Windows. While scripted languages offer better performance and optimization for standalone applications, scripting languages excel in automation and quick task completion. Scripting languages are easy to learn and highly versatile at performing ad hoc or as needed tasks quickly. Exam Objective 4.1 Compare and Contrast Programming Language Categories Markup Languages Now it is time to cover markup languages. In this lesson, we'll decode the mystery behind what makes websites and digital content look and feel the way they do. Let's start with the basics. Imagine you're reading a book. The words on the pages are written in a language we understand, right? Well, web pages and digital content also have their own special language that computers and browsers use to understand how to display things. This language is known as a markup language. Just like you wouldn't read a book without paragraphs, headings, or punctuation, digital content wouldn't make sense without its own set of instructions. Markup languages provide these instructions to computing devices so they know how to arrange and present the content you see on your screen. One of the most common and foundational markup languages is HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language. HTML uses a series of tags, think of them as digital labels, to define elements on a web page, like headings, paragraphs, images, and links. So think of HTML like the blueprint for a web page. It tells the browser where to place each piece of content, how to format text, and how to embed images or videos. This structure and formatting ensure that the web page looks consistent and readable on different devices and screen sizes. And HTML is just the beginning. There are other markup languages too, like XML, Extensible Markup Language, which is used for storing and transporting data, and SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, which is great for creating scalable graphics and illustrations. So, whether you're building a personal blog, a company website, or even a complex web application, understanding how markup languages work will give you the power to shape and share your digital ideas with the world. Exam Objective 4.1 Compare and Contrast Programming Language Categories Query Languages Ready to learn about query languages? All right, let's go. A query language is a specialized computer programming language used to communicate with and manipulate databases. It provides a way for users and applications to interact with databases by sending requests for specific data or actions to be performed. Query languages are essential for extracting meaningful insights from large volumes of data stored in databases. They allow users to formulate complex queries to filter, sort, aggregate, and transform data based on specific criteria. Query languages are particularly valuable for data analysis, reporting, and decision-making processes. One well-known example of a query language is SQL, or Structured Query Language. SQL is widely used for relational databases and is used to manage and manipulate data in a tabular format, where tabular is just a fancy word for table. SQL queries can retrieve specific records, perform calculations, join data from multiple tables, and much more. If this topic excites you, I will cover it in much more detail when we get to Domain 5 of the CompTIA ITF plus exam objectives. Exam Objective 4.2 Given a scenario, use programming organizational techniques and interpret logic. Flowchart Concepts A program is no more than a sequence of step-by-step -step instructions, also known as an algorithm. For very simple programs, keeping track of these steps during the design process can be easy, but what happens when a program gets significantly more complex? Do you think it would help to have a visual representation of the program? Luckily, we have such a tool. Imagine you're embarking on an adventurous quest through a maze. As you navigate, you encounter pathways, decisions, and obstacles. In the realm of computers, we use programming flowcharts as our guide, helping us visualize and map out the logical journey our programs will take. Think of a programming flowchart as your trusty map. It's a visual representation of the steps and decisions your program will make. Just as a real map helps you find your way, a flowchart guides your program's actions, ensuring it follows the correct sequence. Within a flowchart, you will find a variety of different shapes and arrows with each element having their own meaning. 
For example, a rectangle might represent a process or task, while a diamond shape signifies a decision point where your program must choose between different paths. The beauty of flowcharts is their universality. They transcend programming languages, making them a powerful tool for both beginners and seasoned programmers. Programming flowcharts are your compass in the realm of coding. Whether you're building games, apps, or solving real-world problems, they guide you through the logical twists and turns, ensuring your programs run smoothly and efficiently. Exam Objective 4.2 Given a scenario, use programming organizational techniques and interpret logic. Pseudocode Concepts In this video, we will be covering the topic of pseudocode. Pseudocode is a simplified and human-readable representation of a computer program's logic and algorithm, expressed in natural language or basic code-like syntax. Using pseudocode helps programmers outline and plan the steps a program should take without focusing on specific programming language details. Here is an example of some pseudocode. And I have placed it side by side with its equivalent Python code. The pseudocode on the left is just a plain language description of the steps in an algorithm. It uses structural conventions of a normal programming language, but is intended for human reading rather than machine reading. With pseudocode, being precise is not as important as getting your code organized. This is very similar to the pre-writing phase of the writing process. The pseudocode is just your rough draft of the program logic. After completing your pseudocode, you should be ready to clean it up and write the actual code in accordance with the specific syntax and format of your desired programming language. Or in the case of my example here, Python. Exam Objective 4.3 Explain the purpose and use of programming concepts. Let's get coding. Over the course of the next few videos, I'll be diving into a range of fundamental programming concepts that have universal relevance across different languages. Each of the topics outlined in CompTIA's ITF plus exam objectives was selected in order to provide you with a solid foundation upon which to construct your understanding of coding. These programming concepts include identifiers, containers, logic components, functions, and objects. As I explain each programming concept in detail, I plan to harness the power of flowcharts. They will help as a dynamic tool to demystify intricate coding concepts. These flowcharts will serve as your compass, guiding you through the intricate pathways of logic and decision-making within programming. By employing these illustrative diagrams, my hope is to convert complex ideas into intuitive visual narratives, making even the most intricate coding concepts feel like a walk in the park. Also, where appropriate, I will incorporate pseudocode and Python code to further assist with topic comprehension. Now that you know what to expect, join me as we take a step-by-step -step exploration through these essential programming concepts. Exam Objective 4.3 Explain the purpose and use of programming concepts. Identifiers In this video, we will learn about two specific types of program identifiers, a variable and a constant. But first off, let's talk about identifiers as a whole. You can think of an identifier as a symbolic name that points to a specific location in the computer's memory. Just like your name helps people identify you, identifiers help the computer keep track of different pieces of information, referred to as values. Looking at the graphic behind me, you can imagine the computer's memory or RAM as a bunch of boxes. Each box holds some data, it could be a number, a word, or anything else. Identifiers are like labels on these boxes. They tell the computer which box to look in when it needs that particular piece of information. Great, now we can break this topic down a bit more and focus on a specific type of identifier called a variable. In keeping with our box analogy, a variable is like an open box that can hold different things at different times. For example, you might have a variable called num2 that holds an integer value. You can put different values into this box, and the computer will remember them. Maybe you start with the value 20, but then change it to 47. The variable num2 can be reassigned to the new value just like that. And though the value has changed, the identifier's symbolic name and the location where it is stored in memory will not. Our next type of identifier is called a constant. This will behave very similar to a variable at first. With a constant, our box will start open, 
but once we assign a value to a constant, the box will be closed for the remainder of the program's runtime. In short, a constant holds a single value that doesn't change. Imagine you have a box labeled pi. You then assign the value 3.14 to the constant pi. From that moment forward, our box will be sealed and you will be unable to change this value. Now that we know what a variable and a constant are, there is one last thing I want to cover before we jump into our first coding example. Once again, look at this flowchart. Where does our program start? I hope you shouted out at the top. And if you did, you are right. Coding works the same way. Reading code line by line, from top to bottom, is fundamental to programming. When looking at a program, you will need to get comfortable sequentially following the execution path of the program from the first line at the top to the last line at the bottom. Doing so, enables you to track variable changes, understand the flow of logic, and observe control structures. Just as you read a book or follow a set of instructions step by step, reading code linearly allows you to progressively build a comprehensive understanding of how the program operates. Now we can work with some very simple code. Five lines of code to be exact. I have even numbered the lines of code to help keep things organized. So where should I start? At the top, with line one of course. Here we see x equals five. This is called an assignment statement, as it assigns a variable with a value, in this case the integer five. You can read this quite literally as x is assigned with the value five. For this assignment statement, the identifier is x. This is the symbolic name that will be used by the computer to reference the value's stored location in memory. The equal sign here is referred to as an assignment operator as it performs the function of assigning a value, and 5 is the value being stored. The order is also very important. The identifier will always be on the left and the value on the right of the assignment operator. If you look at the top right of the screen, I have intentionally positioned a box that will help us keep track of our variable values as we progress through the lines of code. Okay, on to line 2. Here the value of x is replaced with the integer 6. Because it is a variable, we can reach in and remove the 5 and replace it with the 6. Now, on line 3, we see something a bit different. Here the current value of x is 6, but we are going to replace it with its current value plus 2, causing our new value to be 8. On line 4, we will be declaring a new variable y. This y variable will be assigned the current value of x, which happens to be 8. And for our last line of code, we will declare yet another variable z, and assign it the value of x plus y, since the value of x is currently 8 and the value of y is currently 8, z will become 16. This should give you some insight into how variables work. As for constants, the process is the same with the exception that you cannot change the value after the initial assignment. So where do you use these variables and constants? Well, just about any time a program needs to store a value in a place that can be accessed quickly and where you need the value to remain in memory only while the program is running. And there you have it, the basics of variables and constants with regards to computer programming. Exam Objective 4.3 Explain the Purpose and Use of Programming Concepts Containers In this video, we will build upon the concept of identifiers and learn about containers. Containers are just a special type of identifier and will therefore have many of the same properties as a variable or a constant. Containers will still have a symbolic name that points to a specific location in the computer's memory. And these symbolic names will still help the computer keep track of different pieces of information, referred to as values. So how are these containers different from a standard identifier? Well, they are capable of holding more than one data element at a time. While a standard variable or a constant can only hold one data element at a time, a container can hold one, two, three, or more data elements simultaneously. Great! Now we can break this topic down a bit more and focus on two specific container types, the array and the vector. But before I do, a quick disclaimer. For this topic I will be following the terminology and definitions provided in CompTIA's official study guide. Outside of this course, you will find some ambiguity with regards to this topic as each programming language is likely to use slightly different terminology and definitions for arrays and vectors. 
Okay, so how does CompTIA define an array? An array is a special type of identifier that can reference multiple values. These values can be arranged in a single or multi-dimensional manner, which you can visualize like a table with multiple columns and rows. Additionally, an array will be of a fixed size, meaning you cannot resize it after it is declared. Now how does CompTIA define a vector? A vector is another special type of identifier that can reference multiple values. These values can also be arranged in a single or multi-dimensional manner. But a vector differs from an array in one major way. A vector has the ability to grow or shrink in size. Now let's work with some very simple code starting with the review of a standard variable. In line 1, we declare a variable x, by using the code, x equals 5. If you recall from the previous video on identifiers, this is called an assignment statement, as it assigns an identifier with a value. For this assignment statement, the identifier is x. This is the symbolic name that will be used by the computer to reference the value's stored location in memory. The equal sign here is referred to as an assignment operator as it performs the function of assigning a value, and 5 is the value being stored. Now, in line 2, we have a container. Here the identifier is numList. This is still considered an assignment statement, as it assigns a container with a set of values, in this case the integers 5, 6, and 8. And for one more example, we have a container that is given the identifier animals. This container is assigned multiple string values. Specifically cat and dog. So where do you use arrays and vectors outside of my example code? Well, just about any time a program needs to store a set of values. This could include storing a list of items, like the months of the year, or collection of data, like a list of strings containing customer names. And there you have it the basics of containers with regards to computer programming. Exam Objective 4.2 Given a scenario, use programming organizational techniques and interpret logic. Branching Up till now, we have only looked at code running line by line, from top to bottom. This is like driving down a straight road with no exits, twists, or turns. This works for the most basic of programs, but this will not allow our programs to make decisions. So how can we add decisions and variants into our programs? Well, we have a control structure for that, referred to as branching. A branching statement provides a program with a decision. While driving from one city to another, we could take a straight route down the highway, but in reality we could very likely choose from many different paths that all lead to the same destination. This is the exact idea to keep in mind as we explain this topic of branching statements. Using the power of flowcharts, I will illustrate a branching statement. As usual we will start at the top of our code. Next in the code, we encounter a branching statement. Here we are presented with a decision in the program as denoted by the diamond-shaped symbol. This flowchart displays a decision having two possible options. Option 1 would result in output 1. While option 2 would result in output 2. And regardless of which decision is made, both branches will eventually merge back together and continue with any remaining code statements or in our case, reach the end of the program. Now I am going to zoom in on the decision portion of this branching statement. When we reach a branching statement, our program will of course have a decision to make. But how does a computer program make a decision? Well, that is the next piece in this puzzle. A branching statement will use a condition statement to aid in the decision-making process. A condition statement will present a true or false scenario. For our example, I am using the condition statement if num is greater than 2. With this statement, we will be looking at the num variable and checking whether it is greater than 2. Now, should the variable num have a current value of 10, the conditional statement would evaluate to true, as 10 is greater than 2. This would result in our code displaying output 1. But, if the current value of num was 1, the conditional statement would evaluate to false, as 1 is not greater than 2. This would result in our code displaying output 2. Hopefully you now understand the concept of branching statements and the conditional statements that drive them. Now it is time for some more terminology. Next we will take these concepts and apply them to coding directly. In most programming languages, a decision with two branches is often called an if-else statement. 
With this code arrangement, if the conditional statement evaluates to true, then the first branch, which would be the if branch, will execute. Otherwise, if the conditional statement evaluates to false, the second branch, which would be the else branch, will execute. Or to put it another way, the else branch acts as a catch-all for any scenario where the if statement is not found to be true. To wrap up this video, let's take a look at an if, else branch using some pseudocode and walk you through the code line by line. For our example, we will have some fun and pretend we are working with some military security clearance levels. First up let's take an input for the user variable. Our input will be general. In receiving this input, our user variable becomes equal to general and is stored in memory. Next we see on line 2, if, and on line 4, else. These are our two possible branches. You will start with the if statement and see whether or not the condition evaluates to true. Since user does indeed equal general, our condition is true and we will execute the indented line of code. This line of code declares a variable with the identifier of clearance and assigns it the value of top secret. Now this next piece is very important. Because our if branch was selected, we will now skip over lines 4 and 5, which includes the else branch and the code indented underneath it. Just as you can only take one path on the highway each time you go from one place to another. You only execute one path in a branching statement each time it is encountered in the code. Once we have concluded with the branching statement, we pick up on the very next line of code and continue on. As for this last line of code, the program is directed to print or output the value currently stored within the variable clearance, which happens to be top secret. Great job for making it this far. In the next video, we will build upon this concept and see how we can add additional branches. Exam Objective 4.2 Given a scenario, use programming organizational techniques and interpret logic. Branching continued. In the previous video on branching, we covered if else statements. This was a perfect coding technique to use when presented with a choice that has only two possible outcomes. But what if we have three or more possible outcomes? Time to bring in the else if branch. The else if branch is a branch statement that will contain an additional condition statement. It behaves exactly as the original if branch, with one exception, the if branch condition is checked prior to any else if condition. Using flowcharts, I will illustrate this new concept. As usual we will start at the top of our code. Next in the code, we encounter a branching statement. Our first conditional statement will be our if statement. The if statement will present a condition that needs to be checked. When the if statement's condition evaluates to true, the code will display output 1. But when the if statement's condition evaluates to false, the code moves on to the next branch. For this scenario, that would be the else if statement. And just as it sounds, else if is much like a backup plan for when plan A fails. Here your code will repeat the condition check process, but this time the check will be performed using the else if conditional statement. When the else if statement's condition evaluates to true, the code will display output 2. Now, should the if statement and the else if statements all evaluate to false, the code moves on to the else branch. This is our catch-all branch as there is no conditional statement that has to be satisfied. For this scenario, the else branch leads to output 3 being displayed. And once again, regardless of which decision is made, all branches will eventually merge back together and continue with any remaining code statements or in our case, reach the end of the program. To wrap up this video, let's take a look at another branching statement. Again, I will utilize some pseudocode and walk you through the code line by line. For this example, we will be going to the circus and we will need to determine our ticket price based on age. First up let's take an input for the age variable. Our pretend person will be 20 years old. In receiving this input, our age variable becomes equal to 20 and is stored in memory. Next we need to evaluate whether or not the conditional statement for the if branch is true or false. In this case our current age of 20 is not less than 4, so the statement is false. This causes us to skip line 3 and pushes us down to the else if branch. Now we need to evaluate whether or not the conditional statement for the else if branch is true or false. In this case our current age of 20 is not less than 18, so the statement is false. This leads us to skip line 5 and go straight to the else branch, our catch-all. 
Here there is no conditional statement. With no check to perform we jump right into this branch and execute the indented statement on line 7. This is an assignment statement that declares the variable price and assigns it the value shown. Once we have concluded with the branching statement, we pick up on the very next line of code and continue on. As for this last line of code, the program is directed to print or output the value currently stored within the variable price. This can be seen on the right-hand side under output. Wow, you are crushing this topic. In the next video, we will take everything we have learned about coding thus far and try to solve a few practice questions. Exam Objective 4.2 Given a scenario, use programming organizational techniques and interpret logic. Branching Practice Time to practice your new coding skills with some practice questions. These questions are specially designed to prepare you for the CompTIA ITF Plus exam. Each question will contain pseudocode represented in different ways. Remember there are no hard rules on how to write pseudocode, and CompTIA likes to be a bit tricky. Ready, here is question 1. Examine the following pseudocode. If the variable, num, is set to 4, what will be the output? If you want to try and solve this question on your own, pause this video now. Otherwise, I will go through the code line by line. In line 1, we have an if statement, so we know this is the first part of a larger branching statement. Your first task is to evaluate if num is greater than 7. Which is a false statement, as num is equal to 4 and 4 is not greater than 7. So we head on down to the next branch statement on line 3. Here we evaluate if num is less than 11. This is true, as num is equal to 4 and 4 is less than 11. So this is the branch we will execute. The only statement in this branch is to print, which means to output, the string, b. So, the answer to this question is b. Now many of you may be looking at line 5. The condition num equals 4 is pretty tempting. Am I right? But don't fall for this. Remember that we start with the first branch and work our way down the code sequentially until we find a branch that evaluates to true. Once we do, that is the path we take. You can only choose one path. In this question, the computer never even considers the third branch containing the num equals 4 conditional statement, as it had already selected the previous branch. Here is question 2. Examine the following pseudocode. What will be the output of this code? If you want to try and solve this question on your own, pause this video now. Otherwise, I will go through the code line by line. First off, remember this is pseudocode. Here we just need to follow the logic and consider the pseudocode as a truncated form of spoken language. Okay, for this question, the case on line 2 and end case on line 8 is pseudocode representing the beginning and end of this branching statement. And lines 3 through 7 are our different branches. Knowing this probably makes this question seem a lot easier, doesn't it? Now, in line 1, we have an assignment statement. This statement declares a variable with the identifier score and assigns it the value of 70.00. Line 2, case, opens our list of possible branches. From here we go branch by branch or line by line until we find a conditional statement that evaluates to true. The branch on line 3 evaluates to false, as our score of 70.00 is not greater than 90. The branch on line 4 also evaluates to false, as our score of 70.00 is not greater than 80. The branch on line 5 is where most would make a mistake. In coding we have to be precise. This branch evaluates to false as the score variable may be equal to 70. But it is not greater than 70. In computer programming, that is a huge difference. Now, the branch on line 6 evaluates to true, as our score of 70.00 is greater than 60. So we read on and are instructed to declare and set a variable identified as grade to the string value of D. Now that we have chosen a branch, we move on to the next line of code following the branch statement. This is line 9. Here the code outputs the value of the grade variable, which is currently D. D is our final answer. Here is question 3. Examine the following pseudocode. If today is Sunday, what will be the program's output? If you want to try and solve this question on your own, pause this video now. 
otherwise, I will go through the code line by line. Okay, so this piece of code is designed to output a business's operating hours based on the day of the week. It does include some containers. But I am confident you can handle this as it is not that much different from the previous two questions. In line 1, we have an assignment statement. This statement declares a variable with the identifier today and assigns it the string value of Sunday. Next we have our containers. Line 2 shows a container with the identifier weekday 1 and stores the string values Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. These values can be used as a set or referenced individually. Line 3 shows another container with the identifier weekday 2 and stores the string values Tuesday and Thursday. And line 4 shows yet another container with the identifier weekend and stores the string values Saturday and Sunday. In line 5, we see this question is once again testing us on the concept of branching, and this line is our if branch. Our conditional statement is asking us to check if the value of today is equal to Friday. And here I have an opportunity to teach you something new. We know in coding that an equal sign is used as an assignment operator for many languages. The single equal sign has the job of assigning a value to an identifier. Well, to prevent confusion in a computer program, most languages use a double equal sign as a comparison operator to see if two values are equivalent in value. Now, being that this is just pseudocode, exact syntax is not necessary, so be prepared to see some variance as you attempt these types of questions. Okay, back to the question at hand. The variable today, which is currently set to Sunday, is not equal to Friday, so this statement evaluates to false. This causes us to skip line 6 and move on to the else if branch on line 7. Here our conditional statement is checking if the value of today, which is currently set to Sunday, exists in the container, weekend. Well, weekend contains the values Saturday and Sunday. So yes, Sunday is in the container weekend, and our statement will evaluate to true. Now we will execute this branch, which includes the indented statement on line 8. Line 8 calls for the program to output the hours of 10 to 4 and that is our answer. If you found these example questions helpful, please share your thoughts in the comments. Also, I look forward to seeing you in the next video where we will begin our study of loops. Exam Objective 4.2 Given a scenario, use programming organizational techniques and interpret logic. Looping Up till now, we have looked at code running line by line, from top to bottom. Then we moved on to branching which provided our programs with the power of choice. But now we are going to add one more logical component to our coding repertoire. Looping. Programming loops are structures in coding that enable the repetition of a specific set of instructions until a certain condition is no longer met. They allow for automating repetitive tasks, making your code more efficient and concise. Using the power of flowcharts once again, I will illustrate the concept of a programming loop. As usual, we will start at the top of our code. Next in the code, we encounter a loop statement. Here we are presented with a decision in the program as denoted by the diamond-shaped symbol. This flowchart displays a decision of whether to enter the loop or continue on with the remainder of the code. If we enter the loop, we will execute the code included inside the loop. In this case, we have a process to be performed and then an output of some sort. After the code inside the loop is executed, we return back to the decision point. Here we are once again presented with the option to enter the loop or continue on with the remainder of the code. This looping process can be repeated as many times as necessary by the program. Once the program has finished with the loop, it will continue on with any remaining code statements or in our case, reach the end of the program. Now that we have discussed the basic concept of looping, in the next few videos, we will progress deeper into this topic by exploring two common loop types. The while loop and the for loop. The while loop and the for loop. The while loop and the for loop. Uh-oh. Looks like I got caught in a loop myself. <laughs> Exam Objective 4.2 Given a scenario, use programming organizational techniques and interpret logic. While loops. For this video, we will discuss while loops. A while loop is a programming construct that repeatedly executes a block of code as long as a specified condition remains true. 
The loop continues to run until the condition evaluates to false, at which point the program moves on to the next section of code outside the loop. A while loop is best used in situations where you don't know beforehand how many times the code needs to be executed, and you want the loop to continue until a certain condition is no longer met. We will now take a closer look at the decision portion of this while loop. A while loop starts with a condition check. Before entering the loop, the condition specified in the while statement is evaluated. If the condition is true, the code inside the loop is executed. If the condition is false from the start, the loop will not be executed at all. For our example, we will be checking if the variable num is a positive integer or greater than zero. To start things off, our variable num is equal to four, so the condition check is num greater than zero will evaluate to true. This will cause us to execute the code within the while loop. Next, we will receive an integer from a user that will be assigned to the num variable and replace our current value. Here we will assume the value 2 was provided as an input. Here our program will perform some type of process and then we will return back to the condition check of the while loop. At this point, we have completed the while loop once. Now it is time to reevaluate and see if the condition statement of the while loop is still true. Here we can see that the variable num, which is now equal to 2, is indeed still greater than 0, so we will execute the code within the while loop a second time. So again, we will receive an integer from a user that will be assigned to the num variable and replace our current value. This time we will assume the value minus 1 was provided as an input. Here our program will perform some type of process and then we will return back to the condition check of the while loop. At this point, we have completed the while loop twice. Now it is time to once again reevaluate and see if the condition statement of the while loop is still true. Here we can see that the variable num, which is now equal to minus 1, is no longer greater than 0, so we will not execute the code within the while loop anymore. Since the condition check has now evaluated to false, we will continue with any remaining code statements or in our case, reach the end of the program. Now that we got the flow of things, let's take a look at a while loop using some pseudocode and walk through the code line by line. For our pseudocode example, we will keep things very simple. First up, we will declare a variable with the identifier x and initialize it with the value of 0. On line 2, we see a condition statement for a while loop. Our condition statement calls for our program to check if x is less than 2. Since the value of the variable x, which is currently 0, is less than 2, we will execute the code statements within the loop. The word begin on line 3 is only used here to mark the beginning of the looped code statements. So let's continue on. On line 4, we will reassign the variable x with the current value of x plus 1. This is a very important part of the while loop. Since the condition check of the while loop is based on the value of x, if our loop does not provide a way for x to be modified in some way that will eventually cause the condition to evaluate to false, we could find our code stuck in an endless cycle, or what is referred to as an infinite loop. On line 5, our program prints out the value of variable x, which is now 1. On line 6, we have the word n to mark the end of the looped code statements. Now we head back up to line 2 and start the while loop all over again. This time we perform a reevaluation and check if x is still less than 2. Since the value of the variable x, which is currently 1, is less than 2, we will execute the code statements within the loop again. Next, we see the word begin, this opens our looped code. We reassign x with the current value of x plus 1, making 2 the new value. We print out the value of x, which is currently 2, and append it to the previous output of 1. Next, we see the word end, this closes our looped code. And finally, we pop back up to the top of the loop to perform our condition check a third time. This time we see that x is equal to 2, but no longer less than 2, so our condition evaluates to false. This causes our program to move to the next line after the while loop. In this example, since there is no more code, our program is done. Great job! In the next video, we will try to solve a few practice questions using what we have learned about while loops. Exam Objective 4.2 Given a scenario, use programming organizational techniques and interpret logic. While loop practice. Time to practice your new coding skills with some practice questions. These questions are specially designed to prepare you for the CompTIA ITF plus exam. 
Each question will contain pseudocode represented in different ways. Remember there are no hard rules on how to write pseudocode, and CompTIA likes to be a bit tricky. Ready, here is question 1. Examine the following pseudocode. What will be the output? If you want to try and solve this question on your own, pause this video now. Otherwise, I will go through the code line by line. In line 1, we declare a variable at num. In line 2, we set the variable at num to the value of 8. On line 3, we see a condition statement for a while loop. Our condition statement calls for our program to check if at num is less than 10. Since the value of the variable at num, which is currently 8, is less than 10, we will execute the code statements within the loop. The word, begin on line 4 is only used here to mark the beginning of the looped code statements. So let's continue on. On line 5, we will reassign the variable at num, with the current value of at num plus 1, resulting in a value of 9. Remember, this is a very important part of the while loop. Since the condition check of the while loop is based on the value of at num, if our loop does not provide a way for at num to be modified in some way that will eventually cause the condition to evaluate to false, we could find our code stuck in an infinite loop. On line 6, we have the word n to mark the end of the looped code statements. Now we head back up to line 3 and start the while loop all over again. This time we perform a reevaluation and check if at num is still less than 10. Since the value of the variable at num, which is currently 9, is less than 10, we will execute the code statements within the loop again. Next, we see the word begin, this opens our looped code. Then line 5 will increment our variable at num by 1 again, setting its value to 10. This is followed by the word end, which closes our looped code. And finally, we pop back up to the top of the loop to perform our condition check a third time. This time we see that our variable at num is equal to 10, but no longer less than 10, so our condition evaluates to false. This causes our program to move to the next line of code after the while loop. Which happens to be line 7. On line 7, our program prints out the current value of at num, which is now 10. So our answer to this question is 10. Here is question 2. Examine the following pseudocode. What will be the output? If you want to try and solve this question on your own, pause this video now. Otherwise, I will go through the code line by line. In line 1, we declare a variable myNum and assign it the value of 1. On line 2, we see a condition statement for a while loop. Our condition statement calls for our program to check if myNum is less than 2. Since the value of the variable myNum, which is currently 1, is less than 2, we will execute the code statements within the loop. The word, begin on line 3 is only used here to mark the beginning of the looped code statements. So let's continue on. On line 4, we will print out the value of myNum plus 4. This will cause the program to output the value of 5. On line 5, we have the word n to mark the end of the looped code statements. Now we head back up to line 2 and start the while loop all over again. This time we perform a reevaluation and check if myNum is still less than 2. Since the value of the variable myNum, which has never changed, is less than 2, we will execute the code statements within the loop again. But let me pause here for a moment. See anything wrong with this scenario? If you notice that we have an infinite loop, you are absolutely right. In this loop, there is only one statement, and that statement has the program output the value of myNum plus 4. This is not a reassignment statement. So myNum will forever remain at 1 and our while loop condition statement will forever evaluate to true. Now, when running a program that encounters an infinite loop, you are likely to see nothing printed as our program will fail. So just disregard the output of 5 we had a moment ago as the correct answer to this question would be nothing. Here is question 3. Examine the following pseudocode. What will be the output? If you want to try and solve this question on your own, pause this video now. Otherwise, I will go through the code line by line. In line 1, we declare a variable counter and assign it the value of 1. On line 2, we see a condition statement for a while loop. Our condition statement calls for our program to check if the variable counter is greater than 4. Since the value of the variable counter, which is currently 1, is not greater than 4, we will not execute the code statements within the loop. 
this causes our program to move to the next line of code after the while loop, which happens to be line 6. On line 6, our program prints out the current value of counter, which is 1. So our answer to this question is 1. Now that was an easy one. But in all honesty, I hope you find all while loops easy, now that you have had a little practice. Exam Objective 4.2 Given a scenario, use programming organizational techniques and interpret logic. For loops For this video, we will discuss for loops. A for loop is a programming construct that is very similar to a while loop, but they differ slightly in their structure and application. Both loops repeat a block of code, allowing for efficient automation of repetitive tasks. The key difference lies in their decision mechanisms. A for loop, as pictured on the left, typically specifies the number of iterations prior to execution, making it ideal for situations where the number of iterations is known in advance. On the other hand, a while loop, as pictured on the right, relies on a condition to control its execution, making it more suitable for scenarios where the number of iterations is uncertain. Now that we got the flow of things, let's take a look at a for loop using some pseudocode and walk through the code line by line. Our example will demonstrate a for loop which specifies a counter variable, i, along with its start and end values. By specifying the start and end values for i, we are designating in advance how many times we want to iterate through this for loop using integer values. This example will also include the keyword, next. A next statement is used in certain languages to increase the counter variable by the value of 1 each time the loop completes an iteration. Ready to walk through this example line by line? Alright, let's go. First up, we will declare a variable with the identifier y and initialize it with the value of 4. On line 2, we see a for loop statement. The for loop statement starts with the word for. This is followed by the declaration of a counter variable. For this example, our counter variable will be i. This variable is appropriately named as it will help us keep count of which iteration of the loop we are on. Next we have our start and end values. With this statement, we know that we will continue this for loop from the time our counter variable i starts at 0 and continue until our counter variable i reaches 2. Being that this is our first iteration our i variable will be set to the value of 0 for now. The indented code statement on line 3 is part of our looped code. It will reassign the variable y with the current value of y plus 1. y will now be set to the value of 5. On line 4, we see the word next. This next statement will increase the counter variable by the value of 1 and mark the end of our loop's first iteration. Now we head back up to line 2 and start the for loop all over again. Since the value of the variable i, which is currently 1 is still in the range of 0 to 2, we will iterate through the for loop again. On line 3 we will reassign y with the current value of y plus 1, making 6 the new value. On line 4, we see the word next. This next statement will increase the counter variable by the value of 1 and mark the end of our loop's second iteration. Next, we pop back up to the top of the for loop again. Since the value of the variable i, which is currently 2, is still in the range of 0 to 2, we will iterate through the for loop again. On line 3 we will reassign y with the current value of y plus 1, making 7 the new value. On line 4, we see the word next. This next statement will increase the counter variable by the value of 1 and mark the end of our loop's third iteration. Now, this time when we pop back up to the top of the for loop, since the value of the variable i, which is currently 3 is no longer in the range of 0 to 2, we will not iterate through the for loop again. Instead we will continue on in the code with the next line following the for loop, which is line 5. On line 5, we will reassign y with the current value of y plus 5, making 12 the new value. We also no longer retain the counter variable i in memory, as we have finished with our for loop. Next on line 6, we see the word echo. Echo is a word used by some programs to perform an output. In this case, our program is called to output the value of y, which is currently 12. And with no more lines of code, our program ends. Now, if you ever feel like you're stuck in an infinite loop of confusion, just press pause, grab a snack, and debug your frustrations before diving back into our video series. Exam Objective 4.3 Explain the purpose and use of programming concepts. Functions Let's start with the basics. What exactly is a programming function? 
In simple terms, a function is a reusable block of code that performs a specific task or set of steps. This enables programs to be divided into reusable components. Think of it as a set of instructions that we can call upon whenever we need to perform that task, without having to write the same code over and over again. Now, let's explore the input and output aspect of a function. Think about a vending machine. You put coins in, that is your input, then you press a button, and out comes your snack, that is your output. Functions work in a similar fashion. You feed them some data or values as input, they process it, and then they give you back an output. And now, let's explore how to put our functions to work. In programming, this is referred to as calling the function. This involves using its name and passing the function any necessary inputs. The function can then carry out its tasks and hands you back an output. I have provided you with a definition for functions and we have discussed inputs, outputs, and calls. While this would be enough information to answer any questions about functions on the ITF Plus exam, I think you would benefit from seeing this concept in action. So here we go. For my coding example, I will be using Python. Okay, time to go line by line. On line 1, we declare a variable named global number and assign it the value of 4. On line 2, I have left a space. This is common practice just before defining a function as it makes your code easier to understand. On line 3, we define our function. Def is a keyword used to define a function in Python. This is followed by the function name. The function name is what we will use to call the function when needed. I have named this function double, as the purpose of this function will be to take a number as an input and output twice that number's value. Inside the parentheses, we have a parameter. In the context of a function, a parameter is a variable that is used to pass information into a function. Here I have named our parameter local number. On lines 4 and 5, we have two indented code statements. These are the lines of code that will execute when the function is called. Line 4 reassigns the variable local number with the current value of local number times 2. On line 5 we output the new value of the local number variable. On line 6, I have left another space to assist in the readability of the code. On line 7, we call the function double by using its name. Inside the parentheses is our variable global number. This is the input we will pass to the function. This input will then become our parameter or variable named local number. And that is what a function will look like in code. Now, one more concept to learn before I wrap up this video on functions. I would like to teach you about global and local variables. And I must admit, I was deliberate when choosing my variable names this time around. Global and local variables are fundamental concepts in programming that define the scope or accessibility of variables within a program. A global variable is one that is defined outside of any function or code block. It holds a scope that extends throughout the entire program, enabling it to be accessed and modified from any part of the code. These variables are often declared at the beginning of a program. On the other hand, local variables are confined within a specific function or code block. They have a localized scope, restricting their accessibility to only the function or code block in which they are defined. These variables are particularly useful for storing temporary data required for a specific operation or calculation. Since each function call establishes its own scope, local variables within that scope don't affect other parts of the program. In summary, global variables offer universal accessibility throughout the program, while local variables are confined within their respective functions or code blocks. Additionally, local variables will no longer exist in memory when the function that defines the variable finishes and passes control back to its calling program. Exam Objective 4.3 Explain the Purpose and Use of Programming Concepts Objects To start off this video about programming objects, imagine you have a car. A car is a complex system made up of various parts, each with its own unique functionality. But what if you had to remember the details of every part and how they all work together? It would be overwhelming, right? Well, that's where programming objects come in. Objects help us to organize and manage complexity by grouping related data and functions together. Just like a car has wheels, an engine, and seats, an object has its own characteristics and behaviors. So, what exactly is an object? 
think of it as a self-contained unit that groups together data and actions. It's a way to represent real-world things or concepts in a digital format. For example, if you were developing a software system for an automotive dealership. In this context, we could create an object called car. This car object would store details about a specific car model, including its year, make, model name, and color. Additionally, the car object would have methods that enable actions such as checking its availability, calculating loan payments, and scheduling delivery. Now, let's talk about object properties and attributes. These are often used interchangeably, but there's a slight difference. While both deal with the characteristics of an object, attributes are the intrinsic characteristics. They define the object's state and store information relevant to the object's identity. These data values collectively provide a snapshot of the object's current characteristics at any given time. As for properties, they provide a controlled way to interact with an object's attributes, thus acting as a bridge between the data elements of an object and the external code that uses that object. And finally, let's explore object methods. Think of methods as the actions an object can perform. They're like the functions that an object knows how to execute. Referring back to our car object from earlier in this video, this object might have multiple methods, like accelerate and brake or refuel. These methods allow us to interact with the object and perform actions related to it. Or for you old school video game lovers, if you were playing the Super Mario Bros. video game and wanted to make Mario run, jump, or duck, you would push a button on the video game controller. In turn, the video game's program would apply a method to the Mario object, causing the desired outcome. And with that, we have completed domain 4 of the CompTIA exam objectives. Next up we have database fundamentals. Ready, set, let's a go. Exam Objective 5.1 Explain database concepts and the purpose of a database. Using a database. Databases have become an integral part of our modern world, permeating virtually every aspect of our lives. From the moment we wake up to the time we go to sleep, databases are at work. In the realm of technology, they power the applications on our smartphones, storing contacts, messages, and app data. Online shopping relies on databases to manage product information, inventory, and customer accounts. Even social media platforms utilize databases to store user profiles, posts, and interactions. In essence, databases are the unsung heroes of the digital age, silently and seamlessly managing vast amounts of information, making our modern world more efficient and interconnected than ever before. So what is a database? A database is a structured collection of organized data that is stored and managed in a way that allows for efficient retrieval, modification, and analysis of information. If you are still a bit fuzzy with this idea, think of it as a digital filing cabinet, providing a centralized place to store and manage information. Creating a database is like setting up a brand new filing cabinet. You give it a name, define what information the database will store, where it will be stored, and how the information will be accessed. And just like that. Voila! It's ready to store your data. Once you have created a new database, it will be empty. Now you will need to populate the new database with data records. Data records can be input manually or imported from another source. Whether you input records manually or import them from another source, this is just like placing documents into your filing cabinet. Now that we have all these records that have been placed into our database, what then? Well, we could query the database. A query is a question or request for specific information from a database and is the way in which we retrieve data stored in the database. Imagine a database that stores student records. Now think of a query as having a magical conversation with your database. You can ask it all sorts of questions, like who has the highest grade? Or how many students scored above 90? The database, with its lightning-fast search and retrieval abilities, will provide you with the exact answers you're looking for, helping you make informed decisions and gain valuable insights from your data. Lastly, reporting is about creating organized, visual summaries of queried data. Reports play a crucial role in transforming raw data into meaningful, organized, and visually appealing information. Think of reports as the polished presentations of your data, much like the executive summary of a comprehensive document. 
They are designed to provide a clear, concise, and structured view of the data, making it easier for users to understand and analyze the information at a glance. And that concludes your introduction to databases. From creation to data inputs and imports, queries, and reports. Databases are critical to modern information sharing and storage, and understanding them is a fundamental skill that everyone in the IT field should have. Exam Objective 5.1 Explain Database Concepts and the Purpose of a Database Flat File versus Database Working with data can be accomplished using multiple tools. Small data sets that are shared by one or two users can be managed in text files and or spreadsheets. These text files and spreadsheets are usually referred to as flat file systems and provide a very simple method of storing data. In a flat file system, data is typically stored in individual tables or files with little to no structured relationships between the data elements. It's important to note that while flat file systems are easy to work with in many scenarios, they may not be suitable for large-scale, complex data management tasks that require advanced data relationships and querying capabilities. In such cases, a database management system would be more appropriate. By using a database in place of a flat file system, you gain several key benefits. The first of which is a database's ability to handle multiple concurrent users. When multiple users or processes attempt to read or write to the same flat file simultaneously without proper coordination, conflicts can occur. These conflicts can result in data corruption, loss, or inconsistencies due to the absence of built-in concurrency controls, locking mechanisms, and transaction management, which are essential features provided by modern databases. By using a database, you will be able to provide simultaneous read and write capabilities to tens, hundreds, or even thousands of users concurrently or at the same time. Using a database also provides scalability. Scalability, in this context, refers to the database's capability to accommodate a growing volume of data, increased user traffic, or additional workloads by efficiently expanding its storage capacity and compute resources. Another advantage of databases over flat file systems comes in the form of increased speed. Databases are optimized for data retrieval and manipulation. They employ indexing, caching, query optimization, and other performance-enhancing techniques to efficiently store, sort, and retrieve large quantities of data quickly. And as a final benefit, databases can handle a wide range of data types. Flat file systems are typically limited to text data, while databases can handle a wide variety of data types, including text, numbers, dates, images, audio, video, and more. In summary, databases are a superior choice over flat file systems in scenarios where you need to accommodate multiple concurrent users, achieve scalability for growing data needs, ensure fast and efficient data access, and work with a variety of data types. Exam Objective 5.1 Explain Database Concepts and the Purpose of a Database Records and Storage Records are a fundamental component of databases because they serve as the building blocks for organizing, storing, and managing data efficiently. Databases are designed to store vast amounts of information in a structured and organized manner, and records are the means by which this data is logically grouped and categorized. So if I was to define what a database record is, I would have to say they are collections of related data fields that represent a single unit of information or entity within a database. It is often used to store and retrieve specific information about an object or item. In a human resources database, an employee record might include fields such as the employee ID, employee's name, job title, salary, or any other necessary information pertaining to each employee. Each record would therefore represent a unique employee within the organization. Now it should go without saying, but the storage of all these records needs to be persistent. The persistent storage of a database refers to the long-term retention of data within a database management system even when the system is not actively running or powered on. This is a crucial aspect of databases because it ensures that data remains available and durable, even in the face of system failures, power outages, or shutdowns. To accomplish this, databases are typically stored on various types of storage media, which can include hard disk drives, HDDs, solid-state drives, SSDs, network-attached storage, or cloud-based storage solutions. To summarize, database records are fundamental for efficiently organizing and categorizing data in databases. 
Persistent storage ensures data availability and durability and is achieved through various storage media options. Exam Objective 5.2 Compare and contrast various database structures. Database Structure Types Database structures are fundamental to databases in that they help organize and store data efficiently. They play a crucial role in how data is stored, accessed, and manipulated within a database system. Let's explore three main types of data structures in the context of databases, structured, unstructured, and semi-structured data. Structured data refers to data that is highly organized. Each piece of data has a well-defined data type and is organized into tables, making it easy to query and analyze. Unstructured data lacks a predefined structure or format. It includes text, images, videos, audio, and other forms of content that do not fit neatly into a table format. Now semi-structured data is data that doesn't adhere to organized tables, but is not completely unstructured either. This includes data such as text, images, videos, and audio that is accompanied with various meta tags. Meta tags categorize or label data elements. These tags can be used to indicate the data's purpose, source, or any other relevant information. These meta tags help in organizing and querying semi-structured data efficiently. Between these different database structure types, there is a distinct trade-off between data retrieval speeds when performing a query and the rigidity or flexibility in the types of data that can be stored. Structured data typically allows for faster data retrieval speeds because fixed tables enable a database system to know the exact structure of the data. Unstructured data often has the slowest data retrieval speeds. Since there is no predefined structure, searching for specific information requires more extensive processing. As for semi-structured data, this type falls in the middle and offers a more balanced solution. In the next video, we will take a closer look at relational databases, which are a perfect example of structured data. Exam Objective 5.2 Compare and contrast various database structures. Relational Databases a relational database is a structured data system that stores information in tables. A table is comprised of data values stored in a series of columns and rows, where columns align data values vertically and rows align data values horizontally. Using this table structure, each row represents a separate record and each column represents a single field or attribute within a record. Through this table-based structure we can use fields to compare common traits between data elements in each record. Now that we have defined a table, let's talk about the relational part of this database. A relational database is aptly named because it organizes data into tables that relate to each other. These tables have relationships or links between pieces of information, thus allowing multiple tables to correlate data. So how are these table relationships formed? In the example behind me, we have a customer table where we can store information about customers like their first name, last name, and phone number. This table helps us keep all our customer information organized. Now, let's talk about the sales table. Here, we record details about each sale, like who made the purchase, the order number, date of purchase, and the amount. This table helps us track all our sales transactions. So here is our challenge. We want to connect these tables to understand which customer made each purchase. That is where keys will come into play. The customer table has something called a primary key. Think of it as a unique ID for each customer. It's like assigning a customer number to each person. This unique number ensures that every customer record in the customer table has their distinct identity and cannot be confused with any other record. In a relational database, you will find that every table has a primary key. Now, in the sales table, we have something called a foreign key. This is a special kind of key that connects or refers back to the unique identifier in the customer table. This customer table can also be called the parent table in this type of relationship. For our example, the foreign key helps us link each sale to a specific customer in the customer table. When we connect the primary key in the customer table to the foreign key in the sales table, we create a relationship between the two tables. Now, we can easily see which customer made each purchase. 
So, in a nutshell, a primary key is like a unique ID for each customer in our customer table, and the foreign key is used in the sales table to link each sale to a specific customer. Great, you now know how a relational database works at a fundamental level. Next we will take a step back and look at the overall blueprint for a relational database, referred to as the schema. A database schema is an outline or a blueprint for a database that describes its components and how they work. And a database schema is a critical part of a relational database as it will include items such as table names, fields in each table, the required data type for each field, and the primary keys, foreign keys, and any other data constraints. Wait, why is constraints in red? Because I have not covered this topic yet. But don't worry, I will cover it right now. So, what exactly are constraints in the world of databases? Constraints are rules or conditions that we set for the data in our database. Think of them as the guardians of data integrity ensuring only valid values are entered. There are several types of constraints, and each serves a specific purpose. For starters, you already know one type of constraint. The primary key we just learned about is a uniqueness constraint. A uniqueness constraint ensures that values in a column are unique across all records in the table. Then we have the not null constraint. It's a rule that says a column must always have a value, it can't be left empty. You have no doubt come across this constraint when filling out a web form. There is also the check constraint. This enforces specific conditions on column values. For instance, you can use it to make sure an entry meets a specific requirement before it is accepted into the database. Now these are just a few types of constraints, but hopefully you got the idea. And not just about constraints, but relational databases as a whole. And remember, when you need to store information in a structured manner, there is nothing better than a relational database. Exam Objective 5.2 Compare and Contrast Various Database Structures Non-Relational Databases A relational database is a structured data system that stores information using tables. So a non-relational database is definitely not that. Instead, non-relational databases use a storage model that is optimized for the specific requirements of the type of data being stored. You may also see these types of databases referred to as NoSQL or non-SQL databases, as they do not use the standard query language used in relational databases. To keep in step with the CompTIA exam objectives, I will present two different non-relational database types. The first of which is a key value database. This works very much like how it sounds. You store objects based on a unique key and each key points to a specific item or value. Key value databases are fantastic for scenarios where you need fast, direct access to data. In web applications, this type of database could be used for caching, session management, or user profiles. The second type of non-relational database that we will cover is the document database. A document database works just like the file system on your computer and is excellent for situations where your data doesn't fit neatly into tables or rows, like a blog entry or social media post. If your data is comprised of text files, audio, images, or videos, then a document database may be your best bet. I hope you enjoyed your brief introduction to non-relational databases, specifically key value and document databases. Exam Objective 5.3 Summarize methods used to interface with databases. SQL SQL, or Standard Query Language, is a specialized computer programming language used to communicate with and manipulate databases. It provides a way for users and applications to interact with databases by sending requests for specific data or actions to be performed. SQL is mainly designed for maintaining the data in relational databases. It is a special language used by data professionals for handling structured data or data stored in the form of tables. Using a set of predefined SQL commands, you can easily create and manipulate a database, access and modify data, and grant or deny data access. For the purpose of preparing for the CompTIA ITF Plus certification exam, we will limit our studies to some of the more common commands and classify each of these commands in accordance with the official CompTIA exam objectives. Speaking of command classifications, I guess it is time to talk about the image behind me. CompTIA has divided SQL commands into two categories, DDL and DML. 
DDL, or Data Definition Language Commands, refer to SQL commands that manage the structure of your database. While DML, or Data Manipulation Language Commands, refer to SQL commands that manage the data. In the next few videos, we will examine some DDL and DML commands a bit closer. Exam Objective 5.3 Summarize methods used to interface with databases. Data Definition Language DDL, or Data Definition Language commands, are used for defining and managing the structure of your database. For your CompTIA ITF Plus exam, you will need to know what a few of these commands can do at a basic level. First up, we have the create command. This command is used to create a new database, or add a new table, function, or procedure. I have a command on the left and the right will be our output. Currently now the output shows nothing. Now we will run the command on the left. After running the command, this would be the result. Our create command added a new table named employees that has three columns. Next, we have the alter command. This command allows you to modify existing database objects. For example, you could add, delete, or modify a column. You could also change a column's data type. I have another command on the left and the right will be our output. Currently the output shows the results of our previous create command. Now we will run the command on the left. After running the command, this would be the result. Our alter command has renamed the first column in the employees table from employee ID to employee number. Okay, for my last trick, I will make the table disappear. Well, not me. But the drop command will. The drop command is used to delete database objects like tables, removing them entirely. That includes any data that was in the table too. I have one last command on the left and the right will be our output. Currently the output shows the results of our previous alter command. Now we will run the command on the left. After running the command, this would be the result. Our drop command has erased our employee table completely. Nothing left to see here, so on to the next video. Exam Objective 5.3 Summarize methods used to interface with databases. Data Manipulation Language DML, or Data Manipulation Language commands, are used for defining and managing the data of your database. For your CompTIA ITF Plus exam, you will need to know what a few of these commands can do at a basic level. First up, we have the insert command. This command is used to add new records into a table. I have a command on the left and the right will be our output. Currently we have an empty table named employees that has no records in it. Now we will run the command on the left. After running the command, this would be the result. Our insert command added three new records to our table named employees. Next, we have the update command. This command allows you to modify existing data records in a table. I have another command on the left and the right will be our output. Currently the output shows the results of our previous insert command. Now we will run the command on the left. After running the command, this would be the result. Our update command has replaced the salary of John Smith with a new value of 67,000. And up last, we have the delete command. The delete command is used to delete records in a table. Now for one last command. Currently the output shows the results of our previous update command. Now we will run our final command on the left. After running the command, this would be the result. Our delete command has erased our employee record for Steve Patel. Looks like he found a new job. Better study these videos hard if you want to be Steve's replacement. Exam Objective 5.3 Summarize methods used to interface with databases. Select. Querying a database is like embarking on an exciting digital treasure hunt. With a few lines of code, you can uncover valuable information, transforming raw data into actionable insights. It's the art of exploring vast datasets, discovering patterns, and finding answers to critical questions. 
Whether you're analyzing financial records, deciphering customer behavior, or investigating scientific experiments, querying a database is your ticket to an exhilarating journey of discovery in the digital age. And to set sail on this journey, SQL gives us our most powerful command yet. The SELECT command. A SQL SELECT command is a very special data manipulation language command, as classified by CompTIA, and is used to query or retrieve specific data from a database table. Here's how it works. The SQL query begins with the SELECT keyword, which indicates that you want to retrieve data from a table or tables. After SELECT, you specify the columns you want to retrieve or simply use an asterisk to select all columns. Following the SELECT statement, you use the FROM clause to specify the table or tables from which you want to retrieve data. This clause tells the database where to look for the information you want. Then we have an optional, WHERE clause. The WHERE is used to filter the rows that meet specific conditions. It acts as a conditional filter, allowing you to retrieve only the rows that satisfy the criteria you define. Now it is time to see the SELECT command in action. On the left we have a SELECT command, and on the right, we have a database table, named STUDENT TABLE, with four records in it. When we run the command, our query will return all columns from the student table, for each record that has an entry in the age field greater or equal to 20. Now we will run the command, and take a look at the results. Our select command has identified and returned two records, in the database's native format, that met the condition of age greater than or equal to 20. John Smith who is 22, and NTS who is 30. Now this is a very simple example, but much more can be accomplished with this powerful SQL command when it is wielded by a database master. Exam Objective 5.3 Summarize methods used to interface with databases. Database Permissions In a relational database, permissions are the rules you establish for who can access and manipulate your structured data tables. By using SQL commands, you can grant certain users the ability to perform specific actions, such as reading or editing data in particular tables. Conversely, Mr. Deny here can restrict your access or actions, ensuring that only authorized individuals can interact with and modify the database's organized information. To control who can or cannot work with our data, SQL gives us two commands. Grant and Deny. Grant allows access while Deny takes it away. And it is also worth noting that CompTIA has classified these under the Data Definition Language or DDL category. First up, let's talk about granting permissions. When you want to give someone access to specific data in the database, you're essentially giving them a key to the vault. To do this, we use the grant command. For example, if you want user A to only be able to view customer data, you would use the grant command like the example on the left. This command would grant permission for user A to use the SELECT command on the customer's table. Now let's talk about denying permissions. When you want to restrict access to specific data in the database, you use the deny command. For example, if you want user A to be restricted from using the delete command for customer data, you would use the deny command like the example on the right. This command would deny permission for user A to use the delete command on the customer's table. In IT, security is paramount, and understanding how to control who has access to your data is crucial. Good thing databases provide us with a secure way to store information. Exam Objective 5.3 Summarize methods used to interface with databases. Database Import and Export The topic of database import and export is quite easy to grasp. When you want to get data into a database, the process is known as a database import. And when you want to get data out of a database, like creating a backup copy of the database, this is an export. Sure, that sounds easy enough, but the trick is in the doing. Now, let's discuss a common method used to get data into and out of a database. Imagine you have information in a flat file database, like a spreadsheet, and you want to bring it into your database. One common way to do this is by using CSV files. A CSV, or comma-separated values file, is a simple and widely used file format for storing structured data. A CSV file is often used for data exchange between different software applications, including databases, and is easy for both humans and computers to read. So how does a CSV file work? 
CSV files are organized in a tabular structure, similar to a spreadsheet. Data is divided into rows and columns. Each row represents a single record or entry, and each column represents a field or attribute of that record. The name comma-separated values implies that commas are used to separate values in the file. However, other delimiters like semicolons or tabs can also be used depending on the specific application. These delimiters determine how data is separated within each row. CSV files often include a header row at the top, which contains the names of the columns. These headers provide context for the data in each column, making it easier for users to understand the contents. In our example CSV file, the columns are listed in the header row at the top and are labeled first name, last name, and age. Each subsequent row is a table record. So here in this CSV file, we have three records. And just as easy as it was to take a table and convert it to a CSV file, we can convert the CSV file back into a table structure. Exam Objective 5.3 Summarize Methods Used to Interface with Databases Database Access Methods Database access methods are the processes by which a user might run SQL commands in order to update or extract information from a database. Up until now, I have mostly displayed the concept of direct or manual access. In our previous video examples, we simulated running a SQL code and viewed some native outputs. Well, direct or manual access is very similar as this method involves logging into the database server directly and running the SQL codes from within the database management system. Our next method to access a database involves the use of query and report builders. These tools come built into many database management systems or are offered as third-party tools. These tools still interact with databases directly, but the syntax of the SQL statements that will be run is abstracted away from the user. With a query and report builder, the user uses a graphical interface where actions are selected and then converted into SQL commands on the user's behalf. If neither of those options work for your use case, another option is to integrate with the database using programmatic access. Most high-level programming languages have built-in capabilities to connect with a database and execute queries. As for our last access method, many applications use a database in the background without the user even being aware of its presence. Anytime you are dealing with a data-driven dashboard, you are using this type of access method. These are user-friendly interfaces and software tools that allow non-technical users to interact with a database easily. So whether you prefer hands-on control, the power of programming, or a user-friendly interface, there's a method to suit your needs. Additionally, I want to congratulate you on reaching the end of Domain 5.0, Database Fundamentals. Exam Objective 6.1, Summarize Confidentiality, Integrity and Availability Concerns. CIA To begin our study of Domain 6.0 of the CompTIA ITF plus exam objectives, we will discuss the CIA triad. And before your mind wanders, the CIA triad is not about secret agents, it's about the core principles of information security, which are confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These principles work together to protect and manage data in the world of IT. The first pillar of the CIA triad is confidentiality. It ensures that data is kept private and only accessible to authorized users. Confidentiality employs measures such as encryption and access controls. The second pillar is integrity. This ensures the accuracy and trustworthiness of data. Imagine you're writing a letter. Integrity ensures that the letter remains unchanged from when you wrote it to when the recipient reads it. Security techniques that prevent any unauthorized alterations or alert us to potential tampering would fall into this category. The third pillar is availability. Availability ensures that data is accessible when needed. Or you can think of it as the ability of an IT system to be up and running without interruption. By understanding the three parts of the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, you can begin to select security controls that will keep your data secret, make sure your data can be trusted, and is accessible when needed. In the next few videos, we will learn about some common security attacks. We will then classify them as either a confidentiality, integrity, or availability concern.
Exam Objective 6.1 Summarize Confidentiality, Integrity and Availability Concerns Confidentiality Concerns Confidentiality in IT refers to the practice of protecting sensitive information and ensuring that it is only accessible to authorized individuals or systems. It involves the use of various security measures such as encryption, access controls, and user authentication to prevent unauthorized access, disclosure, or theft of data. Confidentiality is essential for maintaining the privacy and security of sensitive data, such as personal information, credit card numbers, and trade secrets, in a digital environment. Now, to truly understand the potential challenges in ensuring data remains confidential, we will explore various types of security concerns that can pose threats to confidentiality in the realm of information technology. Within IT, there are many attack methods that threaten confidentiality. And for the CompTIA ITF Plus certification exam, we will cover a few of the most common attack vectors. So first up when it comes to confidentiality concerns, we have snooping. Snooping is an attempt to gain access to information that you are not authorized to view. A perfect example of snooping is shoulder surfing, which is a situation where an attacker merely views a user's device screen or keypad, often by peering over a user's shoulder, in order to obtain confidential information. Next up, we have eavesdropping. This is a specific form of snooping that involves secretly listening to the private conversations or communications of others, without their consent, in order to gather information. This could be a telephone conversation or a network connection between devices. And building upon the idea of eavesdropping, we have wiretapping. With wiretapping, an attacker would connect a listening device to a telephone or data line to secretly monitor a conversation. And for our next confidentiality concern, we will cover the topic of dumpster diving. Dumpster diving is the process of investigating a person or business's trash to find information that can be used in an attack. Here, cyber attackers take the idiom, one man's trash is another man's treasure, quite literally. So be careful what documents you discard. Now, to wrap up our list of confidentiality concerns, we will briefly cover social engineering. This is a big topic, but we will only scratch the surface for now. Social engineering is the practice of manipulating, influencing, or deceiving a person in order to gain control over a computer system or acquire confidential information. It uses psychological manipulation to trick users into making security mistakes or giving away sensitive information. Attackers use this method because people are often the weakest link when it comes to cybersecurity. Social engineering attacks often involve impersonation or identity fraud, and can happen by text, email, a phone call or even through face-to-face -face communication. Luckily, the solution to social engineering attacks, and all cybersecurity attacks for that matter, is education. And with you having just watched this video, the world of IT is now a little bit safer. Thanks for doing your part. Exam Objective 6.1 Summarize Confidentiality, Integrity and Availability Concerns Integrity Concerns Integrity, as it applies to IT, is a fundamental security principle that ensures the accuracy and trustworthiness of data and information. It involves safeguarding data from unauthorized alteration, tampering, or corruption, both intentionally and unintentionally. Maintaining data integrity is crucial because it guarantees that information remains reliable and consistent throughout its life cycle. This integrity assurance is vital for organizations to make informed decisions, maintain customer trust, and comply with regulatory requirements. In essence, integrity acts as a critical safeguard to prevent unauthorized changes and maintain the overall security and reliability of data and systems. Within IT, there are many attack methods that threaten data integrity. And for the CompTIA ITF Plus certification exam, we will cover a few of the most common attack vectors. So first up when it comes to integrity concerns, we have the man-in-the-middle attack. A man-in-the-middle attack is a sneaky eavesdropper in the middle of a conversation. In IT, this is when a hacker secretly intercepts and potentially alters the communication between two parties, without either party knowing. This is not only a confidentiality concern, but a huge integrity concern as well. Next up, we have replay attacks. A replay attack involves an attacker recording your password or security token when it is sent for authentication and then using it later to impersonate you. 
By doing this, an attacker can gain unauthorized access, like logging into your account. This is a security threat, because it can allow hackers to pretend to be you and do things you didn't intend, like tamper with corporate data or steal money from your bank account. And for our last integrity concern, we will cover the topic of impersonation. While this technique can be used as part of a social engineering attack, impersonation itself is a significant integrity concern because it involves someone pretending to be a legitimate user, system, or entity. When an unauthorized person or program successfully impersonates a trusted entity, it can result in data breaches, unauthorized access, and data manipulation, compromising the accuracy and reliability of the information. Whether it is impersonation, a man-in-the-middle attack, or a replay attack, any unauthorized information alteration undermines the fundamental principle of data integrity. That is why protecting against any of these attacks is crucial to maintaining the integrity of IT systems and the data they handle. Exam Objective 6.1 Summarize Confidentiality, Integrity and Availability Concerns Availability Concerns Availability, as it applies to IT, is a fundamental security principle that ensures data is ready and accessible whenever you need it. In a broader context, availability makes certain that systems, services, or resources are consistently operational and can be accessed without interruptions. This continuous access is crucial because users, whether they are individuals or businesses, rely on certain services to be available whenever they need them. Ensuring high availability often requires meticulous planning, regular maintenance, and proactive monitoring to prevent and address potential issues that might disrupt access. Any downtime or inaccessibility can hinder productivity, disrupt operations, and impact user trust. Within IT, there are many factors that can threaten data availability. And for the CompTIA ITF Plus certification exam, we will cover a few of the most common availability concerns that can bring our IT world to a standstill. To start off, we will begin with the threat of a power outage. A power outage is one of the most immediate and palpable threats to availability. Whether due to natural causes like storms, or technical issues within power grids, the sudden loss of electricity can halt operations instantaneously. Without power, most modern equipment, from servers to workstations, can become inoperative, leading to potential data loss and operational downtime. Hardware failure is another critical concern. As robust as modern hardware might seem, it is not immune to malfunctions. A single failed component in a server or network switch can disrupt access to vital data or services. Over time, wear and tear, manufacturing defects, or external factors like overheating can lead to unexpected hardware breakdowns. External threats also pose significant risks. Destruction caused by natural disasters such as earthquakes, floods, or fires can physically damage infrastructure. Similarly, human-made incidents, whether accidental like construction mishaps or intentional like acts of vandalism, can wreak havoc on physical assets, leading to availability concerns. Even if all physical components are intact and powered, service outages can still occur. These outages can stem from software glitches, overloaded systems, or issues with local and wide area network connection lines. A service outage can prevent users from accessing essential platforms or applications, disrupting workflows and communication. As for our last availability concern, we have to be weary of denial of service, or DOS attacks. A DOS attack is a malicious attempt by attackers to overwhelm a system, service, or network with an excessive amount of traffic, rendering it inaccessible to legitimate users. The primary aim is not to steal information but to disrupt the service, causing downtime and potential financial or reputational damage. These attacks work by flooding the target with bogus requests making it difficult for the system to respond to legitimate traffic. The sheer volume of these requests can exhaust the target's resources, such as bandwidth, processing power, or memory. As a result, genuine users find themselves locked out, unable to access the services or information they need. In an era where uninterrupted access is crucial, DOS attacks and any of the other mentioned availability concerns must be accounted for, in order to ensure, data that is needed is always available. Exam Objective 6.2 Explain Methods to Secure Devices and Best Practices Securing Devices 
In the vast realm of information technology, the security of your device stands as a paramount concern. Just as you wouldn't leave the door to your home unlocked, you shouldn't leave your devices unprotected. This video will introduce you to the foundational methods of securing your devices. First up, we have antivirus and anti-malware software. Antivirus and anti-malware software are your device's primary line of defense against malicious threats as it is software designed to detect, prevent, and remove malicious software, known as malware, from a computer or network. You might think of it as a vigilant knight, protecting your digital realm from would-be intruders. Now there are two primary methods used by antivirus and anti-malware software to identify threats. Signature-based threat detection relies on a database of known malware signatures, which are unique bits of code or characteristics specific to individual malware strains. When you download or execute a file, the antivirus software scans the file for these signatures. If a match is found, the software flags it as malicious. It's akin to a security guard checking a list of known criminals. As for behavioral-based threat detection, it observes the behavior of programs in real time. It uses heuristics, which are sets of rules or algorithms, to analyze the actions of software and determine if they are typical of malicious programs. For instance, if a file tries to access a large number of files quickly or attempts to hide its presence, it might be flagged as suspicious. This method is particularly useful for detecting new or previously unknown malware that doesn't have a known signature yet. In essence, while signature-based detection checks for known threats, behavioral-based detection uses heuristics to predict and catch new or evolving threats based on their actions. With an up-to-date antivirus and anti-malware in place, the next component used in securing a device is a host firewall. This is another type of software that is installed on a device. Its job is to provide protection by monitoring and controlling incoming and outgoing network traffic based on predetermined security rules. By filtering incoming and outgoing traffic, a firewall can ensure that harmful data packets are blocked, while safe ones are allowed through. These rules can block an unsafe protocol like Telnet or open a specified port number for approved traffic. Another important part of securing your devices includes enabling password authentication and changing default passwords when applicable. Enabling passwords on mobile devices, workstations, network devices, and servers is a fundamental step in safeguarding personal and professional data. Passwords act as the first line of defense against unauthorized access, ensuring that only those with the correct credentials can access the device's contents. When devices come with default passwords, they often follow predictable patterns known to many, including potential attackers. These default passwords are akin to leaving your front door unlocked with a sign saying, come on in. By not changing the default password or neglecting to set one altogether, users risk exposing sensitive information to theft, misuse, or cyber attacks. So set up a strong, unique password to keep the digital gatecrashers out. As for our next method for keeping our devices secure, we have safe browsing practices. Navigating the vast world of the internet is comparable to attending a sprawling, never-ending party. To ensure a smooth and safe experience, it's imperative to follow a few guidelines. First, stick to the VIP section by visiting only trusted sites, think of it as avoiding the sketchy corners of a party. Next, keep your browser up to date. Much like you'd wear the latest fashion to a trendy bash, ensuring your browser is equipped with the latest security features, updates, and patches keeps your searches fashionable. Also, steer clear of unsupported browsers, using one is like dancing in shoes with broken heels. Very risky and prone to mishaps. Lastly, set your browser to give you a nudge before downloading anything. This way, you're alerted to potential gatecrashers trying to sneak onto your device. By adhering to these practices, you can enjoy the digital party with confidence and flair. Now, the last item on the list for keeping your device secure is to regularly install updates and patches. And in keeping with our party analogy, updates and patches are like the refreshments and tune-ups at our grand digital party. Imagine you're at a bash, and someone brings in a fresh tray of snacks or tweaks the sound system for better beats. That's what updates and patches do for your software and devices. Updates are the newer versions of your software, bringing in cool new features, smoother interfaces, and often, snazzier graphics. Patches, on the other hand, are like quick fixes to a wobbly DJ deck or a flickering disco light, 
they address specific issues or vulnerabilities that might have cropped up. Now, why are they the life of the party? Without these refreshments and tune-ups, your software might become outdated, or worse, vulnerable to those party crashers, aka cyber bullies, looking to spoil the fun. So, always be on the lookout for the latest updates and patches for your firewall, browser, and especially, your antivirus software. Exam Objective 6.2 Explain Methods to Secure Devices and Best Practices Device Use Best Practices Before diving headfirst into downloading some shiny new software, it's essential to do a bit of detective work and exercise some common device and software best practices. When obtaining software from original equipment manufacturers or third-party websites, it's essential to validate the source. Always ensure the legitimacy of the provider by checking for certifications or other indicators of their validity within the industry. But validation shouldn't stop at initial impressions. Dive deeper by searching for user reviews, expert opinions, and any signs that might suggest the software isn't as it claims to be. In the digital realm, it is all too easy to be tricked into downloading malicious software. In Windows, a utility referred to as User Account Control, or UAC for short, serves as a protective mechanism for your device against malicious software downloads, just in case you were a bit lazy in your personal validation process. Whenever software or an application attempts to make significant changes on a Windows device, UAC intervenes by prompting the user for permission. This proactive approach ensures that only changes authorized by the user are implemented, offering a layer of protection against unwanted installations. By acting as a gatekeeper, UAC ensures that only trusted software can modify the system, enhancing the overall security of the device. Another best practice to keep the attacker at bay is to remove any unwanted or unnecessary software. Over time, your computer can get cluttered with software you no longer need or never wanted in the first place. And each piece of software is essentially a door or window, providing access into your device. The more pieces of software you have, the more entry points there are for potential threats. By removing unwanted or unnecessary software, you're effectively reducing these potential entry points, bolstering your computer's security. So, don't forget to do a little digital spring cleaning from time to time. Out with the old, in with the security, and maybe, just maybe, your computer will stop judging you for all those unused apps. Exam Objective 6.3 Summarize Behavioral Security Concepts Expectations of Privacy Over time, as society immerses itself deeper into the world of technology for communication, work, and leisure, it has become imperative to discern how private our digital interactions truly are. Social networking sites have become an integral part of our daily lives. Most of these platforms offer settings that allow users to toggle between public and private profiles. However, a key point to remember is that even with the strictest privacy settings, the information you share might still be accessible to the platform's staff, advertisers, or third-party applications. Furthermore, these platforms are notorious for collecting vast amounts of user data, like a user's physical location, or search history, which can be utilized for targeted advertising or analytics. A logical takeaway here is to always exercise caution with what you share and to familiarize yourself with the platform's privacy policies. Email, another primary mode of communication, varies in terms of privacy. While some email services champion end-to-end -end encryption, ensuring that only the sender and recipient can decode the content, not all providers offer this level of security. It's also worth noting that many email providers, or employers, might scan your emails. And in certain circumstances, if legally subpoenaed, they might even have to furnish your email content to authorities. The best practice here is to assume what you send could become public and to be circumspect about transmitting sensitive information via email. File sharing, whether through public platforms, cloud storage, or on-premises file servers, poses its own set of privacy challenges. On public sharing platforms, activities such as downloading or uploading a file might expose your IP address to other users. As for cloud storage services, while incredibly convenient, may provide third-party limited access to the files that their users upload. These files can then be analyzed for various purposes, including advertising, or handed over to legal entities if required. Not to mention file sharing is meant for sharing between multiple users or devices by nature. 
So if you want the highest expectation of privacy, you might want to keep that secret document off the server and choose to store it locally instead. Instant messaging, another staple in our daily communication, has its nuances when it comes to privacy too. Many contemporary messaging apps boast end-to-end -end encryption, ensuring the sanctity of the conversation between the sender and recipient. However, some residual data, like timestamps or participant details, might still be stored. Additionally, even if a message is purged, it could linger in backups. Some platforms also facilitate message backups on third-party cloud services, which might lack encryption. The golden rule for users is to choose messaging platforms renowned for robust encryption and privacy features and to think twice before sharing sensitive details, even in seemingly private chats. Lastly, in the landscape of mobile and desktop software, privacy intricacies abound. Many applications on these platforms request permissions to access various device components, such as contacts, location, and camera. While some permissions are pivotal for functionality, others might be leveraged to gather user data for diverse purposes. Additionally, both mobile and desktop operating systems have inherent privacy settings, but they can also amass data to enhance user experience or for targeted advertising. Furthermore, one's online activities can be surveilled when connected to mobile or Wi-Fi networks, especially on public Wi-Fi, heightening privacy concerns. All things considered, keep your eyes peeled and your wits about you. Remember, expecting privacy is a bit like expecting a cat to obey you. Hopeful, but not always realistic. Exam Objective 6.3 Summarize Behavioral Security Concepts Written Policies and Procedures The path to understanding written policies and procedures in IT starts with defining the terms themselves. And I will start with the definition of a policy. A policy is a set of rules or guidelines that dictate what actions should be taken under various circumstances. Policies are essential for setting the boundaries and expectations for behavior within an organization. Two common examples of policies you'll encounter in IT are the Acceptable Use Policy, or AUP, and the Non-Disclosure Agreement, or NDA. An Acceptable Use Policy outlines the acceptable ways in which network and IT resources can be used. It sets the rules for what is and isn't allowed, such as the types of websites you can visit or the software you can install. A non-disclosure agreement, on the other hand, is a legal contract that outlines the sharing of certain confidential information. It specifies what information can be shared, with whom, and under what conditions. Now, let's move on to procedures. While a policy tells you what and why, a procedure tells you how. A procedure is a set of step-by-step -step instructions to perform a task. Think of it like a recipe. Just as a recipe guides you through the process of making a dish, a procedure guides you through a specific task in an IT environment. You may have also come across the term Standard Operating Procedure, or SOP, at one point or another. If not, SOP is essentially a detailed, written set of procedures that explains how to undertake a particular activity. SOPs are crucial in IT for ensuring that operations run smoothly and consistently. Now to recap, policies set the rules and expectations for behavior, with an AUP or an NDA being prime examples. While procedures provide step-by-step -step instructions for performing tasks. Exam Objective 6.3 Summarize Behavioral Security Concepts Confidential Information in this video, we will cover the topic of confidential information. In the IT world, confidential information refers to data that should not be disclosed to unauthorized individuals. This could be anything from passwords to personal records. And the mishandling of such information can lead to severe consequences, including legal penalties. So, how should you handle confidential information? Always make sure to store it securely, whether it's on a physical device or in the cloud. Use encryption methods to add an extra layer of protection. And never share confidential information unless you're certain of the recipient's identity and their need to know. To assist with this, one of the most basic yet effective ways to protect confidential information is through the use of strong passwords. A strong password is typically a mix of letters, numbers, and special characters. It's also a good idea to update your passwords regularly and never reuse them across multiple platforms.
Next, let's discuss a specific category of confidential information known to the IT industry as Personal Identifiable Information, or PII. This refers to any information that can be used to identify an individual and may include, but is not limited to, a person's name, social security number, date of birth, email address, and phone number. PII is often subject to legal protections and must be handled carefully to prevent unauthorized access or disclosure. Another category of confidential information is protected health information, or PHI. This refers to any information about health status, medical treatments, or healthcare services that can be linked to a specific individual. This information is often sensitive and like PII, PHI is subject to strict regulations. In addition to PII and PHI, there are a few other forms of data that deserve a certain expectation of confidentiality and privacy. They include customer information ranging from credit card details to purchase history, companies' information like trade secrets, financial data, and employee records, and lastly, school records. The list could go on and on, but the objective remains the same. Certain types of information must be handled in a secure manner in order to keep it from being disclosed to unauthorized individuals. Exam Objective 6.4, Compare and Contrast Authentication, Authorization, Accounting and Non-Repudiation Concepts. AAA. In this video, I will break down the concept of AAA into its three core components, authentication, authorization, and accounting. But, before I define these three components, I want to talk about AAA as it relates to the previously discussed topic of CIA. In the realm of information technology, both AAA and CIA are foundational concepts, but they focus on different aspects of security. While CIA is all about the data, AAA is centered around the user. AAA, as a user-centric approach to security, ensures that the right individuals have the right access at the right times. On the other hand, CIA is data-centric. It ensures that data remains private, accurate, and is accessible when needed. In essence, while AAA focuses on verifying and managing user identities and their actions, CIA is dedicated to safeguarding the data itself. Hopefully this little explanation keeps you from getting these two concepts mixed up. Next I will define each component of the AAA concept, starting with authentication. Imagine you're trying to log into your computer. The system asks for your username and password. Why? It wants to verify that you are who you claim to be. In IT terms, this process is called authentication. It's the act of confirming the truth of an attribute of a single piece of data or entity. In simpler words, it's like asking, who are you? Next, we have authorization. Let's say you've entered a building using a key. However, this doesn't mean you can access every room inside. Some rooms might require a different key. Similarly, in IT, once you're authenticated, it doesn't mean you can access everything. Authorization determines what you can or cannot do. Lastly, there's accounting. In the IT world, this doesn't refer to crunching numbers or balancing the books. Instead, it's about tracking user activities and recording them. Think of it as a logbook or computer record that notes every action you take as a user, answering the question. What did you do? Together, the three pillars of authentication, authorization, and accounting make up the AAA security principle in the realm of information technology. Authentication verifies a user's identity, ensuring that individuals are genuinely who they claim to be. Once their identity is confirmed, authorization steps in to determine what actions or resources the user is permitted to access, ensuring that they only interact with what they're allowed to. Lastly, accounting meticulously tracks and records all user activities, providing a comprehensive log that can be reviewed for security, compliance, or audit purposes. Collectively, these components not only bolster security but also streamline user management and oversight in IT systems. Exam Objective 6.4, Compare and Contrast Authentication, Authorization, Accounting and Non-Repudiation Concepts. Authentication. Imagine you're trying to log into your computer. The system asks for your username and password. Why? It wants to verify that you are who you claim to be. 
In IT terms, this process is called authentication. At its core, authentication answers the question, who are you? Ensuring that only authorized individuals can access certain information or systems. Now, how do systems authenticate you? They use something called an authentication factor. An authentication factor is a distinct method used to verify a user's identity before granting access to a system or resource. It represents a specific piece of evidence that the user must provide, falling into categories such as something you know, something you have, something you are, and somewhere you are. Now let's take a closer look at each of these categories. First, we will discuss something you know. This is the most common factor. Think of passwords, pins, or answers to security questions. It's information that resides in your mind and is known, hopefully, only to you. As for a password, it is a secret combination of characters that a user sets to prove their identity and gain access to digital accounts or systems. A PIN, or personal identification number, is a numeric code used to authenticate a user, commonly associated with bank accounts or mobile devices. It is typically shorter than a password but serves a similar purpose in verifying identity. Security questions are preset queries that a user answers during account setup, providing an additional layer of identity verification. Falling under the something you know category, they act as a backup for authentication, especially in scenarios where a password or PIN is forgotten. Our next authentication factor is something you have. This category refers to tangible objects or devices in the possession of a user that serves as a means of authentication. This category emphasizes the physical possession of an item as proof of identity. Examples include a hardware token, which is a physical device, often small enough to be carried on a keychain, and can generate and display secure codes for authentication. A software token, which is a digital counterpart to the hardware token, existing as an application or software module on devices like smartphones or computers. It also generates and displays secure codes for authentication, but only to users with the required software access. One-time passwords, also referred to as OTPs, are unique, time-sensitive codes sent to a user's device, often via SMS text or email, for a single-use authentication. Falling under the something you have umbrella, OTPs are often thought of as impossible to break. Continuing on, we have the something you are authentication factor. This factor is about unique characteristics inherent to the user, or you may have heard the more common term, biometric data. Biometrics can include many user characteristics, but for the purpose of brevity, I will stick to a few of the more common biological metrics. Fingerprints are unique patterns formed by ridges on the tips of human fingers, and when used for authentication, they validate identity based on these distinct patterns. The iris and retina are parts of the eye with intricate patterns that are unique to each individual. As facets of the something you are category, iris and retina scans provide biometric authentication by analyzing these patterns, ensuring a high level of security due to their distinctiveness. Facial recognition technology analyzes distinct features of an individual's face, such as the distance between eyes or the shape of the nose, to authenticate identity. Facial authentication leverages the uniqueness of one's facial structure to grant or deny access to systems or resources. Now for one last factor. Somewhere you are. This authentication factor is based on the geographical or physical location of the user. By determining where you are, systems can grant or restrict access based on whether the user is logging in from a recognized or safe location. Examples include geofencing, where access is only allowed from specific geographic regions, or IP address checks that verify if a user is connecting from a known network or country. This factor adds an extra layer of security by ensuring that even if someone has your authentication details, they might be prevented from accessing resources if they're not in an approved location. Exam Objective 6.4 Compare and Contrast Authentication, Authorization, Accounting and Non-Repudiation Concepts Single Factor versus Multi-Factor When accessing digital systems, we often encounter prompts asking for credentials. Using just one authentication factor, like a password, to verify your identity is known as single-factor authentication. 
This straightforward process, often abbreviated as SFA, verifies your identity using only one piece of evidence. However, as our security needs have evolved, so have our authentication methods. Enter Multi-Factor Authentication, or MFA. This method requires two or more pieces of evidence conforming to multiple authentication factors in order to verify your identity. MFA can involve a combination of elements, something you know, like a password, something you have, such as a mobile device receiving a code, something you are, like a fingerprint or facial scan, and somewhere, you are. This layered approach to authentication significantly enhances security by ensuring that even if one factor is compromised, there are additional barriers to unauthorized access. Now if that was not enough, you are also likely to come across the concept of two-factor authentication in your IT journey. Two-factor authentication is often referred to as 2FA and is a specific form of MFA that uses exactly two authentication factors to verify your identity. It strikes a balance between enhanced security and user convenience, often combining a password with a mobile code or another easily accessible method. In the realm of IT, understanding the distinctions between single-factor, two-factor, and multi-factor authentication is essential. As you prepare for your CompTIA ITF Plus certification exam, remember that the choice of authentication method can greatly impact the security of systems and data. Now let's practice this concept to ensure you are exam ready. To do this, I will present a few authentication scenarios where two authentication elements are used. We will then classify each authentication element according to its authentication factor type and then see if a single factor or multiple factors were used overall. With that explained, here is the first authentication scenario. The user has provided a username, which is something you know, and a complex password, which is also something you know. As both authentication methods are something you know factors, this would be considered single factor authentication or SFA. Authentication scenario number two. The user has provided a smart card, which is a form of a hardware token. This falls into the something you have category. The user has also provided a PIN number, which is something you know. In this scenario, we have multiple authentication methods being utilized, so this would be considered multi-factor authentication or MFA. Okay, don't beg, I will do one more scenario, just for you. Authentication scenario number three. In this last scenario, the user is subject to geolocation. This falls into the somewhere you are category. The user must also provide a retina scan, which is something you are. In this scenario, we have multiple authentication methods being utilized, so this would be considered multi-factor authentication or MFA. Great, now you are a certified SFA, 2FA, and MFA master. Exam Objective 6.4, Compare and Contrast Authentication, Authorization, Accounting and Non-Repudiation Concepts. Single sign-on. How often do you find yourself juggling multiple accounts, each with its own unique username and password? This can become cumbersome and challenging to manage. That is where single sign-on comes in. Single sign-on, commonly referred to as SSO, is a user authentication service that permits a user to use one set of login credentials, like a username and password, to access multiple applications. Think of it as a master key that unlocks several doors, eliminating the need to have multiple keys for each door. So, how does single sign-on work? Well, when you first log into an application that uses single sign-on or SSO, the system checks if you've been authenticated by the central SSO solution. If you haven't, it prompts you to log in. Once you provide your credentials, the SSO system validates them against a central database. Upon successful validation, the SSO system issues a token, a kind of digital stamp of approval. This token is then used for subsequent authentication requests during that session. As you navigate to another integrated application, instead of asking for your credentials again, the system requests the SSO solution to verify the token's validity. If the token is recognized and still valid, the second application grants you access without requiring another login. This process of token verification repeats for all integrated applications, ensuring a smooth and uninterrupted user experience. Now that makes things much easier, doesn't it? Now, behind the scenes, the SSO solution and the applications communicate using special protocols. 
These protocols define how the applications request authentication and how the SSO solution responds with the user's authentication status. But what happens when you log out or when the session expires? Simple, the token becomes invalid. As a result, the next time you try to access an application, you'll be prompted to authenticate again, and a new token will be issued for that session. Incorporating single sign-on not only streamlines the user's experience, but also consolidates the authentication process for IT administrators. They can monitor user activities, manage permissions, and enforce security policies, all from a centralized location. To wrap up, as you continue learning about the intricacies of IT and gear up for your CompTIA ITF Plus certification, grasping the fundamentals of single sign-on is invaluable. It epitomizes the balance between user convenience and robust security, which is always a balancing act. Exam Objective 6.4 Compare and Contrast Authentication, Authorization, Accounting and Non-Repudiation Concepts Authorization In our daily lives as IT professionals, we often encounter situations where we need permission to do something, whether it's entering a restricted area or accessing specific information. In the world of information technology, this concept is known as authorization. Authorization is the process of determining what actions, resources, or services a user is permitted to access. Or more simply put, it answers the question, what can you do? Now, let's talk about permissions. Permissions are the specific rights or privileges granted to users or software. Think of them as the detailed rules that dictate what can and cannot be done. For instance, in a computer system, a user might have permission to read a file, but not to modify it. Or for a database, the user may be granted permission to use the select command, but denied access to the insert, update, and delete commands. A fundamental principle in IT security is the concept of least privilege. This means giving users or systems only the permissions they absolutely need to perform a task or job function and nothing more. This is best accomplished by enhancing the granularity of user permissions or being more specific with permission rules rather than generalizing. Now, how do we decide who gets what permissions? This is where access control methods come into play. There are several methods, but we will only cover the four methods listed in the CompTIA ITF plus exam objectives. For our first method, we have role-based access control, or RBAC. This method assigns permissions based on roles within an organization. For example, all employees within the accounting department might have access to certain files, while regular employees have a different set of permissions. It's like having different membership tiers, where each tier has its own set of benefits. Next we have rule-based access control. Here, access is granted or denied based on a set of rules or policies. For instance, a system might be set up to only allow access to a financial application during regular business hours. This would be a time-based rule. Or perhaps access to sensitive data might be restricted to devices within the company's physical premises. This would be a location-based rule. Now on to Mandatory Access Control, or MAC. This method uses labels, often tied to security classifications, to determine access. Files and users are assigned these labels, and access decisions are made based on them. It's a bit like a research facility where only scientists with a specific clearance level can access certain labs. And just a quick note for clarity, when we say MAC here, we're not talking about that unique identifier for your computer's network interface. And for our last method, we have Discretionary Access Control, or DAC. With DAC, the owner of the information or resource decides who gets access. It's a bit like a homeowner deciding who can enter their house and which rooms they can access. Now here is the real trick to keeping these four methods straight. Focus on the keywords. Our BAC is all about roles or job titles, rule-based involves specific rules, MAC uses labels and classifications, and DAC is all about the owner. Exam Objective 6.4, Compare and Contrast Authentication, Authorization, Accounting and Non-Repudiation Concepts Accounting At its core, accounting is the process of recording, summarizing, and analyzing financial transactions, ensuring that records of individual financial transactions are accurate and up-to-date. This meticulous process has been the backbone of businesses for centuries, 
helping them understand their financial health and make informed decisions. But in the rapidly evolving world of IT security, accounting takes on an additional meaning. Here, it doesn't just deal with dollars and cents, it refers to the tracking of user activity and system events. Just as financial accounting keeps track of money, IT accounting keeps track of data and user actions, and answers the pivotal question, what did you do? One of the primary tools used in IT accounting are logs. Think of logs as the digital footprints left behind in a system. These footprints, or logs, are records that provide a chronological account of events in a system. They can track a wide range of activities, from user logins, file accesses, to even the smallest system errors and security breaches. The importance of logs cannot be overstated. They are the silent guardians of the digital world. They assist system administrators in diagnosing problems, almost like a doctor referring to a patient's history. They provide a clear, traceable trail for auditors to ensure compliance, ensuring that digital protocols are being followed. And perhaps most importantly, they can be instrumental in detecting unauthorized or potentially malicious activity. By answering the questions of who, what, when, and where, logs provide a comprehensive view of system activities. Another significant aspect of accounting in IT is the tracking of online activity. Let's take a moment to think about your web browser's history. This seemingly simple feature not only allows you to revisit previously accessed sites but also serves as a detailed record of your online journey, almost like a diary of your digital adventures. For businesses and organizations, monitoring web history isn't just a feature, it's a necessity. It ensures employees adhere to company policies. It offers protection against harmful websites, serving as a shield against the darker corners of the web. And in today's age of cyber threats, it can be a vital tool in cyber investigations, helping to piece together digital puzzles. Now, it's easy to perceive IT accounting as a big brother watching over your shoulder, and to some extent, that's a valid perspective. But it's essential to see the bigger picture. The other half of IT accounting, the one that often goes unnoticed, is its role in ensuring a transparent, secure, and accountable digital environment for all. It's about building trust in a digital world that's becoming increasingly untrustworthy. Exam Objective 6.4 Compare and Contrast Authentication, Authorization, Accounting and Non-Repudiation Concepts Non-Repudiation In simple terms, non-repudiation is a safeguard that guarantees individuals or entities involved in a digital transaction cannot later refute or deny their participation or the legitimacy of their actions. Think of it this way, imagine you're sending a handwritten letter to a friend. Once it's sent, you'd want concrete assurance that you indeed sent the letter and, equally important, that your friend received it. You would want proof that eliminates any room for doubt or denial from either side. Now, translate that scenario to the digital realm. In online transactions, communications, or any digital interaction, non-repudiation serves as this binding assurance. It's the digital equivalent of that undeniable proof, ensuring that parties involved can't backtrack or dispute their involvement or the validity of their actions. It's a foundational principle that upholds trust and accountability. Now, how does non-repudiation tie into authentication? Authentication verifies the identity of a user, ensuring that you are who you claim to be. Once authenticated, any action you take, like sending an email or signing a digital document, can be tied back to you. Non-repudiation ensures that once these actions are taken, they cannot be denied later. But what about accounting? We've previously discussed how accounting in IT is about tracking user activities and system events. Non-repudiation adds a layer of trust to this tracking. It ensures that the recorded logs of actions, whether it's accessing a file or making a transaction, are undeniable. It's the assurance that the digital footprints left behind are genuine and can't be refuted. So what are some of the tools and methods that reinforce non-repudiation? Well, we have video. In scenarios where visual confirmation is essential, video recordings can serve as undeniable evidence. Think of video calls where agreements are made and decisions are finalized. The recorded footage stands as proof of the conversation, ensuring participants can't later deny what was discussed. Or what about biometrics? 
One of the most personal and unique identifiers we possess are our biometric traits, like fingerprints or retina scans. When used in transactions, they offer a high level of non-repudiation. It's hard to argue against a fingerprint match or a facial recognition hit. Then there are signatures, digital signatures or their ink counterparts, are unique to individuals. When you sign a document, you're providing a seal of approval that's hard to refute. It's a commitment that the content is endorsed by you and hasn't been tampered with. And lastly, we have receipts. Ever received a delivery confirmation for an email or a message? That's a form of non-repudiation. It confirms that the message was not only sent but also received by the intended party, leaving no room for denial. In conclusion, non-repudiation is the backbone of trust in the digital world. It's not just about preventing denial, it's about fostering trust, accountability, and transparency in our digital interactions. Exam Objective 6.5, Explain Password Best Practices Passwords serve as a primary method of authentication, but surprisingly, many individuals often overlook their significance. Some might attribute this to complacency, while others simply might not be aware of the importance. Fortunately, there are established password policies and best practices that guide users in creating robust passwords, ensuring enhanced protection for both personal and professional data in our digital landscape. First and foremost, why are good password practices so essential? Think of passwords as the keys to your digital home. Just as you wouldn't want a flimsy lock on your front door, you wouldn't want a weak password guarding your personal and professional data. Strong password practices ensure that your digital doors remain locked against potential intruders. Now, let's look into some key password policies, which are designed to fortify our digital security. To kick things off, I will start with a well-known policy, the password length policy. This policy is an uncomplicated yet vital aspect of digital security. At its essence, this policy determines the minimum and maximum number of characters that a password should contain. Picture this in terms of a physical safe. Just as a safe might have a combination code of varying lengths, a password has its own length criteria. The analogy runs deeper when you consider the security implications. For a safe, a longer combination, with more numbers or sequences to guess, naturally becomes more challenging for a thief to decipher. Similarly, in the digital realm, a longer password inherently possesses more potential combinations of characters. This increased variability makes it exponentially harder for malicious actors to guess or use brute force attack methods against your password. Then there's the password complexity policy. This policy emphasizes the need for a diverse mix of characters in your password. It recommends using a combination of uppercase letters, lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters. Such a varied composition not only ensures your password's uniqueness, but also strengthens its defense against typical hacking methods. A password with this mix is much harder for hackers to guess or breach using brute force techniques. It's also crucial to avoid using dictionary words in your password, regardless of their length. Hackers often use dictionary attacks, where they methodically test every dictionary word to decipher passwords. By incorporating a variety of character types and steering clear of standard dictionary words, you substantially lower the chances of falling victim to these attacks. Next, we have the password history policy. This policy's primary objective is to deter users from reusing their recent passwords. By monitoring and remembering your past passwords, the system can ensure that when you're prompted to update your password, you're guided towards crafting a new and unique one. This proactive approach to password management is designed for mitigating risks. For example, if an old password was ever compromised, ensuring it's not reused eliminates the chance of that particular password being a recurring security weak point. In a nutshell, the password history policy serves as a protective measure, encouraging users to consistently renew their passwords, thereby enhancing their overall digital security. Now, our next policy, the password expiration policy, complements the previously discussed password history policy by setting an expiration date on your passwords, ensuring they don't remain static for too long. By doing so, it mandates users to refresh their passwords at predetermined intervals or on a certain date. Imagine this as a routine maintenance check. 
Just as machinery or software might need regular updates to function optimally, your passwords require periodic changes to remain effective against potential threats. This consistent cycle of change reduces the window of opportunity for malicious actors to exploit a possibly compromised password. In essence, the password expiration policy acts as a proactive nudge, reminding users to stay vigilant and continually reinforce their digital barriers. And adding one more to our list of essential password policies, let's discuss the password lockout policy. Ever mistyped your password several times and got locked out of your account? That's this policy at work. The primary purpose of the password lockout policy is to hinder unauthorized users from endlessly guessing your password. This previously mentioned attack, known as a brute force attack, is more common than you might think. The policy works very simply. After a set number of incorrect login attempts, the account gets locked. It remains inaccessible for a set period of time or until an admin steps in to unlock it. This strategy not only stops hackers in their tracks, but also signals to users and administrators about possible unauthorized access attempts. All these password policies play a role in guiding users to set and maintain secure passwords. However, there are additional practices that further enhance our digital security. Firstly, it's important to avoid using the same password across multiple accounts. This huge mistake is known as password reuse. If you reuse the same password everywhere and it gets compromised, all your accounts become vulnerable. Ensure every account has its own distinct password for optimal protection. For those juggling numerous accounts, a password manager can be a lifesaver. It's challenging to remember countless complex passwords. A password manager acts as a secure digital vault, storing and even auto-filling your passwords for you, making sure your credentials are organized, secure, and readily available when needed. Lastly, I have an important note for password administrators. When users need to reset their passwords, always prioritize verifying their identity, using multiple verification methods if possible. After confirming their identity, assist them in the reset process, highlighting the need to establish a strong and unique new password. Exam Objective 6.6 .6, Explain Common Uses of Encryption Plain Text versus Cipher Text Understanding the distinction between plain text and cipher text is the very first step when venturing into the expansive realm of encryption and its study, termed cryptography. So let's take that first step and begin with a quick look into plain text. Picture yourself jotting down a message to a friend. This message, in its original, readable form, is what we term as plain text. In the realm of IT, plain text is any data or text that hasn't undergone encryption, making it readable by both humans and computers. But here's where the plot thickens. When we aim to safeguard our data or message, especially in the digital domain, we resort to encryption. This encrypted form of our plain text is what we refer to as cipher text. Think of cipher text as a coded message. To the untrained eye, it appears as mere gibberish. This encryption ensures our data's confidentiality, shielding it from unwanted attention. To reiterate and further define this concept, plain text is data presented in a format that is immediately understandable and accessible. It's in its most basic, unaltered state, free from any form of encryption or coding. This means that there are no protective layers or barriers concealing its content. Whether it's a simple message, a document, or any other form of data, if it's in plain text, it retains its original clarity and meaning. Anyone who comes across or accesses this data, be it a human or a computer, can easily read and interpret its contents. In essence, plain text is like an open book, transparent and straightforward, waiting to be read by anyone who stumbles upon it. As for cipher text, it stands in stark contrast to plain text. It is the result of taking understandable, clear data and transforming it into a format that appears random and nonsensical at first glance. This transformation is achieved through a process called encryption, which employs specific mathematical algorithms to jumble the original data. These algorithms rearrange the data in such a way that its original meaning becomes obscured. The primary purpose of this scrambling is to protect the data's integrity and confidentiality. Without the correct decryption key or method, which acts as a sort of digital password or blueprint to reverse the encryption, the ciphertext remains a puzzling array of characters, numbers, and symbols.
Only those possessing the right key can revert the cipher text back to its original plain text form, making it a perfect mechanism to safeguard sensitive information from unauthorized eyes. In the vast digital landscape, where data breaches and cyber attacks are prevalent, cipher text serves as a fortified shield, ensuring that even if data is intercepted, it remains indecipherable to those without the means to decrypt it. Exam Objective 6.6 .6, Explain Common Uses of Encryption Data at Rest Imagine a calm, serene lake with the sun setting in the background. The stillness of the water is reminiscent of data at rest in the world of information technology. Simply put, data at rest refers to data stored on devices like computers or servers, not actively being used or transmitted. More specifically, it is the files and documents that sit quietly on your hard drive. However, this stillness doesn't guarantee safety. That's where encryption comes in. The first type of data at rest encryption we will discuss is file level encryption. Additionally referred to as file based encryption or file folder encryption, this method is distinct in its approach to data protection. Instead of encrypting an entire storage medium or device, file level encryption zeroes in on individual files or directories, encrypting them directly through the file system. This granularity offers a unique advantage, it provides each user with the autonomy to decide which specific files or folders they wish to encrypt. By allowing each user to encrypt their own files or folders, it ensures that even if someone else has access to the storage medium, they cannot decipher the encrypted content without the appropriate decryption key. Moreover, this method establishes controls against potential misuse by privileged users or system administrators. In many IT environments, administrators have overarching access to systems and data. However, with file-level encryption, even they cannot access the encrypted content without the user's decryption key. This decentralization of encryption power not only enhances data security but also fosters a sense of ownership and responsibility among users regarding their data's safety. While file-level encryption focuses on safeguarding specific files or directories, Disk-level encryption takes a more comprehensive approach. Think of disk-level encryption as a protective shield that encompasses the entirety of a storage device, such as a computer's hard drive or an external storage disk. When we talk about protecting everything on your computer, disk-level encryption is the go-to solution. Now, let's delve deeper into a real-world scenario, the theft of a laptop. Laptops, given their portability, are prime targets for theft. When a laptop is stolen, the thief isn't just after the hardware, the real treasure often lies in the data stored within. This could be personal photos, sensitive documents, financial information, or even proprietary business data. Without encryption, a savvy thief could potentially extract this data directly from the hard drive, leading to breaches of privacy or even financial loss. However, with disk-level encryption activated, the entire contents of the hard drive is rendered unreadable without the correct decryption key. Even if the thief removes the hard drive and tries to access it using another device, the data remains encrypted and inaccessible. In short, disk-level encryption transforms your computer into a digital fortress. Even in the unfortunate event of theft, the data within remains shielded, ensuring that your personal and professional information stays confidential and secure. Exam Objective 6.6 .6, Explain Common Uses of Encryption Data in Transit for this topic, I would like you to picture a massive freight train chugging along the tracks, loaded with valuable raw materials like coal. As the train moves from the mining site to its destination, the coal is in transit, exposed to the elements and potential theft unless it's properly safeguarded. In the digital world, when data travels from one point to another, we refer to this as data in transit. Just as the coal on its journey can be vulnerable, so too can data unless it's adequately protected. Sending an email is a great example of data in transit, as it involves transmitting data across networks to reach its intended recipient. As the email travels, it passes through various servers and networks, making it vulnerable to interception by malicious actors. Without proper protection, these actors can eavesdrop on the content of the email, potentially leading to breaches of privacy or data theft. Encryption plays a pivotal role in safeguarding this data. When you send an encrypted email, the content is transformed into a scrambled code making it nearly impossible to decipher the original message. Another example of data in transit is internet traffic. 
When browsing, you might notice HTTPS at the far left of your browser's address bar. This signifies the use of SSL encryption or its successor, TLS encryption, to protect the communication between your browser and the websites you visit. By using the HTTPS protocol, you are ensuring that sensitive information, like passwords or credit card details, are transmitted securely over the internet. Essentially, SSL and TLS act as digital handshakes, agreeing on encryption methods to keep your online interactions private. Continuing with our study of data in transit, another encryption option that we have at our disposal is a VPN. A VPN, or Virtual Private Network, creates a secure, encrypted connection between your device and a remote server, acting as a protective tunnel for your data. This is especially vital for secure remote access to servers, allowing users to retrieve or send information without exposing sensitive data to potential threats. Lastly, think about the mobile applications on your smartphone. Every time you use an app, data is sent and received to and from servers. It's important that these apps use secure protocols to protect this data during transmission. This ensures that your personal information, conversations, and other sensitive data remain confidential and aren't compromised by potential threats. In summary, data in transit refers to information as it's being transferred from one location to another. In the same way you'd want valuable goods to be safe during transport, in the digital realm, we employ encryption techniques to make sure our data is delivered securely and intact. Exam Objective 6.7 Explain Business Continuity Concepts Business Continuity In today's digital age, businesses heavily rely on technology. But what happens when disruptions like software glitches, system failures, or power outages occur? This is where the concept of business continuity in information technology comes into play. Business continuity is not just about recovering from disruptions, it's a proactive approach to ensure that essential business functions persist during and after any unforeseen events. Now the first thing we can do to achieve business continuity is to avoid a complete failure of any business function. This is achieved through fault tolerance. Fault tolerance is the ability of a system to continue operating without interruption even when one or more of its components fail. It ensures that system failures do not result in downtime or data loss due to a single weak link. By now you are probably feeling like this is a vocabulary lesson and that is mostly because it is. And next up is the word redundancy. At its core, redundancy is the duplication of critical components or functions to increase reliability and prevent system failure. It ensures that backup options are available in case of a primary component's malfunction. So to summarize today's vocabulary lesson, business continuity is about keeping business functions up and running. Fault tolerance assists business continuity by providing resiliency to our business functions. And one way to become more fault tolerant is to incorporate redundancies. At a minimum, always have a backup or contingency plan. And if the business function is mission critical, why not have a backup for your backup too? Exam Objective 6.7 Explain Business Continuity Concepts Network Redundancy In a bustling city, traffic flows smoothly until a main bridge collapses, leading to complete chaos. So why am I talking about bridges in an IT training video? Because this scenario mirrors the importance of network redundancy in IT. Just as a backup route or detour can prevent traffic chaos when a bridge collapses, network redundancy can ensure that data continues to flow even if a part of the system fails. Without such redundancy, a single point of failure can disrupt the entire network. Network redundancy is an important strategy used in IT to ensure uninterrupted service, and it frequently hinges on the deployment of redundant network devices. To paint a clearer picture, consider a business that relies on a network to access resources across the internet. If this business uses only a single router to manage and direct all its incoming and outgoing traffic, it places itself at risk. Why? Because if that sole router encounters any issues or fails, the entire network can come to a standstill, potentially causing significant disruptions to operations. To mitigate such risks, many businesses opt for a more robust approach by deploying two or more routers. By doing so, they create a safety net. 
In a scenario where one router malfunctions or goes offline, the other router, or routers, is already on standby, ready to take on the responsibility. This transition is often seamless, with the backup router stepping in, almost instantly, to manage the traffic. As a result, data continues to flow smoothly and the business can operate without missing a beat. This strategy not only ensures an uninterrupted flow of data but also provides peace of mind to businesses, knowing that they have safeguards in place against unforeseen network issues. Another vital concept related to network redundancy is failover. Failover is a safety mechanism designed to ensure that systems remain operational even when unforeseen issues arise. It is the automatic process where, in the event of a failure, the system switches to a redundant or standby system. To visualize this, picture a data center housing numerous servers. Among these servers, there's a primary one responsible for critical tasks and a backup server waiting in the wings. Now, servers, like any technology, can sometimes face issues, be it due to hardware malfunctions, software glitches, or external factors. If, for any reason, the primary server falters, failover mechanisms can spring into action. Without requiring manual intervention, a failover can redirect tasks and operations to the backup server. This transition is so smooth and swift that users accessing applications or services hosted on that server often remain oblivious to the change. Now there are several more methods to establish network redundancy, and as you delve deeper into information technology and advance past the CompTIA ITF Plus certification exam, you will certainly encounter them. But for now, having a conceptual idea about network redundancy and failover will be sufficient. Exam Objective 6.7 Explain Business Continuity Concepts Power Redundancy Power redundancy, within the context of information technology, refers to the strategy of ensuring that systems remain operational even if the primary power source fails. Think of it as having backup batteries for your flashlight, ensuring you're never left in the dark. One of the primary ways to achieve power redundancy is through redundant power supplies. Consider a server in a data center. Instead of relying on just one power supply, which could become a potential point of failure, the server is equipped with two or more power supplies. If one fails or encounters an issue, the other takes over, ensuring the server continues its operations without interruption. In situations where there are sudden and unexpected power interruptions, a UPS, or uninterruptible power supply, becomes an invaluable asset while providing a certain level of fault tolerance. A UPS is a device designed to provide immediate and uninterrupted emergency power to connected equipment when the main power source is lost. This seamless transition of power is especially important in IT environments, where servers are constantly processing and transmitting data. Even a momentary power disruption can lead to unsaved data being lost or systems shutting down improperly, which can cause potential damage. When there's a sudden loss of power, a UPS instantly kicks in, ensuring that there's no break in the electricity supply. This immediate response allows IT professionals the time to either switch to a longer-term power solution, like a generator, or to safely shut down systems and save critical data. In situations where power outages extend beyond just a few minutes, the importance of having a reliable long-term backup power solution becomes evident. This is where a generator steps in as a savior. A generator, in its essence, is a marvel of engineering that transforms mechanical energy, often derived from fuel sources like diesel or gas, into electrical energy. This conversion ensures that even when the regular power grid fails, businesses and operations don't have to. When the primary power source is compromised, a generator can be activated either manually or automatically to take over the role of supplying electricity. However, it's important to note that a generator's response is not instantaneous. There's typically a brief delay before it fully powers up and starts delivering electricity. Now, both UPS devices and generators are essential for maintaining uninterrupted power. While the UPS provides immediate backup to prevent any power interruptions, the generator offers a solution for extended outages. By using both, you will have established a comprehensive power backup system. Exam Objective 6.7 Explain Business Continuity Concepts Data Redundancy Have you ever made a copy of an important document, just in case something happens to the original? In IT, this concept is referred to as data redundancy. 
Data redundancy simply means having a backup or duplicate of your data to ensure its availability. In the realm of IT, this concept of data redundancy is achieved through a process known as data replication. Data replication is the process of copying data from one location to another, ensuring that both locations maintain the same up-to-date information. By creating copies of your data using replication, we ensure that if one system or storage medium fails, the data remains accessible on another. Now, let's explore a method designed specifically for this purpose, called RAID. RAID, or Redundant Array of Independent Disks, is a technology used to combine multiple hard drives into a single unit to improve data reliability, performance, or both. With business continuity in mind, RAID storage solutions provide us with varying levels of fault tolerance. And each of these RAID solutions, also referenced as RAID levels, will have its own unique approach to redundancy and performance. RAID 0, for instance, prioritizes speed and speed alone. In this setup, data is striped across two or more disks, where striped refers to the method of dividing up and distributing data across multiple hard drives. Or to state this another way, each block of data is sequentially written to each disk in the array. RAID 0, however, does not offer redundancy. Worse, if one disk fails, all data is compromised. If you are following along with the image behind me, each blue cylindrical column represents a hard drive. Each letter, A through E, represents a block of data. And the numbers, 1 through 5, are used to represent the sequential order in which the divided parts of a block of data are written to the drive array. Our next RAID level, RAID 1, operates like a mirror. Data is duplicated or mirrored across two disks, ensuring that if one fails, the other retains all the data. While this type of RAID configuration offers redundancy, it doesn't enhance performance in the way RAID 0 does. Then there is RAID 5, which strikes a balance between RAID 0 and RAID 1. It employs striping, just like RAID 0, but introduces an element called parity. Parity provides a means to reconstruct data if a single disk in the array fails. This RAID level offers a bit of both, performance and redundancy. Lastly, RAID 10, often referred to as RAID 1 plus 0, merges the mirroring capabilities of RAID 1 with the striping technique of RAID 0. This combination allows RAID 10 to deliver both fast performance and data redundancy. In conclusion, grasping the concept of data redundancy and the techniques to implement it, like RAID, is essential. It provides a foundational approach to ensuring both reliability and enhanced performance for those handling digital data. Exam Objective 6.7 Explain Business Continuity Concepts Disaster Recovery For the last few videos, we have been focused on fault tolerance and the many ways in which we can keep our business operations and IT infrastructure up and running. This includes the use of network, power, and data redundancies. But what if, despite all our efforts, all of our backup or contingency plans still manage to fail, leading to a halt in operations? This is where disaster recovery comes into play. While fault tolerance and system redundancies are designed to maintain operational uptime, disaster recovery is designed to step in when the worst should happen and operations go down. So what is disaster recovery? It is the process of restoring and recovering IT systems and operations after an unforeseen disruption or catastrophe. It is the emergency plan activated when all other fault-tolerant redundancy strategies fail and has the primary aim of reducing downtime. Looking a bit closer, one aspect of disaster recovery is data restoration. When a system fails, there's a risk that valuable data might be lost or become inaccessible. Data restoration is the process of retrieving this lost or inaccessible data and making it available once again. To achieve this, there are typically two primary methods. The first is to use a backup, which is a saved copy of the data, usually stored in a separate, off-site location. This backup can be loaded back into the system to replace the lost data. The second method is to switch to an alternate system where an identical copy of the data has been stored, often referred to as a replicated system. This ensures that even if one system faces issues, another standby system can take over. Another aspect of disaster recovery is prioritization, and in the midst of chaos, prioritization becomes paramount. 
in the face of a significant disaster, a multitude of business-critical systems could become compromised or fail entirely. Worse, reacting to such a situation often involves navigating through limited resources and tight time constraints. Therefore, a well-structured disaster recovery plan is essential. This plan should not only specify which systems need to be restored first based on their importance but also recognize the interdependencies between these systems. As an illustration, if a company's website servers rely on specific database servers to function, they might become ineffective or inoperable if those database servers are down. Recognizing and planning for such dependencies ensures a smoother recovery process. One last aspect to consider is when to restore access back to the users. Restoring access to users too early in the disaster recovery process can risk data integrity and security. Premature access might lead to further data corruption, potential data breaches, or exacerbate existing system issues, hindering the overall recovery effort. Only, after confirming the reliability of the backup or recovered system, would you grant users access and resume normal operations. It might also be beneficial to limit the number of users at first, if conditions permit, in order to ensure the system operates as expected. Exam Objective 6.7 Explain Business Continuity Concepts Backup Considerations Imagine the daunting scenario where all your vital documents, or essential business data, vanishes in a blink. This unsettling thought underscores the extreme importance of backups in any IT environment. Essentially, backups serve as a digital safety net, ensuring that even in the face of data loss or compromise, a restoration pathway exists. Think of backups as a protective insurance policy for your invaluable data. So, which types of data should you create a backup for? The answer varies based on the nature and significance of the data, and is a selective process tailored to a user's necessity and preference. At the most basic level, there are file backups, which pertain to specific files or folders you opt to safeguard, such as photos or documents. Then we have critical data, which encompasses indispensable business files or personal datasets, where the loss of such data could spell disaster, emphasizing the need for prioritized backup. For those managing applications that store user or customer information, backing up the entire database becomes imperative. And lastly, there's the OS backup, a comprehensive process that captures everything on your system, from settings to applications. It is just like creating a holistic digital snapshot of your computer. Now, the question arises, where should these backups reside? One viable avenue is locally stored backups, also known as an on-site backup. The advantages of this method include speed, as restoring from a local source is typically swifter and grants users direct oversight over their backup processes and data. However, it's not without its drawbacks. Local backups are susceptible to physical damage from unforeseen natural disasters like fires or floods and can also be targets for theft. Additionally, the finite space of physical storage devices can pose limitations. An alternative to this is cloud storage backups, which is a type of off-site backup. The cloud offers the convenience of data accessibility from virtually anywhere, provided there's an internet connection. It also boasts scalability, allowing users to increase or decrease storage space as required. Moreover, storing data off-site inherently reduces the risks associated with local disasters. But, like all things, it has its cons. A stable internet connection becomes a prerequisite, and there's the aspect of ongoing costs, usually in the form of subscription fees. Additionally, while many cloud providers prioritize security, there's always an inherent risk, especially if the provider's defenses are ever breached. And for one final note, in the vast digital cosmos, the need for a backup isn't a matter of if, but when. Congratulations on completing our CompTIA ITF Plus training course. The commitment and drive you have demonstrated to arrive at this milestone is truly commendable. Whether you started with no prior IT knowledge or you had some previous experience to draw upon, you've journeyed a great distance. Now you stand at the threshold of your next big step towards obtaining your CompTIA ITF Plus certification. But before you go ahead and book your test, we have a new challenge lined up for you. We've assembled an exclusive practice exam on our channel, packed with 200 plus questions meticulously designed to test your knowledge and simulate the format and difficulty of the actual exam. 
it's essential to remember that repetition is the key to mastery. The more you practice, the more confident you'll feel. Also, as you navigate through our practice exam, be sure to make notes of areas you're unsure about, and feel free to revisit any part of our training course as needed. So are you prepared for our practice exam? Great! Then click on the link to my left to get started. This CompTIA ITF Plus practice exam will challenge you, gauge your readiness, and move you one step closer to your certification goal. We wish you all the best, and here's to you, passing that exam.